Should I be turning my Xbox off then? Are we live? Turning your Xbox off? Why is your Xbox on? No, you yeah, should get, so you, we need your full undivided attention for Madam Web. Oh. Oh, she's raping Pokemon or whatever. Okay. She, 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 <laughs> <laughs> whatever she said she was doing. Out of <laughs> That's, I want to see if there's a way that this Lavender is going to come after me and do things to me. That's why. Because its bio says that it's turned its affections onto humans in recent times. So, and it's and got its a heart over its crotch. Onto humans. Yeah. Like, is, this, is this that Pal World thing? Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. I've still not played. No, so, no, do, do, you actually, do you actually get rogered by animals in Pal World? Do I get what? Um, well, we're within the first 45 seconds, so I tried not to say Roger. you actually get <laughs> fucked by animals, but now we're past the first 45 seconds. Oh, I yeah. The question clear. <laughs> you actually get fucked by animals in, in, in Pal World. No, but I'm just curious if there's something that will stimulate it to fuck me because of its its <laughs> bio, you know? And again, it's got a heart on its crotch, so what else am I supposed to think? No, you're you're not selling this game for me. <laughs> nobody, nobody, <laughs> nobody. I've heard Pokemon with guns, and now your take is just like taking it to a whole other extreme. I have no idea what to say about this game. <laughs> <laughs> Holy! There you go. Yeah, apparently there is a pal that is thirsty for humans. So, mm -hmm. Jeez. do you remember that Pokemon Go craze a few years back where everyone just lost their mind? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah that was... And then I tried it, and I couldn't find Pokemon anywhere around me because I lived in the middle of nowhere. So I was like, "This is useless to me." <laughs> I, I I couldn't even go on Facebook for like the next few weeks. Just all Pokemon. I just don't want to hear about it. Oh my goodness. Oh my. Uh... Goodness. I have so still got Pokemon doing? though on my phone. I've still got it, and yeah, I I don't think I'll ever get rid of it. But I never <laughs> ever play it. It's there because... in case. <laughs> Pokemon Red, Pokemon Blue, had the Game Boy. I had my time with Pokemon. Move on. Oh, man. Actually, to be fair, that was the best time for Pokemon. Yeah, actually, you know, right. gold, gold and silver was the best yeah, time gold for Pokemon. And Anything gold. after that is just shit, and you should not mm. play it. But, mm. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, classic. Oh, jeez, man. But no, I um, I when it comes to like Spider Man, <laughs> like that's he's yeah he's he's classic superhero for me. One of the OGs, and I remember the cartoon. Specifically, Madam Web being a really interesting figure. Like she was, uh, if you guys remember, she was like an older lady. Um, and the Uncle Ben line in the cartoon came from her. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Like originally, it should have like in the movies and the comics. I'm pretty sure that's the the origin. But the Uncle Ben came from her, and the and the line came from her in the cartoons. So I always found that was interesting. So she was memorable for me. So I haven't thought about her like since I was a child. And to see this movie be made like in this modern age was just like hilarious for me. So I don't know what your guys yeah, experience was. The, the visual cue for me when I thought of Madam Web before the movie was announced was from the 90s cartoon also. I think that's yeah. a lot of people like yeah. know, probably she, in their wait, 30s. Wait, she showed up in the cartoon? Yeah. Oh, yeah. She was a huge, she was a really cool character. Like she that's was the like Professor X character of the Spider-Man universe back in the 90s during the cartoon. Like, wow. you know, th that is a really popular cartoon for a reason. It was really good. That's a good um, example there, Xavier. She was, she did have that um, vibe to her. Well, she was disabled. She's in a wheelchair. Yep. And she that. can see the future. So <laughs> it's pretty close. Even beyond her being crippled, she did have that like uh, stoic nature and like uh, yeah. the proper advisor. Did yeah. we ever see her as Cassandra Webb at all? Or was she strictly in the, the Madam Webb old lady kind of get up? It was the old lady get up. Yeah, that's I, why I don't I... remember the old there. Yeah, I don't remember them ever having a flashback of her. She was always supposed to be this, like, part of the interesting thing about Madame Web was the intrigue surrounding her as a character in that cartoon was because, you know, like, you didn't really necessarily know a lot of her origins, but she was cool as fuck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, the she mystery... was guiding, uh, guiding force for Spider-Man sometimes. Yeah, the mystery added a lot to her character. We didn't need to know a lot about her, and she was really interesting, and... I don't know where they got this idea from. This is a bunch of nonsense, but there was no Cassie Webb in the cartoon. Like we, we saw an old lady. So it's just another example of them having an adaptation and taking just the strangest idea possible for a weirdest interpretation they could have went with. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I was uh, knowing that she's younger in this version. It's quite disappointing that there's a real lack of like tits and ass. That feels like a real selling point when you're putting in the young version of a character, especially when two of your main casts are pretty much known for going full frontal in films. So it, it could have been an easy selling point. Just wait, two of them in a bikini. Are. Yeah, I was about to say, I, I wasn't aware of Which this. Is the yeah. second uh, one. Dakota Johnson and Sydney Sweeney. Yeah. Oh. Mm. Dakota Johnson went full frontal for all of the 50 shades movies. 
Really? I don't know. And yeah, Sydney Sweeney yeah. just like flashes her shit around town. So, man, she yeah, knows yeah, yeah. those tits. She knows. <laughs> <laughs> she knows, man. They pay the bills. Yeah. They pay the bills, man. Yeah, and that's um, why I was so shocked that like Dakota Johnson was even dressed down for that. Cause like underneath that, like I promise you, there's a banging body underneath. Yeah. That. You saw you see them at the I don't even know where it was, but the where she wear that chain mail dress, both of them. You see the you pictures, go. right? Yeah, where was if you that? Haven't seen those, yeah, that's what I'm saying. If you guys haven't seen those pictures, my God, like it's I think that was strategic PR. Like you come out in like the sexiest dress I've ever seen, and like no one is gonna. Sh- <laughs> and you, you troll the movie. No one's gonna shit on them. They're all the the the, the correct people are gonna be blamed for this. Like all she, all the actresses that came out and said, "Oh, you just hate women." This, 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 and that. Instead of just trolling the movie and having fun with it, and like actually coming out and doing that type of PR, this mm-hmm. is how they should have handled it. No one is going to blame her at all for this. Like in fact, yeah, she, that's actually a really. Yeah, that's a really good point. Like, yeah. uh, in my review, if anything, you know, I'm I, I, I'm talking about how they're kind of along for the they're in on the joke that, it, you know, they're contractually yes. obligated to do this yes. movie. But you can tell while they were filming this movie, they knew they were in a piece of shit. <laughs> yes. yes. Yep. And like, yeah. what a brilliant way to go about it, because, yeah, this isn't going to reflect poorly on them. In the Nobody's going to care. It's, it's going to raise their stock any, anyway, because just like, yeah, we're looking for reasons to appreciate actors and actresses like Henry Cavill, Henry. I don't know why I call him that way. Henry Cavill always um just the fact that he's like one of us. He's 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 a nerd, he builds his own PCs, he understands um like being a fan and that quote of him defending toxic fandom. He's a legend for that. Everybody wants to support him for that. And I think they're gonna get a piece of that too, in terms of just you can like just show us that you're human and you can understand that this is a piece of shit too and laugh at it instead of just doing the basic like oh, you just hate women, you just can't take the I'm I'm just so sick of that. It's a dead argument at this point. You agreed, know? agreed. Yeah. No, she didn't even look that good in the outfit in the in the schoolgirl outfit though. I know Cynic disagrees, but I, yeah, what the fuck? I bet like most <laughs> everyone who saw her is just like, yeah, yeah that's fine. That'll do. exactly like you really think guys, it's gonna stop guys from fucking her? Like, no, you gotta try harder than that. Like, you get crazy. It's so funny when they do that in movies. Try to take the hot girl and like ugly fire. Like they never try hard. They stop at gear one. Just like put some nerd glasses on her, and it's yeah, you, all that did was make her still look sexy. Hotter. Yeah, like what are you talking about? Did you guys see those two photos that she released of the behind the scenes? And one of them is her on a couch, like, you know, like posing on her side. But she's got half the costume off and they've put on a uh, like a bodysuit underneath it for uh, understandable reasons. But even that is flattening out what God has naturally given her. So even in that outfit, they were trying to to kind of take away the sex appeal, which was quite surprising. Why? Yeah, that's what just, I'm wondering too. Why? And I said yesterday, oh, wow. and I'll repeat today, that her boobs are so big that all it does is make it look like she has a belly now. Yeah, yes. yeah. It's yeah. it's like you're, you're we can we know what you're doing. Like just yeah, let, let her do ridiculous. her thing. Yeah. Yeah. Just let her do her thing. And like I, I just those three girls were just I, I don't even know what well, what's what's the format for you guys. I'm not sure how you guys go in for. Do you go like um, from the very beginning or just we don't style? have a don't, format. Yeah, because I don't want to spoil yeah, anything. This is a deeply anything, unprofessional you know? podcast. Whenever we do something <laughs> vaguely in this in this mold, usually early on I'll say, "Is it worth us maybe taking it roughly in order?" And then we start with the beginning of the film, and after about five minutes, there's absolutely no plan and no order, and it all goes to chaos. So. um I'm happy to take it in a rough approximation of the order, if you like, just because I don't know if there's actually that much else on news-wise this week, so I imagine we'll be here for a little while. I just um, there's, there's elements, like especially the beginning. Like We were talking before you came on, oh, there's so much we have to say just about the beginning, but yeah. The beginning Hello. is fantastic. <laughs> it's it's been, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, both me and Cynic talked about how before the five-minute mark, I checked, I'm pretty sure you checked too, I would legitimately was pointing and laughing at the screen. By myself, I don't even care, I was laughing out loud <laughs> watching this stupid movie for the very beginning like we're five minutes into this and it's a cloud show so i i yeah this is this is when you know you're on board for something special mm-hmm. what's up lofty I, i'm wow. glad you dressed up for us mm-hmm. oh yeah yeah i, I oh. couldn't miss this for the oh for he's the, the adorable spider-man oh, it's the spider-man it's so cute <laughs> <laughs> i have this uh wait let me see if i can move my guy hold on uh-oh it's not working so wait, i got it i got it we're surrounded by AI in blackface. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god. <laughs> I've uh, totally man. expected like a dong right there, just a spider dong. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! Well, yep, I had to represent the real Spider-Man, mm-hmm. not the black one in the movie. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, what, was, what was your opening takes for Madden what was League? that just like like black suit spider-man like what i could barely tell what it was it looked just like spider-man with a black suit like Wait, which one are we talking about the yeah. villain, the, the villain, villain. Guy. oh the villain guy. yeah and no, he's just evil uh, that's his it's name is dark is evil. spider guy he I, uh, like generic spider suit guy like what is yeah, they, yeah. they turned him into generic spider suit guy. He actually was not a generic character in the comic books, and he actually wasn't oh. even a villain at first. Like <laughs> he, he was, was a quite character. a dynamic character. What they ended up doing was turning him into a fucking cartoon. And I was a moron. Man. He's that more man. of a cartoon now than he was when he was literally fucking hand drawn. Yeah, we should probably give the context. So for for anyone, any of the very very few people in chat who, for some inexplicable reason, haven't gone out to see this film at least three times already, which you really should do because you catch new bad things <laughs> every time. Um, the, the the villain in this in this film he's introduced right at the beginning. The beginning is a flashback to the nineteen seventies, and they're in the middle of the Peruvian Amazon rainforest. And Mother Web, who is Madame Web's mother, funnily enough. Um, alongside Evil, the, the villain of the piece, they're hunting for this magical spider. We find out the reasons that Motherweb is hunting for the magical spider later, but the really funny thing, besides the probably some of the worst exposition dialogue I've ever seen on film ever, where they just relate to you exactly what they're doing and why, mm -hmm. is Evil's motive. So she finds the spider. We're told, basically to camera, the spider's venom has the power to cure diseases, it can give people super strength, it can give you the ability to kill people with poison touch, all the rest of this shit. Um, and she wants it nominally to, to save lots and lots of lives. Mm. And yeah. he then shoots her, and oh. steals the spider, and his reason wait, is, wait, wait, wait. It fuck you, that. my family starved to death, I don't want to help people, goodbye. And he, he goes. shoots the other people first. <laughs> he shoots all the people around her, and she doesn't even react. She just pats her, oh, what, what, what are you doing? What are you doing? And instead of literally taking the bottle out of a pregnant lady's arm, this grown, this grown ass man can't even manage that, and he has yeah, to this shoot her. He completely panics. He could have just took it away from her. And the fact that she was willing to fight for this jar, when she could have just given him the jar and looked for another one. Like, he just fucking found it. She could have found another one. <laughs> it makes no fucking sense. Like, but it's she's like, about you know what? A lot life. of that, yeah. a lot of that clearly looked like he, uh, well, the director, she got a lot of cues from like Zack Snyder and did it horribly. Oh, like, the, no, no, seriously. Like, when he shoots her, it reminds me so much of uh, the opening of Batman versus Superman, the fucking. Well, uh, uh bruce wayne parents death recap again oh, where it doesn't even like really make sense as far as how the characters are situated and everything how, why that goes off why that ends up happening and i was also <sighs> like this dude just murdered like 20 fucking people why is he all of a sudden just like oh god i can't believe i shot one more person <laughs> after proclaiming that i don't give a shit about anybody else yeah it doesn't make any sense like they just he he gives the, the whole like monologue of like, oh, you don't know what I've been through. I didn't have it the easy way. This, 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 and that. Just dumping his whole backstory in like seven seconds as if this is relevant right now. Yeah. Let's try to yeah. get the motivation. And also and as if it's relevant ever attitude. again. Like his parents yeah. never come up again. Never. Never. His entire motive is that at some point, somewhere in the distant I past, my parents starved and no one helped them. So I'm a dick now. And that's it. And we never hear about oh him again. God. So like, what, what is the I don't understand this character. He's my favorite character because he's such a clown. But <laughs> I then, don't understand him. Do you think yeah, that, uh, that motive never came up again? And then his new motive is just I don't want to die. <laughs> yeah. he, he has <laughs> oh no my motive. God, yeah, he's, he's fucking insane. Yeah. Do you think it's important to mention why she wanted the spider? Because that adds to the context of the story in a big way, in my opinion. Uh, I guess I mean it comes up to we find this out toward the end of the film, don't we? But it's probably better to put it at the top so everyone well, that, uh, knows. basically well, the, the spider is very 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 important like like the yeah. most important thing in the world to this woman should be like you know the spider i can understand that but the reason she's doing it is even more important and just the fact that she's willing to risk her life when she could potentially just find another one around the fucking corner instead of like dying to this guy who just clearly shot all your 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 um co-workers it's just stupid like when we find out her motivation it makes her an idiot the fact that she would yeah like, there's also the, the, the timeline problem of we need to find this spider because we know its venom can do all of this. And then, oh, but we've never actually had one of these spiders before. So how do you know what its venom does? Because well, what about... you've never captured one, so you can't know that. And if you do know it, then you know the chemical composition, so you can already synthesize it so you don't need the spider. Uh, it's uh, it's not the, the most solid of, of openings in the world. So, like, she, she ends up, she goes to get the spider so she can save Cassie, who, in the womb, is apparently going to come out a cripple or something like that, right? 
Um, she's already like seven or eight months along by the time she finds that out. And then she goes to the jungle. But I like that there's spider people in the jungle. <laughs> and they're just totally, yeah. first of all, she's aware of them. Doesn't try yeah. to make contact with them because they have their own spiders, right? But the other thing, too, is somehow she learns about this spider. And there's just the assumption that it will save her when moments later we see that even when she is on the brink of dying, the spider doesn't even save her from that. So uh, even just the basic premise of the spider will 100% save my child doesn't make sense either. But it yeah. does save her from the... So the, we might as well spoil it now because who the hell cares? <laughs> um, so it, what it does save her from is we find out very much toward the end of the film that Madam Web, Baby Web, when she's in the womb, has been diagnosed with some degenerative muscular disease thing that will probably kill her or something. So Mother Web wants to get the spider venom so she can save her daughter from being disabled. I think that's the basic idea. Yeah, um, like that. And, and so, yeah, they go, but then they, they meet the Peruvian spider people. Um, <laughs> and the, the other thing that it confers is foresight, but only selectively. So evil gets a tiny little bit of the foresight, which is how he sees these visions of himself dying, which provides his next completely disconnected motive. She gets the full foresight thing toward the end of the film. The the spider people themselves, like there's Peruvian spider Jesus, who's like the head of the Peruvian spider people, and he has a bit of the foresight because he takes dying mother web after she's been shot to this pool of water in a cave where she gives birth. And then Peruvian spider Jesus, with the worst dubbing I have ever seen on <laughs> film, which is not just like a bootleg Japanese thing, says something like, uh, her life will be difficult, but when she needs answers, I'll be here waiting for her. And then somehow the Peruvian spider people take baby web from the middle of the Pan Panama, not Panamanian, Peruvian jungle, yeah. all the way across the US border, all the way to New York and into the foster care program. Then they fuck off and wait for her to walk all the way back there in 30 years time, trying to find out what the hell just happened. You're, giving them, just still waiting there. You're giving them too much credit. You're giving them too much credit. We assume that's what happened. For all we know, like she just fucking, like it just poof, she's suddenly an adult in the ambulance, like you're doing her day to day job. We're going to have to assume that they went through all that whole process and actually got her established. But we have no idea how she made the transition from being born in that freaking forest <laughs> to suddenly being an adult. Like they just mm -hmm. skipped it. It's such a it's like one of the most bizarre cuts you're ever going to see. Just to, what happened? No exposition, nothing to just like fill it in. Everything you just said there is like the logical assumption, but it wasn't even in the movie. <laughs> it's so, and then yeah. so on strange. top of that, it's just yeah. they say that, oh, we'll be here when she's ready for us, <laughs> knowing that she's yeah, going just... to develop power. So it's like, why send her to the U.S. anyway? Right. Why even fucking bother? Mm -hmm. what you why know? didn't he you know stop the guy? Happen. Yeah, she's a Peruvian citizen, though, now. She was born in Peru. Yeah. So just take her under they your. Could have added, they could have added something with the mom be, or, you know, her, her, her dying wishes, like send her back to New York City. Or they could have just added a, a line of dialogue that would yeah. have, like, oh, we have I to respect my, her wishes. I want my daughter to have a shit life in foster yeah. care. <laughs> yeah. Send her back yeah. to America, please. Or, well, I mean, I guess it's better than growing up in a jungle. I don't know. Maybe not. I, you think I don't know. It was cut or is this just incompetence? Like, I, I mean, uh, can't even tell. Who knows? Uh, well, my, my theory is, is that, yeah, there was there's a lot of studio interference probably coming in in here uh in all honesty so there was yeah. they have the ip they wanted to do something with it they have the spider verse that they could milk but then it was like oh this needs to be a setup movie so spider. we can keep building this universe right because uh what what does madam webb do when she's older who does she like link up with well she's kind of like the centerpiece there or like really like because she has clairvoyance uh, so she you know she kind of sets the yeah like own for everybody. like for the stories yeah. and stuff you know like spider-man normally gets dragged into wherever the fuck she is mm -hmm. and kind of like i think secret wars was even engaged by madam web um in the there was a secret wars event in the spider-man cartoon in the 90s uh gotcha. and she like initiated that too so she plays like pivotal key roles in things yeah she would be a key player if there was ever any type of like multiverse interdimensional type of situation like i i, I think the one you're referencing is where he's like looking up on the screen and he has to select universe people yeah yeah and that yeah, was like that's the, the one secret. he picks storm yeah, yeah. a battle world or whatever something like yeah, that yeah. just it was cool seeing spider-man like okay who are the coolest marvel heroes that i could possibly yeah. pick to back me up and it's like actually they did it right back in the cartoon it's not like this bullshit now yeah, but, yeah anyway. right i so think I've the just... opening should have been a horror sequence to be to be honest i think it could have been like scary creepy 
and then her death could have been like I don't know what I was watching. It reminded me of the scene when um, in the Matrix when uh, Switch was killed by Cipher, and she's like, "Not like this, not like this," and he betrayed her. <laughs> it was sort of similar, like the way they set it up, but it was <laughs> so pathetic, like a so thousand pathetic. times more retarded. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, way <laughs> completely. Um, like the not like this scene is like everyone turned it into a meme, but that's still a good scene. It's yeah, the, it's the logistics are there. This is like this you is, can find another spider. You don't need to shoot her. There's no, no. need. To, your your child is on the line. Like the, there's so many reasons why that scene shouldn't have went that way. And then the, just the oh. fact that the spider people just let the guy go anyway. It's it's just also a clusterfuck. everything is contrived in this movie. Hundred yeah. percent oh, of everything. Yeah. Um, the fact that she found the spider right when she was getting con, you know contractions, and she's like, I'm gonna have the baby soon. I gotta mm -hmm. find him. And she finds it randomly. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then like that's just the start. There's so many contrived things. Later on, we'll get to. Yeah. I guess when she returns to the uh, the jungle, which is another contrived moment. Yeah. Uh, well, even the, like, uh, the, the, the one takes two that's hours to get from New York to the middle of the Amazon rainforest and back. So yeah, two hours. That, that's pretty quick. Get on a um, train. <laughs> on the contrivance of uh, so she's having she's heavily pregnant. She's she's yeah. in the jungle. She's having contraction. She's that heavily right. pregnant. Yeah. Um, and then so this it's it's hard to say because like when I first watched it, I assumed that this is this has got to be like studio interference and reshoots, right? Because the way that it, it jumps between these two scenes is, is really peculiar. So she's trying to find the spider. Uh, Evil's there, and he says, "Well, I only agree to protect you because I thought you were going to find the spider." And she's like, "Yeah, I'm going to find the spider, and it's going to you know it's going to do all this amazing shit." Then the, he goes away, and he starts rummaging through all of the notes that she's got in her tent and like trying to find. She, I think he might think that she already has a spider because he looks at the spider she's already captured and he's taking photographs of all of these notes and books and things like that, which you think, well, okay, I, I can see where the story is probably going to be going from here, except that no, because that never comes up again. And instead she just sort of, there's a cut and she waltzes back into the camp and says, oh, by the way, I found it now. Um, uh, and so I was, I, yeah. in the back of my mind watching yeah. that the first time, I'm thinking, yeah, I think you went in a completely different direction, didn't you? And then you changed it and then you <laughs> stuck these two things together and it hasn't worked at all, has it? That's wild. So it's the editing. It's the it's the producers probably messing with the script. It's probably rewrite. There's seven writers on the on the on the credits, aren't there? Seven. seven writers? I thought it's five. I keep hearing seven, but maybe maybe it is five. But there's just too many people. There's only yeah. five listed on on IMDb. Last I saw. So. Okay. Well, then maybe maybe that's the rule where if you cut like what is a sixty percent of someone's. Um, uh, script, then they no longer count as a credit or something. Maybe, maybe that's where the seven came there from. There is, like, there is supposed to be a little rule when you're looking at credits. So I can't remember exactly how this goes, but when you're looking at, say, writing credits, if it says screenplay yeah. by so and so, comma so and so, and so and so, the and is the person who took over the job, and the uh, previous two were not. There's some, some okay. rule about the, the placement of and in credits as to whether or not they were the final responsible right. person, gotcha. um, or whether they just had input. But I, I don't know exactly yeah. how that bit works. I do like that the film's like writers' room is almost as high as its Rotten Tomato score, though. That's quite funny. Yeah, almost. <laughs> uh, yeah, this movie is flailing. I don't know. The word of mouth is just going to destroy this movie. Like the the, the superhero genre is not a, it's it's not in a position to be carried. Like casuals aren't going to watch this. It's a joke. And um, I don't know. I, I uh. You, you talk about the editing, but what do you think about the immediate characterization we get from her once once we cut right to the ambulance and we're like hard? Oh, you mean the generic the CPR training video version of like a, <laughs> a character that has no soul whatsoever? She's just like a deadpan. I I don't have a problem Monster. with Dakota Johnson, but like, I'm sorry, that is not even a character. <laughs> You no, know, I, I can't. I'm not blaming her at all for the character or the oh, performance. But... I feel like she, like, like a cynic said, she knew it was a joke. So everyone yeah. gets a pass on the acting. Let's like, it's a trash. Like yeah. everyone gets a pass. Yeah, but in sure. terms of the characterization, which is the writing, yeah, what the fuck? You got someone like flatlining in the back, and she's like, "Oh Ben, what are you doing?" Like she's just like, <laughs> she's got a complete psychopath. Like it, it's nuts. And the worst part is like when they get to the hospital and like the little kids, like, "Oh, you saved my mom. Take this note." And she's like, "Huh." Like, what just, do I do with this? Yeah, what, yeah. What do you want? like I can't even what? fold it. It's cardboard. It, it, clearly, it's not. You see her waving it around. It's paper. Oh, oh you, I hate if it. If a kid hands you a fucking dead bird, you say, "Oh, thank you, sweetie. Thank you, thank you." Say thank you, and you move on. Like it's like you don't. It doesn't yeah. matter how horrible it is. You just fucking take it. It's a kid. Like you don't I understand. Don't like you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying. No, that's the best example. But like, what the like, fuck? 
Huh? Ben's like, throw it away in the trash can. What do you do? <laughs> I've done that. I've taken things from people and immediately thrown them away. I've done this, at, you know, all the time. I've done that. Be, controversially, I actually think that's the strongest characterization in the entire film, which is ben? like oh. it's a comparative, obviously, because it's still shit. Yeah. But compared yeah. to everything else like around it, the, the basic idea with with her character is that she's she's incredibly aloof, and that's sort of reflected in her deadpan delivery. And oh, it's yeah. born of the fact that she is is resentful and angry that her mother abandoned her. She had a shit time in foster care. And what she doesn't do or doesn't want to do is form any kind of human attachment. She doesn't know how to do that. So when the kid brings her, so she, she's this ambulance chase is when she's bringing the, the stepmother of Sydney Sweeney into the hospital. Um, she immediately forgets who she was bringing into the hospital. Like she doesn't know who her patient was. She doesn't give a shit that the kid is trying to thank her for saving his mother. Um, and that's all, and it builds up for probably the first 10, 15 minutes of her time on the screen is, is really reinforcing this aspect. So she is, yeah. she is just distrustful of people and she's a stray and the only friend she has is a cat. Um, and she saves a pigeon at some point, but that's relatively well done because the, the, the vague idea I think they have is that you've got it's Sydney Sweeney's character is really the only other character in the film in that she is the, the more innocent, right. naive and, and surface level version of the psychological problems that Madam Webb has. So when Sydney Sweeney's character goes on this adolescent coming of age journey, this is supposed to parallel Madam Webb's own uh, realizing that you know, family's important, attachments are important and people matter. And that's the, as an idea, that isn't terrible. It's just that it's delivered terribly. And, I was gonna um, say, like, don't you think that's a bizarre way to try to get that across? Like with the kid, like I think there's so yeah. many different other ways they could have like expressed that aspect of her personality, but they immediately made yeah. her unlikable. It's like it, it like Echo. Um, it reminded me of Echo. Of like, why are you make like why would you make show us her her little bird? <laughs> like, why would you do that? Like, just little things that were you're not gonna forget. You could have done this in so many other ways, but you've made her a psychopath. You know? Yeah, why is she a paramedic? I, good question. Um, yeah, uh, did they explain that in the movie. I can't I don't even remember. Why is someone they who doesn't care that. about anybody be a paramedic? It's such a strange. Everything about it, I feel like I I, I understand the perspective you're going to add to it, but I feel like they botched it completely. Like that's what they should yeah. have done. Like See, I think I they should have established those things, but they just they shredded her character within like nine minutes. Yeah, I didn't get the whole uh, she hates her mother thing too in the beginning whatsoever. Like it's a piece of dialogue that's thrown in later. Um, and it's clear that she kind of like mocks her mom, but her mom died during like childbirth and she didn't even know the um, the exact circumstances aside from she was in the Peruvian jungle when it happened. Um, but yeah, if she does hate people that much, why would she bother become parent being a paramedic? Yeah. And on top of that, she does have a pretty good bond with Ben Parker for some reason and black paramedic later on. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. They can't be developing a bond with Ben at the same time while also trying to say that she doesn't care about anybody and doesn't want any bonds. Like within the same opening sequence. Like it's just I yeah. think well, but then later on she does the thing where she says she doesn't care because she tries to she all three of the girls are with her. And she's like, I'm going to take you home. You guys can deal with this by yourself. I don't feel like taking care of you. But so then, like, then the they end. go back to that. It's just like, I understand what, you know, I understand that that's kind of part, try, they tried to, but it, like, it's they like, had ideas there, but yeah. I feel like almost every single one of them was just yeah. butchered. It's so strange. Yeah. Yeah. I feel no, like none of a... that was actually written in as like, um, like an important element, a uh, part of her character is more like things you are observing as you're watching the movie. And you're like, wait a minute. Yeah, that means that she's a piece of shit. Why the fuck are we? <laughs> exactly. like, why is yeah. she doing that? What a bad person. There, yeah, there's, there's too much to talk about as to why this movie's bad. It could this could go on for ten hours, but it's great. It's gonna be chat. It's gonna be why it's so fucking good. Well, chat, chat. I'm just telling chat ahead of time. This is gonna be a schizo conversation. Just, yeah, just it's gonna be, be just uh, gonna be a tough one, right? Very <laughs> schizophrenic. Um, but yeah. Um, it's great. I think my script is up to. Is it like an hour's worth of recording? I'm slightly hoarse because I was recording it before coming on. Oh, and you can tell I'm hoarse because I'm probably shouting at it, which I was quite a lot, but it's really fun. <laughs> I think I'm up to an hour and I'm only about 15 minutes into the film. So oh, it's a, and, and I'm trying to praise it as well. This is not supposed to be a mammoth like six hour video, but uh, it's it's just wow. so every everything about it is wrong, but it's really funny and lovable because of how shit and hey, wrong it is. Yeah, That's I true. think um, this That's this true. movie is hilarious. I really, really think it's it's the type of movie you can rewatch with friends and, and yeah, watch be... it with your parents and just be like, yeah. Hey, you want to watch the worst movie of all time, uh, dad? And I, I, I said to my dad last night, I was like, Dad, you want to watch a really horrible movie and like laugh at it? He was like, well, That sounds fun. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just do I that. do know <laughs> one person that didn't mind it, uh, to be fair. Uh, yeah. Mrs. Cannoli's and Mrs. Cannoli's daughter did not mind this movie at all. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, <laughs> unironically? 
No, oh, no. And ironically, but that's the thing. That's the target oh. audience, right? 60 year old kids with, you know, they're not going to remember the hydration. Years. Like, what's going on here? I don't know. Fun. I don't know. I was 16 once, and this would have been a piece of shit back then, too. Well, it's <laughs> funny because I would have been laughing yeah. just as hard. Sassy acknowledged, uh, though, that my kid's dumb, so don't take it too Oh, serious. okay, okay. There we go. Then. <laughs> there we go. Well, kids, <laughs> to flavor. be fair, Zoomers are really into memes. And I remember Morbius was like, like they propped that up like heavily. They were like fake pretending that it was like their favorite movie of all time because it's funny. They don't take it seriously. They don't vote for Joe Biden because it's funny. You know yeah. what I mean? Like memes are, memes are all memes are Zoomer cultures. But this so this has that going for it. It's like very meme worthy and like you can make fun of it and like it stands out. But it's actually not as funny, I don't think, as it as I think um, it's just bad, in my, in my opinion. But supposedly, I, I disagree because I, I, I understand I, that the point of you know yeah. people will will do the ironic detachment thing, right. which, which really makes so many memes. Right. I genuinely did find this film very funny. I yeah. probably laugh more at this film than anything I've seen recently. I need to watch it again. Um, it's it's, it's really hard not to laugh at the line because we, we think we're coming up to that point anyway. So oh, yeah, we've got yeah. we've got to the point where um yeah, so she she's rescued Sydney Sweeney's stepmother. Um, and this is our first introduction to the three uh, teenage girl characters. It's very short as we build through. She like spots them randomly throughout her daily life. So diverse female character one, the black one, just flips off the ambulance. Uh, diverse female character two, who's the Hispanic one, is lives in her apartment. And then Sydney Sweeney's mother is, is rest stepmother even is rescued. Mm -hmm. um, so we get through that, and then she goes home via a conversation with with Uncle Ben Wyatt. Um, and that he's invited her to this this baby shower party, which she'll go to. Then she goes home, and she just flips through these notebooks, which her mother has left, and she's got all of these travel documents, she's got the passport, she knows where her mother went. Um, the, the reason I'm saying that this film is really funny is because you cannot not laugh out loud, I don't think, at a line like, I hope the spiders were worth it, mum. Oh um, yeah. like that's the recriminations <laughs> you're going with her. The problem with that, of course, is that if she's really so head up about this and she's really that's bitter true. and resentful, but also interested, she has all of the information she needs right there. to go hunting know. for her mother at any point in the preceding decades she, that hasn't done that yet because the film hasn't happened yet. She so would she have read didn't. every word, every single thing. In the, it's the only thing she has for her mom. This is the only information she has, this whole hang up. She would have read every single thing in there, every picture. None of that would have been a mystery. It's a complete joke. Yeah. It's like the movie breaks like in that moment like you're retarded we know what she's flipping through after they just had the setup in the previous scene and they still have to add that stupid line just in case you're retarded like oh i, w I wish the spiders were i hope the spiders are worth it mom like they they're holding your hand throughout the entire movie as if this is complicated I would say that entire scene where she reads her mother's journal out loud, like it was so bad I had to cut it and put it in my own video, like just straight so you could see it. But that scene alone was hands down the worst exposition I've ever it's seen. It's just generic, you know, that happens in every horror movie, by the way, all these generic horror movies, they have a scene where or there's like this character, you know, rummaging through boxes and they find something and it's like, and they like reflect on it. And then later on that, plays sort of a part i feel like they were just doing that like gimmick kind of like a trope well the you, even you the opening of the movie easily, it feels like know. they're um yeah. it feels like they're stuck in like this 2000s early 2000s right. superhero I mean, yeah. kind of thing like yes like the opening actually reminded me of a poorly done version of the first spider-man movie so like yeah. uh peter parker and harry osborne and his classmates go in and they're explaining to them the spider like the spider that's going to eventually bite uh peter parker but it makes sense even though it's very campy because it's you know it's educational they're students they're being taught mm -hmm. in this like they're uh, at the very beginning it's super on the nose and they're explaining exactly what this spider does and like what its fucking purpose is right. and blah 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 but like these characters would have already had that fucking conversation. Exactly. Like, there's no need exactly. for them to be having this know. conversation right now, except the camera's <laughs> on them and the audience needs to fucking know. Like, it's so I goofy. mean, painful exposition is becoming one of the most hated things on this planet. It's just like, I fucking know. So I'm free to be like, I'm stupid. Like, it's just, oh, God. Um, it's funny that you know uh, this one, though, right? Because like, I've actually got this. This is right toward the beginning of the scripts that I'm writing at the moment about that scene, which is it, it plays out like a parody of the over exposition trope that we are yeah, seeing so much media does. in yeah. a way it's it's more lovable though because it's playing it like a parody because it's not pretending it's anything else you you can actually find it in well, it's so many modern films you can find it in a fair few like older films as well because the hack writer's way of getting around that and trying to make it seem slightly more clever than it really is is they'll have a character say something like we have to go to X to find Y and achieve Z and the person they're speaking to will say yeah I know what? that so what and then the person will say ah but have you considered 
this yeah. is what we'll do after that. And that's the way yeah. you try to smooth it over as though they're not just relating stuff to the audience. That right. kind of annoys me no, more that's... though, because they yeah. know it's a problem and yet they try and just hide the fact that it's a problem. Whereas this one is just like, we don't even give a fuck that it's a problem. We're just going to yeah. do it straight to the audience. Fourth wall break. Why not? No setup, nothing to smooth it over or anything like that. Like even the trope that uh, that Pixels mentioned of them finding the thing like the, yeah. in the box and it, in it that whatever's going to kickstart the plot. You can still do that in a decent way. Just you need to justify why they'd be rummaging through that box. Like if you're moving through a new house, like you like right. Um, there's so many things you can do it and like, oh, whatever. We understand what this, the purpose of this, but that is reasonable for me. But that whole scene, like for 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 me to be legitimately laughing out loud and pointing at my screen, we're not even five into this freaking five minutes into this movie. Like so many things yeah. have to go wrong from the acting to the logistics to just, yeah, it just fell apart. And it's just a horribly written movie in so many different ways. I can't believe this was made. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. When do I get to do the villain impression? I well, think probably now, right? Because we, yeah. we, we're now coming up to the scene. I th <laughs> this is going from memory. But I think we've now got to the point where so it diverges at this point. So you've got her going off to this baby shower for baby we're legally not an outer name, which is very funny because they actually, they play a game at the baby shower. They guess the baby name, but you're legally not allowed to get the name right because they have the rights to it. So that's good. <laughs> but at the same time, we've got evil. And evil is concocting his nefarious plan. He is now incredibly rich. No idea how, where he got it from, why, but he just is. So he goes to the opera to meet a, a MILF, effectively, who immediately puts out for him because the script needs that to happen, takes her back. Um, I, I, I'm describing this, and I can't believe it's an actual film, but it actually is. Takes her home, screws her, has a nightmare... Um, and this is probably where Cindy gets to do the villain uh, yeah. uh, impression, just because. <laughs> oh no! I have take that. it away. Do do the villain. The villain's great. All right. This is this is yeah. I have the quote. Um, <laughs> this is my impression of the villain. I think it's pretty close. So, uh, it was a good thing you had no idea today was the day you were going to die. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what it was. <laughs> That's exactly you know, what it was. That's Everything how the guy talks through the whole movie. Yeah, man, it felt, seems dubbed. Like I, it's, I don't know what it is. Like, it, it has to like been. Do you ADR remember in the? Like yeah, it totally was because at the be in the first five minutes of the movie, that's when the ADR really like blew my mind too because it, mm. like, it was so glaringly bad. It was like someone forgot to check the levels, and at some mm -hmm. point, it just went whoop. And, like, it sounded like it just exploded and then came right back, <laughs> and it was total ADR. And it reminds me of like the uh, 1989 Batman and uh, the lead detective there. Um, they had to ADR his voice so much because it was like really low and grovelly. Yeah, and so well, it I made know. sense because it was an older movie. It was like in the 80s. So when you yeah. go back and watch it, like it, all of his dialogues ADR'd yeah. in. Well, it's 2024 and all of this villain's dialogue is like ADR'd in because he yeah. delivered everything just and like it, this. And it's painful because there yeah. there is some like uh, severe close-ups of him and you can see that it's not lining up whatsoever on top yeah. of that. Mm -hmm. um, but but back to the the scene where he fucks an old woman. Um, <laughs> I just find so this woman works for the NSA. I kept mixing it up with the TSA, which is <laughs> just for airports. I've I've NSA learned clearly now. Spying. Right, <laughs> but she's so she's out to the opera on her own. This clearly is not a work function, <laughs> and for some reason, on her night out by herself, she thinks it's a good idea to take her security badge as well yeah. as some pretty valuable NSA tech with her. And despite having these valuables on her, she still goes home with a random guy who, by the way, the film does not age up at all. So <laughs> the, the powers that this spider has given this one person and not Cassie is the ability to stay young, super strength, super speed, and healing. And poison. Oh, and poison. Yeah, he could touch people by poisoning them. And, and super cringy dialogue. Oh, <laughs> right, <super> sure. Power. <laughs> Here's another like, one. Oh, I, and he does get not. premonitions as Wait. well because he sees And premonitions, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so he and gets supermaned well, by this spider, well, whereas dreams. Cassie just gets... Yeah. Dream. Isn't that a dream or a premonition? 
I think it's a premonition because he sees them all very clearly. And oh, except it's on... not because we will find out later that he was wrong about everything. And it yeah, wasn't right. we had we had no <laughs> yeah, foreshadowing yeah. that he was going to be killed by Pepsi. Wrong Cola. about it. Exactly. <laughs> it's also stupid. Like, even his whole motivation is ridiculous, man. I was just going to say though, right before this though, yeah. we, we missed the scene where Cassie falls oh, into yeah. the river and she unlocks the web. Oh shit! Yeah, of course that's already oh, happened. That yeah. fucking, <laughs> so she connects to the web. She goes, goes online. I don't know what the fuck's going on. Yeah. So, 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 what if that never? happened well then i guess nothing she just she well maybe she was always going to do it. maybe it's like fate and like she was always going to be a complete buffoon so she they get called out to another car crash there's so many car crashes in this film it's like subliminal yeah, well, messaging for the writers yeah, yeah it's called out right. to another like one that. and um like i i went and did research for this because i i'm the kind of person who thinks that oh, you should God. actually spend five minutes researching the you know emergency medical procedures if that's what you're going to put in a film um but you know, so they He's in an upside down car. He's had a really bad car crash. There are things you're just meant to do with people in that situation to make sure that when you get them out of the car, you're not causing more damage. What you're not meant to do is to do no like recce of the scene at all and just go into the car, cut him free so he collapses onto the ground, probably making his existing injuries much Insane. worse. Then only discovering once he's been taken out of the car that he was so fat he was the only counterweight stopping the car from dropping into the Hudson River and then getting stuck in the car as it goes into the Hudson River. Then she dies, and I'm not being hyperbolic because the film actually tells us she dies because yeah, she's underwater yeah. for more than three minutes in cardiac arrest. She hallucinates a web and then she's fine, and now she has premonitions and like miniature foresight. Like, that's that's how she gets so, the powers. Yeah, and this. she's Wait. rescued because the fucking EMT, who's Peter Parker's uncle, it's uncle Ben, ben. died dived into the fucking river and among right. like amongst all Pulled of that of water of pressure, car. was able to get her out of the fucking car, bring her up, and just kind of nonchalantly be like, "Yeah, I saved you." Like, like nothing. Right. She doesn't know, even like, say thank you. Does she even right, thank this so man? Casual. Like it's crazy. They don't treat it. Like, they treat it like nothing happened, and it's the only moment of heroism in the entire movie, and it happens to be Uncle Ben. Like I just think. I think that's and it like the actually one wasn't even brief shown. moment I could think of. Yeah, it's, but, they don't but, even show it. They, don't get <laughs> they don't show his heroic moment. He gets no right. credit for it. And I swear this bitch doesn't even say thank you. Like, I, I it's insane. Well, why did she get the powers now? And then why in the previous scene was she experiencing like deja vu powers? Why? The deja, that... vu, deja vu comes after. So the first time she oh, gets deja vu is so he, she's pulled out of the water by Uncle Ben and he does oh, the tests okay. on her and all the rest of that. So she knows the precise figures for her blood oxygen levels and all the rest of that. Right, right. That turns out to have been a <laughs> slight premonition. So then it flicks back in time. And it's one of the only things That's in the right. film I think isn't terrible is that they introduce the power relatively slowly and she's confused by it. So she right. sees things slightly before they happen and then doesn't understand that that's <laughs> what's times. going on. When you, when you, when you say yeah. it's not terrible, you were okay with her taking like 10,000 hours to figure it out on the train? No, that's <laughs> fair. Like, huh? no. Oh what? my God. How many huh? times did it come to that times? fucking I, woman? I, I, I asked like, <laughs> oh Bradman, random friends who hadn't even watched the movie and I'm like, if you saw like Deja Vu, how many times would it take you to fucking like figure it out? And I yeah. actually know that something's happening. I don't know, maybe two, three, how many times did it take her? Like five, six times and she's still yeah. sitting there like, what? That's just no, not trusting filsome. the audience at all to like understand what's going she's on. She's so stupid and they, uh, and they, she's stupid and they think we're stupider than her. That's why they keep repeating it over and over again to make sure that we understand. Just like the, the line with the, I hope the spiders were worth it. Like they're holding our hands and I, I can't stand when movies treat you like a little kid. Like you have no functioning brain whatsoever. Can I will there, yeah. I will say there is one intentional thing that they do in having that guy on the bridge, and it, it happens pretty consistently throughout the movie. So two things: women are really good drivers, and men can't drive at all is a pretty uh, central thing that they try to push. So every car crash that happens, it's a man driving. Mm. But when everything <laughs> works out, it's Cassie driving. And yeah. Dakota Johnson posted a video of her doing uh, quote unquote stunts, which was just her basically just pulling the handbrake on a car. And people are like, oh, please praise her. She My did God. all the stunts in this movie. Why right? did they do that? Hey, I don't know because Tom the, Cruise the, is like gonna turn to dust by two, all, right. you know, all the stuff he does, but she like, like switches into a, to a next gear and they're gonna praise her for it. It's crazy, right? She yeah. she tries yeah. to race her way around a transport truck later on in the film on an empty road. And they cut it so it looks like a Fast and Furious scene, which didn't Ugh. make sense at all. But yeah, that guy gets caught on the bridge. Then Black Paramedic gets T-boned. And then Uncle Ben uh, gets into the worst traffic jam ever to happen from nothing happening. 
but yeah, and then Cassie can just steal a cab and keep that stolen cab for a week while she travels out of the country. Why did yeah? There's I'm it's I'm I'm overwhelmed with stupid things to say. I'm trying to like keep keep track of them. There's even something at the beginning that we forgot because in terms of the feminist aspects, um, the mom's like, oh, this baby's trying to stop me from working, and like right. when, you, when, you, when you realize her motivation for why she's fucking there in the first place, how could they well, have her yeah. say that? It's like they and forgot. She also what says story. like. My daughter uh, is not going to be a victim, which is a good thing. Like, that's a good thing to, you know, but it's just it felt so forced into the movie. Like, like yeah. that is absolutely something you need to be addressing. Like, to the that's audience. prioritized. That's your priority right now when you're like, wait, yeah, does she say that the baby's going to be a victim because it comes out a cripple? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Wouldn't I it make more yeah, sense yeah. that I want my child to live a full life? Why are you immediately a victim if you're a paraplegic or something? That's a bit assumption-y, isn't it? That's ableist of you. It's right. Just, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's it's so horribly done. And like each yeah. <laughs> I just don't know. I can't remember the last time I had so many problems with so many things just this quickly into a movie. Uh, th oh. and honestly, all this stuff so like that we're talking about right this second is all just side stuff because the movie's so horrible on its own. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah, yeah, the it's, feminism it's angle really is just really just besides like, the point. Yeah, it doesn't even stand out when you look at the actual film because it commits so many basic sins in yeah. <laughs> things that you don't think that you should get wrong, but this movie somehow gets wrong. Yeah, it commits yeah. cinema hierarchy for sure. Yeah, I so, so here's like another the villain. Sin. The, the line, the villain line, the villain line, he goes, here's another line. He goes, you have no idea the torment of dying over and over again and can't escape it. <laughs> it's yeah, so bad. I think oh that, that's, man, that's that's, that's the one. next scene anyway. So let's let's go yeah. for that one again. So we've well, done a bit of that with with his today's the day you're gonna die thing. But so the, yeah, the basic yeah. premise for the villain in this scene, he he's found NSA woman who he knows works for the NSA. He's slept with her, um, and he wants to get her password because the NSA in 2003 has developed this uh, brand new, like super powerful, to use the film's own words, unlimited potential. Um, surveillance program, which allows him to do whatever the script needs him to do, like tap into every camera everywhere. More importantly, though, his plan for all of this is that he's had this recurring nightmare where he's murdered by these three teenage girls. Um, <laughs> and so what he wants to do is to use the NSA new surveillance program to get the faces out of his dreams, put the faces from his dreams into the NSA program so he can track the faces, find them in real life, and kill them. Because he had a dream, a recurring dream, where they don't only kill him, because they, they kill him afterwards, but his first line in the flashback, the dream sequence, he wakes up in a panic and says, where is my spider? They've stolen my spider. Right. And then he thinks, no, I'm going to have to fucking kill him now, because they're going to kill me otherwise. But like, So that's the villain's plan from this point onwards. No idea how he gets the money, don't know why the parents have anything to do with any of this at all, but he wants the super secret thing so he can find the girls and murder them. The problem, there are many problems with this, but you've got this immense technological thing which can do everything, track people everything. down, alter government records. Your plan is to dress as a gay spider and go chasing them through New York as opposed yeah. to doing literally any of the other things you could be doing in this they, moment. They make him completely, like, just brain dead based on all the capabilities he should have, like all the technology he has access to. He should to. have access to every hitman on the planet Everything. Earth. <laughs> He should, you know what I mean? He, he he doesn't have to walk into a diner by himself. Like, what is going on? Like, we're assuming that he used whatever, you know, he stole the spider and he, whatever yeah, business that's... decisions he made and he became a millionaire. Or he, he, beca yeah. he made a fortune off of it. That's like the assumption that's going to be made there. They didn't tell us anything. But all these resources can't be ignored when this is this important to you. It's if you're, it's, it's, it's like traumatizing you. But they make him like, just since it's just a cartoon villain and like the biggest. One of the worst ways I've seen in a long time, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then, nice. So he gets this from this from the NSA woman. The NSA doesn't ever change it. For, in the first place, the NSA's passwords for this program is eight digits long. And obviously, I like doing my research, so I found out that that's the minimum password length for Habbo Hotel, which is just as secure as, <laughs> as the NSA is wow. in real life. Um, they don't ever change the passwords. They don't deactivate uh, NSA MILF's account. They never seem to discover that she's been murdered. So they can just use this program from now until the end of time. He he finds this this random young-ish yeah, woman who does all the typing for him. Yeah, who is she? she? I don't know. <laughs> no, I haven't got a clue. No idea who she is. Nothing. <laughs> not a character. She's tech girl. Like that's it. Tech girl number one. Yeah. yeah. I mean, she she Tem, poses Tem one moral qualm with this, which is like she she puts the faces into the program and says, "Hey, 
they look young. I didn't realize we'd be trying to kill teenagers. And he says, well, they might be young now, but in the future, they'll have yeah. powers. And I'm not <laughs> going to powers. sacrifice everything I've built and let them kill me. Like, uh, okay, fine. And then she's just fine with it because he offers to pay loads of money. And all her job is is just to sit behind cameras pressing buttons and moving the scripts along occasionally. Uh, and she's a brilliant, brilliant character. And, and inventing technology that just doesn't really and just As like out of the go. blue out of the blue just saying oh now we have this technology uh which somehow taps into uh like she can somehow listen to every phone conversation at once like like this is you know, dark and night. Then, like, <laughs> like yeah but more than that because because that right. maybe tried i think a better job at, at least well it was still bad but like they at least tried. they discussed the ethics in a more reasonable yeah. manner and then they destroyed well, like, it at the even, end like in and out even yeah, even in the Dark Knight, as I mentioned, and the this, motivation like, was there at least. Yeah, yeah. like uh, when Lucius gets the the stuff from Batman, he's got like a twelve foot wall of cameras to look over, right? Because yeah, yeah. Reasonably, it way better. And this woman just has like four monitors sitting on a desktop, and she right. can not and only see all the cameras in Batman. New York. Right. Yeah, that's, can, that's 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 Batman's technology. This is the NSA in two thousand and three. Like, right, like, yeah. and this and is so not the same facial, thing facial recognition yeah you see all the cameras it can do phone calls uh dispatch calls and it's not just in new york because we learn it picks up on stuff in new jersey later on as well yeah so it, it just like it's inventing as it goes to just keep the plot progressing forward yeah. it, but it, his it, weird little like, henchman woman actually describes it as a worldwide surveillance network so it's wow. everywhere this, this uh, thing can do everything everywhere at one point they use it to, to turn all the traffic lights in new york green which creates a car, another car crash um that it can do everything but but they, they never use it in any of the ways that it would be so immensely useful for because there's at one point i know we're jumping ahead and we'll come back yeah, to the, the present yeah. stuff first but so there's one bit where she's uh, she and the three girls uh, are driving away, trying to get away from evil, evil. Well, just evil. That's his name. Um, and <laughs> and Satan. so and he knows he's seen her because he, she's already saved them from him once. Yeah. And there's a there's a conversation between him and his little henchman woman um, when she says something like, "Yeah, that woman, you know, the mother web woman. She's she's with them." And he says, "Why would I be interested in her?" It's like, well, right. because because you know that you know that she's with them and she's now right. driving off to panama for some panama fucking peru for some reason why aren't you tracking her that's a good right. thing oh you're a moron you absolutely a moron. and then a second later she's like well this is uh her last name is this whatever and then he's like oh it's impossible and then then he realized like he was he almost missed out on finding them I and think he's, he's, so, he's stupid. I think he's extra frustrated because now I'm realizing I'm talking about it. Almost all of his scenes could have been immediately better with like this isn't like a big redraft here. Like you could have fixed this in a small conversation. Like even with the the idea of well, like taking from his memory and his dreams, putting them into a program. Why not just have a scene with him be like finding the best police sketch artist? He has the well, money. What? Yeah, you know what, what, I mean? what is the technology like, with the faces? It. The face bullshit. technology. It's bullshit what? technology. I'd rather like let's address like, something that it? actually exists. Like mm. police uh, sketch artists, like at least it's. That's what I mean. You know, it, it's just she, he he she does she pull it out of his brain somehow, or is, does he I mean? describe it to her? Yeah, his, well, his, his the, the line is something yep. to to the effect of uh, "These are the faces from your dreams as you've been able to describe them." Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, that's but, what but I mean. <laughs> photo realistic, and they exactly match the real it's life the same faces. Stupid. The actor's face. If that's all they had, then I just, I just, I'm picturing the scene yeah. of him, a room full of like the best sketch artists, and like whoever can get the the best accurate picture of what I'm describing, I'll oh, give you a million dollars. Like they could have done that scene, and like, oh, all right, we could at least buy that. Instead, I'm laughing at this stupid technology that just renders their face. Because yeah, like, why, why would the NSA build a machine which has the power to take spider masks off of teenage? girls from the nightmares of yeah. mad villains yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who created that why what other application does that have yeah i i, I just yeah i want to see if that's a pattern to hold on to throughout the movie of like what could have been done instead of what they chose to do with this guy because like there, there's one scene later on that i i think might be the dumbest scene in the entire movie but like um the He's chasing the girls because you know we're, we're jumping back and forth, whatever. And they run into the cops, and he goes and he fucking beats up the cops. And like, even though that was a, an obstacle for them, it doesn't make any sense. Like he helps right. them get away. Like I, 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 I think I, I watched it twice. It doesn't make any fucking sense at all. Like, there's no reason he wouldn't have just left them, and that's their target. I, I don't know. Every single thing he does is just bizarre. 
It is, and, the, and no one has ever had the conversation with him. So you know those recurring nightmares you have where people dressed as spiders kill you? Do you think maybe you're just mad because you injected spider venom into your veins <laughs> and yeah. you've gone nuts? Like, that's more plausible. I'd at least want to rule that out if I was a villain. Right. Uh, Are they actually going to kill me, or am I just fucking insane? Yeah, exploring, well, you know, different options. What was the uh, what was the character like in the comic books and in the series? Like, what was he like before they did whatever they did here? So he was a white guy, uh, and he was um, uh, his first introduction. He was actually kind of a supporting character to Peter Parker. He was kind of like a father figure, um, mm -hmm. and it it was actually. A, he was uh, introduced alongside another big time villain um, in the early 2000s. Okay. Uh, I can't I've, I can't even remember his actual name now, but they were basically like, um, you know, the polar opposites of one another. Uh, mm -hmm. And he actually was um, he was a really intriguing character. I, I'm pretty sure he ended up becoming like a villain later on. But like that was his whole arc. Uh, like that's kind of gave him his three dimensionality, really. But he was he's nothing like this this is just you know I, I think i said earlier like this is more of a cartoon character than the actual drawing of ezekiel was in the comic books yeah he doesn't sound like a goofy yeah. moron that you just described like yeah yeah uh neil actually got it yeah morlin or morlin the other guy uh that he that was introduced alongside of ezekiel um in fact morlin would be more like this character than ezekiel would so oh yeah huh mm. uh. <laughs> yeah, he's, a, yeah. he's a strange one so I, I think next up in the plot um so we, yeah we, we the villain's got nsa tech now fantastic do is this the point we jump back don't we now to mother web at the baby uh shower party is that i think that's next <laughs> yeah, season, I, have yeah. It, uh, I have it pulled up it's 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 yeah. it's, it's the baby the barbecue. shower Barbecue, barbecue. Uh, people asking Bruce. Men, men, men can't flip burgers and they screw yeah, men, them. Yeah, uh, she's telling them how to do a burger on there. The interesting yeah. thing, well, the first thing that that I sort of noted for this is that that all of these people are paramedics, right? Um, mm -hmm. And they're all at a barbecue and they're all drinking beers. So you would assume from that that they are not on call because generally right. speaking, if you might have to go and drive an ambulance in five minutes' time, <laughs> which they do, you don't get drunk. Right, no, that that they're, is what happens. They're they're drinking beer, and then inside, all the women are drinking wine. Yeah, all the women inside are drinking wine. Yeah. Um, and this is where so this is baby Peter Parker inside the womb, and they have to try and guess the name, but they're not allowed to say what he's actually going to be called. This is an, an, another flash forward sequence that she has. She's another, she's like she is a social socially dysfunctional person in this scene as well. This is all sort of drumming up the point again. She can't relate to people because she has no mum. Um, she has no social graces. She has this flash forward. So she thinks the game is pointless because she's already had the scene but even though she hasn't she just you know jumped forward in time and saw it um but then they all get called away i'm trying to think of anything else significant happens in that scene. Uh, yeah how away, could you forget you know? this, her being a complete maniac and talking about childbirth at like a wedding uh, uh, like uh, yeah wedding shower like he her whole monologue out. yeah so it was insane and everyone's looking at her like just you know obviously don't elaborate on that and she keeps going as if it's nothing just talking about how her mom died in, ch in, died in childbirth when this woman is pregnant like it's, it's and, completely she has no social awareness whatsoever and they just highlight it but they highlight it in a way that makes her look like a sociopath it's like it's not even a joke it's so weird on top of that for some reason they make mary parker a cunt like i didn't understand <laughs> the choice to do that whatsoever because she's always been when she shows up on screen she's always a very loving very doting soft character right uh, the choice to get Emma Roberts to play her as well is just, I don't understand that that casting choice whatsoever. Maybe she's got an obligation, but she doesn't actually really try to, like, it's very superficial. She doesn't feel warm in the way that she greets Cassie, even though she understands that her and Ben have a very close relationship. Um, and even when the 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 game start, right? Yeah, she can't because she's a country. She can't. She, yeah. <laughs> she beat Evan Peters when they were together, man. Like, <laughs> she's not a nice person. Um, but, like, when they have the game, it's like Cassie had to put, like, the the best moments they've had with their mothers, right? Oh, my God. And it's, instead of maybe just opting out of that, Cassie puts a blank one in, but okay. But then if, it's just like they single her out for it. If you like, put a. If you put a blank one in, you know they're going to ask. That means you should have a prepared response. And what she says makes her sound like she's psychotic. It's just... Exactly. Everything oh. is watched. 
how could you put that in and ex- not expect them to ask you, hey, what's this? Like you, it's she's just. I, I don't know. No human would be this stupid. It's just the writer is just, just sabotaging. And she them. saves lives for a living. And yeah, she's that's that's crazy. <laughs> like it's crazy. Did it? Did anybody mention the balloon popping yet? I don't think no. I uh, no. get there yet. Why, okay. So. Oh, the deja vu balloon pop. Well, you know, platoons talked about the the rights to what they they don't have the rights to the word Ben Parker. Is that what you're saying? I think they oh, can't. They, yeah. they can't name Peter Parker. They can't can they? Say oh. him, so they had a balloon pop to cover or it. Peter Parker. I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah. So they had the balloon pop to to edit that out. Is that what that is? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Because right. I'm assuming this is part of the re-edit or the rewriting or whatever. Because they said they took out a lot of the um. Who, is this a rumor? Or did they actually take out a lot of the Spider-Man references for some reason? They weren't allowed to say Peter. That was a pattern I, I noticed. Know. So I assume it's yeah. yeah. Well, I, either I, way. They they either like they either took it out and they had to come up with a way to cleverly edit it, which is a b- balloon popping, and the, and when that happens, all the women are just like, hey, "That's so funny!" Like they're laughing at balloon <laughs> poppings. It's the gayest thing ever. It's like fucking Hillary Clinton. They're like, "Oh my god, balloons!" It's so dumb. <laughs> like the gayest thing ever, and your mind immediately goes to Hillary. Well, yeah. right, kind of gay. She's kind of, you know. Yeah, it's funny. She's she's, a, a, she's nuts, but it's the only scene where I relate to to her because I couldn't stand all these other women as well. Too. No, they yeah, were also well. horrible. I will just take a quick moment to to say a very big thank you Go to J Mac. I think it's such an Adam's surrogate uncle who is a uh, gifting channel memberships. Thank you very much for that, oh, sir. Um, yeah. So yeah. the balloon pop, like. The charitable read for that is that it's supposed to be a very clear visual indicator which establishes that she, she's lapsing forward and back in time again. So there's right. one big crash moment which you get to see twice so you know that this is another lapse in time. Um, but I do, yeah, the, it does also cover up when they actually try and reveal the name which is just funny. Oh, then right. Why, if you can't say the kid's name, why have in your film a game where everyone has to guess the kid's yeah. name? <laughs> what? Why? Yeah, just avoid it. I don't know. I think that's to really just like hone in that this is in fact Peter that Mary is pregnant with. Like, it's like they mm-hmm. wanted the credit for mentioning Peter Parker, but they still yeah. can't mention it. They well, wanted to double dip. That's the only conclusion I can come to. There's the additional thing as well, which is that by the end of this film, Madam Webb will, of course, have quite powerful foresight abilities. Do you think at any point she goes Some back and glasses. says to Peter Parker's mom, by the way, you're going to die, um, and maybe you should try not doing that? Oh my God. Well, no, because oh that's a canon oh, event, and she yeah, can't Chris. interfere with that shit. Yeah, <laughs> even the Spider-Verse already figured that out. You can't do that. You can't canon interfere event. with canon events. <laughs> well, actually, you can now, right? Across the Spider-Verse. Didn't he actually break that rule? Well, we'll see in the next oh, one. Oh, right, because he's going to um, do me, or whatever he says. He's going to do something yeah. different that breaks the canon or something. Yeah. It's also, I mean, you do get the, the bit the bit in this film when she discovers that she can actually change the future because, uh, well, we're coming right. up to that scene anyway. So. Eventually, she eventually figures it out after yeah. like a million Aven- years. It takes her a long time. Well, she does it and the then she forgets scene. that she can do it oh and then she realizes that she can do it again, but then she forgets right at the end of the film that she can do it. So it's, it's, it's very confused. Um, but so like, coming off the, the back of this baby shower scene, the only other person we're introduced to is the black ambulance driver. And we're introduced yeah. to him here because we have to feel very sad when in three minutes' time he dies because he drove an ambulance after getting drunk at a barbecue and didn't check his <laughs> fucking mirrors. Right. But that is actually when what he, happens in the film. When he dies, oh, I fucking that. laughed out loud. I can't believe they filmed it like that. <laughs> I know. It was the way it was shot, too, because like the yeah. setup and everything for his actual death. Yeah. And like, then when it actually happens, I fucking bust out laughing. How did he die? Like, was he like? He, it was his neck already broken. It was almost like car. a Final Destination scene. Yeah, it's it just, was one hundred percent. He got hit so lightly, and if she stalled him for more than 30, 30 more seconds, she would have saved his life. She put no effort into it, knowing even knowing even though she knew that his life could have potentially been on the line. No, if she was like a one percent go, go home kind of girl because she was like, "Well, let me drive," and he said no. And she's like, like well, oh, okay. I yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. right, I guess I'll just die. <laughs> this is supposed to have her believing. Like, this, this film is just insane. This is supposed to have her believe that she can maybe see the future, but she's powerless to change it. So that's like she goes back very depressed after this happens because she's not been able to change the thing that she saw coming, right? That's what she thinks at this moment. How do they show her that she's wrong? You've just lost someone who apparently is really important to you, even though we haven't got a fucking clue who he is. What There's do they do to prove her to hands. her? There's blood in her hands. It's terrifying <laughs> and terrible for her. How do they get her past this deep trauma? 
she saves the life of a fucking pigeon. <laughs> a pigeon flies into her window and she sees it coming. So she opens the window and the pigeon lives. So now she's over the trauma and she realizes maybe she can change the future. It's worse than that. It's worse than that. Because she's she's like, this isn't going to work. She accidentally saves the pigeon. It wasn't like she fully tried to do that. She just happened to open it up again. Like, it's like she, she, the opportunity should have been right there with Mike Epps. Save his life. Like, don't just let the man die stupidly like that. And the fact that they use a pigeon to for for that to be that re realization moment. And they don't even have her commit to saving it. She literally accidentally saves it. She doesn't even believe it's going to work. And that it still isn't enough for her to understand that this is potentially a power of hers. Because mm -hmm. that leads into the train scene. And that's I think that's the stupidest scene in the fucking movie. It, it, like, nobody would take that long after all those examples to figure it out. But they just make her like so slow. It's I don't know. That whole scene was just an abomination. His actual death scene. I, I just want to reiterate too how comical it is. It is really funny because <laughs> it's 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 legitimately shot like a um, like a Final Destination movie, like the latter movies when it was supposed to be funny. Like everyone's in on the joke um, because like the camera, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, the camera is on her. And he's driving away and we're aware of his fate because she saw the premonition yeah. and the camera like slowly turns and then just fucking out of nowhere, just wham, <laughs> like a tractor trailer truck hits his ambulance and it is comical, like the comedic timing. It's the values there. You know what I mean? If, if you look at them driving, it's like, where were they going? Like there's no logical yeah. destination for either of them. See him? Yeah, it's like how just look left. It's just it's right. You would have seen. Uh, you would have saw it coming a mile away. It's just <laughs> if you've ever driven like down the street, even just once <laughs> well, in yeah, your entire life, they, then you would know it's stupid. When she runs up to the ambulance too, like you, I I, I made sure to just because I knew it was just so incompetently done at this point that the movie was. So I was like, uh, let's look at the geography as it zooms out, and it is like there's no way he wouldn't have saw that tractor nope. trailer truck coming yes. unless he was inebriated, which he probably was. <laughs> you know, like he would have to be like bleh, like puking drunk as he got into <laughs> to <car>. not see <laughs> this. <fucking. laughs> literally, literally, like he's spinning, like he's got the spins and he's like leaning. Even <laughs> then, even then, I think he would have made it home. Like, it's yeah, maybe. Ridiculous. I mean, someone well, was maybe about the being... tractor trailer truck driver was drunk too. Then oh, oh, everyone both. would have had to be completely fucked up on all the drugs <laughs> for that scene to like. Not necessarily, because if it was a Zack Snyder film, what they could have done is cut away into <laughs> the cab. <laughs> of the truck and he drops a burger and then we get a slow-mo sesame oh, seed yeah. and then we get a crash you know it's funny that we're making fun of this and it's still probably better than snyder's scene because this is one you can blink and miss it and not really realize how stupid this one the snyder one he slows it down to make sure everybody knows how stupid this scene is the sesame seed and everything it's ridiculous but oh it snyder is. The only other thing I think that is important to note from the scene of his death is that they've been called away to yet another Fucking disaster. This one is taking place at a, an old fireworks factory, which, to use the film's own quotes, is filled with industrial grade fireworks. It is highly unstable. It has been described as a death trap. Um, and they make a really big point of us overhearing all of this, which is it's like it's Chekhov's fireworks factory, is what it is, which is the basic rule. They, everything in the plot has to pay off at some point at the end. So if they make a big point of having this deeply unstable factory full of fireworks, you already know when you first watch that scene that we're going to be back in the fireworks factory when things need to explode, which lo and behold, we are at the end of the film. But yeah, remember the fireworks factory because it becomes relevant later, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, it's, it's still burned down and full of explosives at the end of the film, which just makes it even better when things happen. But oh. I'm trying to think how we. So then we jump. It's the pigeon scene. Is the pigeon scene immediately after we get the pigeon scene when she yes. like the pigeon hits the window? She sees it. Then she opens the window back in real time, and the pigeon and survives. So now she thinks, huh, maybe the future is isn't entirely fixed. And do we then? I think we then go straight to the train. Sequence. No, we, there's a we get us we get a scene with villain man and he's like i'm giving you all this technology use it better like that's what he tells his girl <laughs> i remember that <laughs> and then uh madam webb or whatever her name is cassie she goes to the doctor and she's the doctor says that there's nothing wrong with her and just go home and like watch some old movies and that's like the best advice <laughs> like, that anyone has said in this movie for sure yeah yeah pretty much 
watch old movies. Mm-hmm. And then she did, right? Then she, she did. did. Like, this the only time she was reasonable. It was like the best scene. She watched some movie that happened to parallel her exact life. Yep. And that's that's what <laughs> leads like... into the bird. That, that leads into it's, the bird. It was, it was a Christmas carol and Scrooge. She was like, what did she say? I have the quote Fuck right you, here. Scrooge. It doesn't she was just like, something stupid and spiteful. Yeah, she it's was like the bit, isn't he? Where he like Scrooge is talking about the future and whether or not the future is is fixed or or changeable, and then she says something yeah. like, uh, "Sucks to be." Yeah, she goes, the "Hate or to something. break it to you, Scrooge, but you can't change anything." <laughs> yeah, something. Yeah, something along the lines of that. So Just cynical. Like, and yeah. then she anything. saves a pigeon, so we, Scrooge is wrong, and a Christmas yeah. Carol is is objectively worse than Madame Web. There we go. Um, <laughs> oh man. Is it then the train sequence? I'm actually trying. Yeah. I've got yeah. the thing, but it's train on another computer. Yeah, yes. Ben leaves like a voicemail, and she's like, "Oh, if you still catch a thing, you can come to Black Guy's funeral." And then saving the pigeon is like, "Oh, I'm gonna go to Black Guy's funeral," and she doesn't even put on funeral attire. Yeah, she's, she's just like, sh- casual wear. Oh my god, Vex, you're killing me because I'm thinking. In the, I'm looking at the scene, <laughs> thinking like, you know what? I kind of like this outfit. And then you mention she's going to a funeral. I'm like, oh my fucking god. She's just a monster in every way. You can't even find a black. I know your bitch ass has a black jacket. You probably own three of them. You, right. You know? It's, oh <laughs> my goodness. Because I'm, I'm skimming through it right now. And I'm like, I don't mind that jacket. Or she's hot as fuck. But like, that is not funeral attire woman. Come on. She also wears most of that same outfit later on when she goes into the Peruvian jungle, by the way. Yeah, she doesn't change her clothes. <laughs> she no doesn't change her has. clothes whatsoever. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> and that's, that's bullshit. Yeah, it's fucking silly, man. That, of all the things to screw up, you would think they'd want to give her plenty of outfits, you know? <sighs> oh, the train scene. The, the, yeah. Go ahead, Platoon. Do you think? <laughs> this scene. Yeah, no, I was trying to remember exactly what happens because this is beyond the point I've scripted. <laughs> I've only got this far in my review so far, and it's already an hour long. Um, but the train scene. So all of the the girls and uh, Madame Webb are all at is it's Grand Central Station, isn't it? I think mm-hmm. yes. at the same time on the same day, um, and they are picked up predictably enough on super secret NSA surveillance program. So Evil knows where they all are. Um, and they all board the same train. So he goes off to try and kill them in person as opposed to doing all of the many, many other things that he could be doing with this information. Yeah. Um, that you could redirect a train to crash into their train, for fuck's sake. You can do anything with this piece of technology, but he doesn't. Uh, yeah, but she then... sees it coming. She sees him coming. As she sees all of them die. It looks crap because it it's an action horrible. sequence in this film. <laughs> She, um, she has several clues. The guy speaking in front of her, the comment that he says, the lady that, that sits down, I think, um, and it repeats like over and over and over again to the point where you have a clear understanding. But then it repeats it like two more times, which is like the, the most frustrating thing with this because it's like it makes her completely stupid. There, nobody would take this long to figure it out. And at least if there's potentially lives on the line, you would try, you'd react. But it's it's like a it's like a comedy scene. It's one of the few moments in the movie. There's a couple times I do this where like this is a comedy beat. I, I can't believe they would put this in here and film it like that. Just like the the, the way they frame the car crash in the other scene. There's just oh. certain, certain screw ups. Like why would you do that? Unless you're trying to make me laugh. Yeah, it's, it's strange. Yeah, I um I think by the fourth or fifth time they cut to that old lady that she saw that's like sitting yes. directly across from her was when I was yeah. just like, Jesus Christ, is this dragging on like for a long yeah. time? Yeah. This was the one, every other one. I'm like, okay, two dead, whatever. This was the one I'm like, are you, you can't be serious. Like, yeah. Yeah. I was like, this is building going. to a fucking crescendo here. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like they were really driving the point home. Yeah. This was pretty bad. Uh, um, but like then that, five uh... foot, nothing villain comes on board the train. Right. At this point. Yeah, well, before this, so like all the was it Sydney Sweeney's there because she's running away. Uh, Hispanic girl is there because I don't know ice or something, and then black girl, um, stereotypically is I guess a a bad egg, right? She's committing crimes, and as she she's the last one to get on this car, and there's cops chasing her for some reason. Yeah, um, and I have. like that because I, I noticed it the first time. The cops are right behind her and she just ducks into the car and the cops just run past her. And when I say right behind her, like they you they could reach out and just grab her. That's oh how God. close they were. It, I thought yeah. that was absolutely hilarious as well. But then somehow there these cops later on are able to I guess catch a quote unquote would be kidnapper because the girls start screaming that she's a kidnapper and show up out of nowhere. 
I'm looking at it like she, they're like this far away. He yeah, just it's, it's <laughs> like, ridiculous. You could have just grabbed her hair, grabbed her bag, right. took her board. Like, there's so many options here. They're just completely useless. Yeah, incompetent, utterly mm. incompetent. This is stormtrooper tier. Like, just bad. Uh, so the characteristic doesn't come up again either. This is the problem with these the, sort of three teenage girls, with the exception of Sydney Sweeney, who has a bit of character development. The other two, they have pretty much one bit each. So. Yeah. This character is, like, we see her you know, running away from the police, so you know that she's a bit of a wrong, and she flips off the ambulance at the beginning, but otherwise her only characteristic is just she really, really, really likes food. Yeah, that's, and that's it. it. She's, she's but, hungry and wanted to go to the diner. Like, that's yeah, but it, more work for if that. you're writing a character and you say, well, ideally you have these traits and they become relevant in your plot at some point, right? Because a character should inform the stories that they are a part of. So what is it about her criminal background, which might make her a pretty good, you know, spider person? Is right. she good at fighting? Uh, is yeah. she stealthy? Is she sneaky? <laughs> that bit doesn't ever come up again. But the no, fact okay. she really likes food is an important plot point later on. And dancing. <laughs> well, She's right, dancing. they need to get yeah. her And her skateboard. Don't forget the skateboard. Let's not forget that cringe scene at the end. Oh, yeah. Well, not Riding. just at the end, but the beginning when she, uh, the, uh, 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 Madam Webb takes her skateboard, that's why she gets them off the train. She's like, she's like, give me my skateboard back. And then she like runs off the train it did we did, you didn't talk about the fact that how she, she she said this is an emergency everyone's gonna die and the only people that got off the train are the three girls yeah <laughs> and even, even this is, and the guy asked her like hey am yeah. i on the right train and she's like i don't know man like come, just help the dude uh, out like you, you how many she needs 50 more premonitions uh, to help this dude out like she can't even figure it out I, I, there, there was not a single moment they took to try to show like an altruistic nature to her like uncle no, ben but- off screen had more altruism and like heroism than she has throughout this whole thing. Yeah. Terrible character. She is, but yeah. then so are, so are they. So it's like she gets them all off the train. She picks them up because she sees their deaths and then she decides, well, I, I can stop this because I've, I've just saved a pigeon. So I know that this is a thing I can do. Um, so she takes them off and they don't really put up much of a fight. And there's a lot of, oh. like, one of the big problems with this film is the amount of completely amateurish uh i guess you'd call it filler dialogue or just noise background noise when characters are doing something the temptation is that you have to have them saying something to fill the gap because you know dialogue exists in film right we have to have them talking but they are almost interchangeable and their lines which are delivered everyone is a terrible actor in this film all three of the girls are particularly bad but their lines are awful as well and it's just the most generic hey what are you doing what's going on Stop it. They Leave have, me alone. As they just obligingly follow her off the train anyway, as they, they sort of subtly bitch about it, but do it because they have to, I guess. They're not individuals in this scene completely. They were, like previous, like seconds before, they were people with potentially personalities, and then they turned them into complete robots during that. They they had no opinions. They just fought like, took my, hey, give me back my board, and then literally didn't say another word for the next like five minutes. None yeah. of it was built up. The dialogue was atrocious. It just, it just, we need this to happen did, now. Fuck it. Just, did that girl's next, mom next die I, in ever? Do we find that out ever? Or did, Which did, girl's did, mom? Uh, Sweeney's Ooh. mom in the hospital. Oh earlier. no, no, the, it was. Uh, she's fine. Oh like, yeah. The reason we find out she runs away is because like her, I guess her mom is out of the picture or something like that. And like the it and just her stepdad like, was oh. rude. He was like, "Only families allowed in here" or something, right? <laughs> yeah, and it's just yeah. like, oh, I guess people don't want me around or something like that. Right, so but that didn't even play into away. the her character. Like that didn't. No, I, I guess it, it did. Didn't. Well, the the one time like um when they're all together and they're all explaining why they can't go to the police or whatever, they all have this little moment of, oh, here's my here's my relevant backstory or whatever, right? D- don't they all kind of do that my dad in, in the hotel room? Yeah, my oh, no, dad the, the, the deported things that's, that's later, but that's yeah, we'll, fucking hilarious. Because we'll the first it, time yeah. we do it, we'll get the yeah. she she rescues them from this train. Yeah. Um and it, the action sequence is terrible. But by the way, before we leave the train, I think this came up in Browns yesterday, but the villain walks in there not wearing any shoes. Is there a reason what? that he doesn't he doesn't wear like, shoes? What? I didn't so this the first time I'm looking at But right that now. doesn't matter because it's not relevant to the movie because they don't make it relevant. How do you know he's not wearing shoes? Where in the train? You see him he's walk into the train shoes. and he's not wearing shoes. Yeah, you yeah can he's see not it wearing in the shoes trailer. constantly. And wow, again, oh later God. on, when he's like getting into his car, he's also not wearing shoes. So he's every right. time he switches his spider he's wearing costume. Socks. But then <laughs> that means he's Airplane. just carrying around spider shoes everywhere. Which also doesn't make sense. <laughs> okay. Which is the other question, of course, is where is he carrying his spider suit? Yeah, where is it? Is it nanotech? I mean, it can't be. <laughs> no. Well, maybe the NSA. No. The NSA. The NSA. Yeah. Has, has nanotech. <laughs> 
It can't be though. It's not. It's a. It's a. Um, it's just a horrible movie. <laughs> and it leads into, and it, all... it just keeps going. Like this next part here, where the girl says one line on the train, like, "Oh, she's she's kidnapping us," which makes no sense when she didn't say anything that's remotely similar to that. Mm-hmm. Yet you went with her anyway. But then that information somehow traveled around everywhere, and like all the the cops were there trying to arrest her, and it makes no sense for them to do that. And then the fucking evil man just beats up all the cops like it's just why would he do that when he's trying to stop them like it it, he slows himself down there's no reason what's it's like i feel like i'm missing something someone help me out here is he just that stupid he's just that stupid but then so is everyone else because so so they all run away and yeah you're right he takes out the cops um now bear in mind the reason he knows they are all in this train station is because there are security cameras everywhere Mm-hmm. And yet, the security cameras apparently do not pick him up, beating up all of the cops, because after the fact, there's a the, is it an APB when they put something out like a missing person or a suspected like a suspected abduction, and they put uh, Mother Web in the frame for it. So the police report is even though we've just been beaten up by a man dressed as a spider, and it's probably on camera because this is Grand Central Station, the chief suspect is this random woman who walked out of the place with them. Um, so that sets up, I, I guess. Well, so, yeah, th- that that's the reason that they... No, it's not. Actually, that doesn't make sense. I was about to say that's the reason they don't go to the police. It's not the reason they don't go to the police, because in the car on the way out, she says that she doesn't want to have to take care of them. Um, yeah. She's just with them. She wants to drop them at their parents. Then she reasons, because they hear it on the radio, that she's been named as like the suspect, or that that's her description has been given uh, for the suspects. Um, right. She reasons that they are therefore the only people who can possibly exonerate her. So... You might be thinking, they'll go straight to the police, right? She doesn't want to take care of them. She knows they can exonerate her. So she will take them to the police and hand them over and get herself freed. No, because that would make sense. Instead, she takes them to the middle of the fucking woods somewhere (laughs) and just leaves them there. So she can go and research (laughs) these spiders. Just sit here and eat jerky until I get back. Like, what was... (laughs) Oh, man. Every decision, I'm just like, fascinatingly stupid. Why is anyone going along with it? The girls in the car when they were gone to the woods, she was saying these weird. I don't remember exactly what she was. She was dog talking out loud, and then the girls were reacting to what she was saying, and they were just like, "This feels like a kidnapping." The one girl said, <laughs> and, and like she said it, and then but she didn't like me. She just didn't care. <laughs> she was like, "I think we're being kidnapped." Like it was so casual. <laughs> I don't know, man. Now, are you now? To, now, do you think that the girl like, in real, if you were the girls and you saw a guy, spider guy on the ceiling in a subway, would you just get in the car with her and like just go along with whatever is happening? Like what? Uh, it, none of it made sense to me. Well, like, we like learned, uh, that person's um, probably all part of the ploy here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and like, also, <laughs> like we learned that these girls, like their parents are not around or no one really cares. So I'm sure that them being kidnapped by a stranger and potentially being sold into sex slavery is probably a better alternative <laughs> because at least they're getting some sort of attention from an adult. I am right. But then five minutes later, they're happy dancing at a table. And I mean, we'll get to Again, the carnival. Sex slavery, well, right? They got to learn how to work it before right. they meet buyers. I but there's presume. no urgency. Like all that, like these, these girls don't have any sense of like concern or urgency at all. It's just, they're, no. they're like, they're like children. They're like, five-year-olds oh my god <laughs> you know they're i mean children? <laughs> no i mean like they're like five years old like i, I you know i, I they feel don't, like they don't act their age or something i don't they I'm don't act any them. age they don't act like humans like it's completely they get their brains just stripped out of them like iq yeah. drop for that scene to work because they don't have the ability to have the discussion of all the, the four women that would have need to happen on that train mm-hmm. to like actually get the right. communication across they needed they just needed to rush it across just right we get we get hey give me back my skateboard first time <laughs> they've ever 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 <laughs> interacted besides the finger give me back my skateboard then we get uh uh hey i think my maybe we're being kidnapped and then oh cherry pie like those are the three <laughs> Like character development points in that entire like arc, it makes no sense. <laughs> None at all. It's so bad. None at all. It is, and it's annoying. I don't have any dialogue pulled from the um the wood scene, which is a shame. But it also doesn't stick in my mind because it's it's a really textbook example of how to write empty dialogue. So they're in the woods together, um, all of them. I don't. I, I, why they're in the fucking woods? I don't have a clue. Go to the goddamn police yeah. already. But um, they're in the woods, and so like 
I think that they're trying to do paint by numbers. So the usual thing to do if you want to do character forming scenes is you have them all argue with each other. It, you see this in all kinds of films. Slasher films are big with this. Like all the teenagers end up at the same camp and they just spend all the time arguing with each other. Apparently that makes you learn stuff about their characters, even though the only thing you really learn is you want them all to die and you support the guy who's killing them. But that counts as character <laughs> progression, might. apparently. The same what? sort of thing happens here, but it's even emptier than that because they, they all lie about their parents in this first scene. This is the first time they have a conversation about who they are and where they've come from. Um, but they all give varying explanations like, oh, my dad's out of time on out of town on business, or my dad's away doing something else, etc. It's only like the second scene much later on toward the end of the film when they reveal the truth about their families, which is just fucking funny because right, if, if you, you take one woman and you, you cast an Hispanic actress... What's the, the surest way you can tell people who don't have eyes that she's like Hispanic? Oh, her parent got deported. Yeah. My eyes, okay. yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, eyes there, was, up. there was some good dialogue in the uh, in the forest. One is like a uh, black chick is like, oh, she's cute when she's mad when they're just like, oh, we shouldn't we yeah. should stay here instead of walking off. So there's a little wondering. bit of like lesbianic vibes that come across. Yeah, and then something. When the the black chick's hungry, they because there's a couple instances where they throw in like climate change messaging, so they intentionally zoom in on her or at least show her throwing away this jerky package into the wild, and then on top of that, they leave a burning fire um, in the middle of the woods as well when they decide to go to the diner. But isn't so that then, so? That that's how she traces them to the diner, isn't it? So like when when she so. Madam Webb disappears because they, they, they are getting nowhere with this pointless non-dialogue. Um, but she suddenly remembers that, hey, my mum like, wrote about spiders or something, so I'm going to go and research some spiders, stay here. And then she drives all the way home to look in the notebooks that she apparently reads every night, yet can't remember any of the details of, <laughs> to research the spiders. And it's only when she comes back looking for them, and then they've already gone to the diner, she uses the fire and the empty packet, I think, to trace them to the diner even though the diner is five minutes down the way and it's the yeah. only other building inside. She, she, mm -hmm. she goes back to where she left them, which is like, why would she not expect them to be gone? She left three girls in the middle of the woods. They're, they're not going to be there. Anyway, <clears throat> she looks at a packet. And then what, what was the other thing she looked at? Like a, uh, like a, like a, like the, a the, bottle? The, isn't it the bottle, the fire, and the packet, I think, are the and three then, things. Yeah, she, it's right there where she left them. And then she goes, she, it's, she acts like she's following a breadcrumb trail. She's like, oh, a packet. Therefore, I'm going to go six, six kilometers out of my way to find them. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Not it's at just all. Uh, like a breadcrumb trail would have been really, really cringe, but it would have made sense at least, you know, instead of just, oh, I know where they are because I see this. Uh, package on the ground like <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. But this is this is the bit where diverse female character number one's one characteristic comes into play because they only go to the diner because they've established that she's really hungry all the time and she's eating all of the jerky that they have so they have to go to a diner even though they know they're being hunted by an actual spider demon they think nah solid food is more important than they go away meanwhile madam web is back home researching yeah. this spider ship and um that for the first time ever, apparently, like she looks at the pages documenting the, the Peruvian spider people and the powers they have. And then there's probably the only scene in the film that's trying to say to you, please laugh genuinely, which oh. makes it one of the least funny things in the film, is when she says, how would you know you can climb walls if you've never tried? Oh, and then she jumps into a wall and falls over. And I'm thinking wow. that you are much funnier film when you're not trying to be funny. Yep. This, is, yeah. this is just cringe. Pretty sure was... right I'm pretty sure right before that, she has the funny, one of my favorite lines in the whole movie. She goes, she's reading about the spider people in the book, and she's like, they can climb. She's talking to herself, by the way, Chad. She's not talking to anybody. She's speak, talking out loud in her own apartment to her cat, because she's crazy. She's talking to us, so we she, know. <clears throat> she says, they can climb like spiders, <gasps> just like ceiling guy. Right. How would you know? You she calls him ceiling wall. guy. Right. How do you know yeah. that you could climb walls if you never tried? And that's where you get that really stupid fucking scene. Um, that actually was, yeah, like you said, it's funnier when they're not trying. I don't know why they kept that into the final cut because it even right. it looks painful uh, just on, on the screen. It was ridiculous. <laughs> she looked embarrassed. I'd be also, embarrassed the fact that I they have that. a the fact that they have a comedic beat like that lets you know. Like none of this was intentional. Well, <laughs> like oh, yeah, the, the true, comedy yeah. of the rest of the movie, that's just not intentional because that's yeah. what right. happens. When well, like doing for, there's a really good example of the unintentional comedy in this same scene, right? So this, this she's looking through the notebooks, having tried to climb and failed, 
She's looking through the notebooks, and bearing in mind she's already met the villain. She's met evil at this point. She saw him on the train. Stealing guy. She flicks through the notebooks, and okay. what should fall out of the notebook? But but a photo of her mother with evil, and then she Very thinks, convenient. "Oh shit! I recognize that guy. He's with what? my mom." And it's like, "Oh my! How how did you already know that though? If you read this thing every night, how is this the crazy. first time you're yeah. seeing it? It's crazy. It's just she would have every." single thing in that box she would have memorized she would have seen looked at that picture a thousand times it's just uh, how could they think this is possible as a scene <laughs> like just remove these it just makes it so much more difficult to take her story seriously mm -hmm. yeah and then right after this okay i wrote down um nsa lady <laughs> nsa lady magically picks up a phone call like i don't know what that means can somebody remind me what that means like right after this there's a phone call and that's how he finds them at the diner yeah, so like um, because of the scanning tech that she has, they can pick up uh, like a guy recognizes the girls at the diner, right? Uh, because they're oh, now he, he playing, that's right. Yeah, it's a random guy because they've also made national headlines in like the three hours all of these events have happened. <laughs> by the way, yeah, so and they're in the newspaper. Random, and they're in the newspaper. That's why he was. Yeah, reading they're on the from. front page of the newspaper <laughs> that the guy happens to be reading. Yeah. And he thinks they, and but I don't think that I don't remember there being photos of the girls. I think the headline no. is just like three girls kidnapped. And so he looks at three girls dancing on a table in a diner, concludes they must have been kidnapped because you know, if you see girls dancing on tables in diners, they've probably been kidnapped. So they look right. like they've been kidnapped. Next so he calls the police and and yeah, evil's little henchman picks up the call and then directs evil to the to the diner. So, so she I, has I wanna... access to every phone call. And she can hear them all at once somehow, and she can, and including payphones, because I think that, was that a payphone? Anyway, it's a diner phone. I just don't understand how, I guess we're supposed to just be, say, it's it's, it's just magical technology, right? Basically. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say about the girls, like, they're fully aware of the situation and know that they're being hunted by this crazy guy. Yet she sees a cute guy that she likes and she forgets all of that. And wants to oh, get dude. More oh, the it's table. not one cute it's, guy, it's like in, six or seven cute yeah, guys. Legit wants to get gangbanged. And I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, why, why, are we, why are we watching your gangbang fetish? Like, what happened? Yeah. Here? And she encourages her fucking like humble friend to be a slut too. Like, come, let come, me, for sure, sure. Yeah, let me fix your, your shirt. I have like, this. It fuck because I'm like, um, that, that's that same scenario, stupid as it was. That shit does happen. Like, there's girls that are that dumb, and then they get some, you know, so. I internet. don't know about that. I, I, if, you share, if you share my screen, I can show <laughs> what this is because I put it on Twitter, and it's not. I'm not going to play it, but like, it's uh, um, this is the, so it's like okay, so they're they're in this. She sees them in the window dancing, and then she goes in, and then just so Chad understands. They just were like afraid of this monster guy. They may have been <laughs> a girl. They were just <laughs> they wandered into here and now they're dancing on a table. And in no universe does this happen ever. Yeah, There's but no cute guys and she has tits, yep, dude. That's it. Bro, yeah. the girls don't behave <laughs> like this. That's at it. all. Not an ounce of fear. They just don't. Yeah, yeah that's they're what sober. I mean. Drunk girls oh. act like this. They are not girls. victims. No. Maybe one girl, yeah, and they're sober, and maybe one person would do this, but not all three of them. They're all different let personalities. Me, let, me, let me let me just clarify what I was oh, saying wasn't yeah. not for this scenario, of course. I'm talking about just <laughs> girls being bad, bad, oh, bad influences on other toxic. girls. This scenario is retarded. This should never happen. Oh, <laughs> this is insane. And then, but we got toxic, so it's great. So, we like, got my... toxic and yeah. That's yeah. why they put this in 2003. Right? That's, yes. that's literally why they dated it. This, that's that, but, but what are your priorities, well, man? I had. You know I what happened? Someone Googled toxic and it said that it was recorded in 2003 and they just read that first line and didn't read the rest and ran right. it. Right. So into the movie. I had a theory about that. I don't remember if I said it on Mr. Brown's or Mr. S uh, Mrs. Sassy's stream. But so I don't know if you guys noticed that Crossroads came to streaming for the first time ever on February 15th. I rewatched it after I went to the cinema to see this. But so a couple weeks ago, there were a bunch of interviews that the director of that movie was doing and some of the actors about how they were going to remaster the soundtrack for that movie. And it was a big deal because no one had had it. It had never been on digital before uh, and it was getting like a full release and all this stuff. So my thought process was, is that this was all unintentionally net. Cause as soon as I got home, Crossroads popped up on my streaming feed on Netflix. Um, and on top of that, uh, hold on. There was one more Crossroads? point to this. Oh yeah, yeah. So that movie. So Britney Spears. It was her debut movie, right? 
the label that she's under or the two labels that she's been associated with are both under Sony. It's all product placement. All of it. I mean, to be no. fair, there is a lot of product placement in the film, isn't there? there? Is. Isn't someone, someone's playing a PS, yeah. uh, PSP, which comes out in 2005. They're playing Toxic, which comes out in 2004. The film gives you a title slate, which tells you the film is set in 2003. Three, it's like, why, yeah. why did you even bother doing it? If you hadn't done that, and if you just like put a blockbuster on the screen, which they do, um, and you just gave us these vague mid-2000s references, all we need to know is it's mid-2000s. We don't need to know specifically that you're set in a year before all the stuff you're featuring in the film is actually released. That's just dumb. It's well, like, and that's the song too. That so the song is only like three minutes long, but they play it on a really long loop while all of this is happening. Because there were a few other songs that I did notice from the era, but they don't hone into them as hard as they do Toxic. Because this is really the only sequence that we get where there's music in the background. None of the other sequences do. Uh, like the final fight, it's just kind of generic movie music. Um, but the yeah, for some yeah, reason, this right. one drags on. It's the only diegetic soundtrack that they use, I think. I don't remember any of the scenes where they highlight it. They mention yeah. Beyonce, don't they? But I don't... I don't. Oh, no, it's, it's on a billboard. It's not really mentioned. There's a giant billboard before Cassie goes to Peru, and it's outside of her apartment with... um, Was it Crazy in Love? That was the, the album. And was that album actually released in 2003, or was that like 2007? Yeah, that... That's actually accurate. 2000. That was, oh. that was, you know, I actually remember that from memory. 2003. Yeah, I, I do too. Yeah, that's actually 2003. <laughs> that song was everywhere that summer, specifically. I remember. Mm -hmm. Guys, I, I, I have to, I have to, I have, I have to get feedback on something. I'm, I'm, I'm arguing with the creator of Luke Cage on Twitter. Luke, like Luke Cage, the the, the TV show, Luke Cage. Mm -hmm. The creator is like arguing me, <laughs> and he asked, uh, he asked to for me to call him on his phone. What do I do? I've Call never him. had this phone, man. Call him. He wants to argue with me on the phone? About what? About, I, I made fun of the Madam Web writers because people were defending the guy and calling him a legend because he makes millions of dollars and all his movies are bad. Anyway, he said, uh, you want to come at me? Here, I'm under my name. I actually have time today. And then here, just like, like just look at this. Look. I'll share, just, I don't know what to do. Like, what am I supposed to do? Just tell them to stop. Just share. I'll share my screen quick. <laughs> I'm looking at the the films that you screenshotted here, and of the films he's done, so it's Morbius, the new Power Rangers, Madam oh, Web, too. Dracula Untold, Gods of Egypt, and so the this last is the guy. Yeah, this is shite. the guy. This is the guy who wrote part of Madam Web or something to do with Madam Web, and people are making fun of his career, and then. This guy called him, the Luke Cage guy was like, you mean six movies with his name on it? Legend. You don't understand the battles, man. You just don't know how hard it is to get one movie made. Who knows if those films even reflect his scripts at all? So I said, who knows if the films reflect his scripts at all and legend? It's like, it's like an oxymoron. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I, I was like, I was like, your words are, uh, I said, uh, you know, being a multimillionaire without contributing anything of cultural value your words not mine because he did say who knows if he's even in the scripts right i said doesn't even warrant relevant let alone legend and they're all defending this guy it's like we're, i don't know anyway the point i'm trying to make is this guy wants to yell at me and i asked him to come on stream only if you guys want him to by the way That'd be and he responded he, he responded do it call me on my phone what am i supposed to do <laughs> I, tell him again? To come on the stream. I don't know. Yeah. This this guy sounds like someone Seven terrified of a conversation. Right? Like he this yeah. all this He's Twitter yelling of Luke like, Cage. This you get him on the phone, hilarious. he'll just like yeah. just say, I don't know. Just uh, tell him we're live now. Just come on the stream. We're or, talking or, about your movie right now. I, I watched like it. It was hilarious. <laughs> it's one of the stupidest watching? things I've seen in years, but I'd love to talk about it. Like a thousand people or whatever. Uh yeah there's memes to be made yes <laughs> i'm sure if he comes on more people will come and we'll tweet it out we just don't understand his vision guys okay, he's <laughs> yeah what is um he's a legend because he got this movie made also just because it's bad it, it probably nothing he wrote was even in the movie anyway so by that criteria yeah. anyone who gets a movie <laughs> okay. made is a legend like you just have no standards at that point like you don't yeah. know you don't know how hard it is to make a movie if, if that is a part saying. of i don't even defense. know what i'm saying I don't know what's happening. I'm just telling him this. You just Come type on. stuff. Let's go. Cool. Um, I, I just had to. I, I just was panicking because I didn't know what to do. Oh, <laughs> don't panic. Don't uh, panic. <laughs> like, I don't really care. Him anyway. Is he going to like tweet his phone number out? That's what I mean. Like, what? what? Did I don't he know. DM I don't know it what to you? 
I don't really want to talk to some guy on the phone about about. I guess I could, but like, why? Why not just? What's you know, that gonna if you were Chris Stockman, you would have avoided this whole thing. Fuck that <laughs> no, guy, right? man. What a spineless, what a... like that little clip that Jay Longbone played about like how he doesn't want to talk. This is not a well, review. Like, I don't just... want to talk about this movie. He can't criticize yeah. anything because it's going to hurt feelings. Like what the fuck yeah. is the part? What's the point of you then? That's what, what value do you this. bring in any way? That, yeah. I, well, also, it, we already know if you're not man. reviewing it, it means you think the fucking movie sucks. So, like, <laughs> just, well, you might as well just tell us why. Yeah, man. He he treats people like we're just stupid. Like, and, and I, I really is, can't yeah, stand man. his approach. If you have something to say, criticize it. Like, if you're if make sure your references are right, stay objective, and just you know, you're entitled to your opinion, especially if it's well researched. But if you're so afraid to have any type of opinion because you're afraid someone might get upset, like are you just you're spineless. Like mm -hmm. Stuckman, step it up. Like this is pathetic. You're, someone in your position should do better, man. It's um that that started this whole thing, and then a bunch of people were like, "Why are we attacking writers?" They're like, "Stuckman's right. Why are we attacking writers?" Because sometimes movies get um a, a studio intervention will kind of destroy the the writers' uh, babies, and it's like, yes, that does happen sometimes. Clearly. Um, <laughs> but, it's, it's but not... like, but you know. I don't know if if you guys think that about if you have done any research into the into the Madam Web movie, but to be fair, this guy who wrote, who was part of this movie has had nothing in his entire career, in my opinion, that has been a good at all. Like it's all it's all trash, and it's like at what point are we allowed to like make fun of somebody, like laugh at somebody? Like it's we've been like criticizing dialogue and writing has been like a thing for decades. Like it's just there's it's not like this is a new thing that this like why are we you know what I mean? Like platoon. Do you have any like I, I was just gonna knowledge say, but... that like or like uh, feedback here <laughs> as a writer? But I so um, it gets it's a harder defense to mount the more films you do, right? So that let's right. say hypothetically, let's say Morbius. Take Morbius as an example. Let's say studio interference is solely responsible for ruining that film. I don't think that's true. But hypothetically, right. let's say it was. The writers had a really good idea. The studio looked at it and said, no, take all of the good stuff out and give us Morbius instead. Um, and they, fine, that's sure. one experience. And you can say, fine, well, the right has been hard done by in that situation. When right. you've done six of these things yes. and the same problem has arisen, either you are willingly selling yourself and you don't give a shit that the studio is about to ruin your film, right. or the studio isn't actually doing that much to ruin your film and you're just not a very good writer. But you can't keep deploying the defense of, the studio right. interfered, the studio interfered, the studio interfered. If the studio is ruining your work and you want to be proud of what you do, you don't work with that studio. Yeah, That's so not right. that or, hard. Or, or at yeah, some point, like maybe company, maybe say something about it instead of just, you know, if you're, going through your, like, talk about it. All. Come out and talk about it. Like, If you're creative, you have that little control a, of your own work, then that's your own yeah. problem. You know what yeah, I mean? Like George R. R. Martin the, famously said exactly. that, like, the sexiest line ever to these, um, whoever the studio people he's talking to was no. Like having the balls to say no and like having some integrity for your own product and your story. Like you need to be able to do that. If you're just going to say, oh, the studio, oh, the studio, what type of creative are you? Have some faith in your own story. Well, like, Joe, Joe, you know? Joe Russo, Joe Russo, who wrote that really bad Bruce Willis movie where he had dementia. Mm -hmm. You remember that? It's called Hell Diver or whatever. I can't remember the name of it. But some, one of the, that, that guy who started this whole thing and he was saying that, oh, I've read Nat's screenplays for two of these movies and they're, they're nothing like they are on the screen. He's a really, really good writer. And he, he's, just, he's just like, trust me, bro. This guy's a good, good, good writer. And it's like, so what's happening exactly? Are you saying this guy just gets paid to do, do nothing? Like, <laughs> what's Believable. he contributing? But, but the, the other thing as well is like, it, it depends which bits of the writing you're talking about. I can absolutely believe that for this film, for Madam Web, yes. that Sony stepped in and said, we really want the final fight to take place under a giant Pepsi sign. Yes. I can completely <laughs> believe that that was studio <laughs> yeah. interference, right? Yeah, but, but yeah. That but kind of studio interference, movie. that is not telling you to go back to the beginning of your film and write dialogue like, I hope yeah. the spiders were worth exactly, it, man. Exactly. Right. Like, there's, there, you right. can isolate the moments where like clearly this is studio and a mandate studio interference and whatnot yeah but you can't use that as an excuse for the entire movie when there's specific choices you made as a writer to make them retarded characterization is happening at all times and when you make your character a monster within 10 minutes you fucked up when you make your yeah, movie a comedy within five minutes you fucked up even more you know yeah. like it's, 
it's just crazy. Like, like, I, can't, I, mean, I don't. I have no experience writing for a, a, a big film studio. Right. But you know, I, I write for a video game, and you have conversations, creative conversations, about the direction so and so might want to go in, or the direction this part of the plot might want to go. And you don't necessarily have to agree with every decision that's being made. But that's I, the direction that you mutually agree upon. And then your job is to go and do the absolute best thing you can with whatever you're doing. I'm actually quite lucky in that I don't disagree with much of what's happening. But like, hi, there are a couple of there will be a couple of occasions where you might think, well, I, I, that might have worked better in a different way. But that doesn't matter because you're still a self-respecting writer and your job is to make collaboratively the best work of art that you can. Um, and so there is no excuse for going back and writing dialogue like you see in Madden Web. Because right. like, that's not and, studio interference. That's just you having no talent. That's I very think, different. Two and really it, good it, examples. Or, go ahead. Yeah. Well, well, like, like, it, it, you, you, like a hundred percent of this movie has bad dialogue. It's not just that, like, you know, like yes. twenty five percent of the studio intervention, 50, 60, Earl. 70. It's a hundred percent. And even if it's a, if it's like we need a scene in a diner where they can have a fight scene, even with you're given like exactly what to write, you still don't have to write the fact that oh they, they have to stand on a table and dance. No, they could do anything like. Guys could be hitting on like there anything could be happening, and they yeah. chose the most cringe thing. And these are the writers. This is, I mean, the studio didn't write the script, otherwise they wouldn't credit the writer. I was going to say two um two really good examples to add to that point of like yeah studio interference. Uh, the beginning of Predator and the Thing both start with seeing the spaceship, and I'm pretty yeah. sure that studio mandate stuff that because oh they need an alien movie and i think right. both of those movies would be better if you remove those scenes and like keep the mystery of like us discovering the like this is an alien movie like just in a natural way there's no right. need to spoil it at the beginning yet those movies still hold up those movies are still fantastically written you yeah. just, there's you can't just say oh all these other things excuse any is issue in the movie because of studio mandate issues you can overcome studio mandate fuckery and but if this you isn't the case of that. This is just like the entire script is trash. Yeah, and and if if you can't overcome it, if it's so bad, the interference is completely unavoidable, and every decision that's being made is wrong. And the example that's coming to mind at the moment is Alien Three, probably. I mean, that was famously a, a mess from the studio perspective, yeah. as a result of which the director disowned the film, refused to come back to do a director's cut. So the extended version has to be called the the, the what was it the cutting room cut or the, the whatever the fuck. The thing is called it's not a director's card is the point because he refused to have anything more to do with it now that's that's one way of approaching this problem if on the other hand you say is it david fincher who did alien 3 that's the name i've got in my head but let's yes. say you're in his perspective so. and your film has been completely ruined and you think it's terrible and then you go back and do another one knowing what the process is like then you yeah. can only really blame yourself for exactly. what happens exactly if you know the process and the protocol and like exactly the beast that you're getting into then you are to blame now if you had the integrity to leave the project when you knew that it was fucked up that's fine but to go back in that environment it's on you now it's, like there's so many examples of uh marvel's directors or or, or um people who brought, got came got brought in saw how disney does d does things and then they just dipped and then if you're going to stay and like suffer through all that, then it's, it's on you now, you know, like JJ Abrams, his name is on the rise of Skywalker. <laughs> like, it's sorry, dude. Like you, you, you know what I'm sorry. It's stuck with you. That's why that guy is living in a cave somewhere now. He hasn't worked in years. Like it's, it's just, it's crazy, but I don't know. I just wish people had, I don't know what the answer is, but well, I wish there was more, uh, unified vision in terms of the creative control, like producers yeah. actually trusting creatives. Now it's well, just, yeah, that's very true. Pro uh, pro who said this recently? It was um, it was Dakota Johnson. She was like, uh, "Movies are very producers are very safe and boring, and they don't trust creative people." That's exactly what she said. You know, as in she interview. signed up for this movie. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> well, I think that's why but she said it because I she don't, realized it, making this movie that it's <laughs> oh, she <laughs> was trying to promote another film. That's why because yeah. she'd done an indie film and she said that in the interview. Well, now the guy now the guy responded and said. You come at me and would rather have a conversation in front of a thousand people instead of a regular yeah, conversation. Yeah, he's definitely like, pussy really? out here, huh? What's it's the like, problem? Yeah, obviously, like I think it would be better to have uh for somebody who created the Luke Cage show and to come on and talk to movie fans and TV fans about whatever his opinions are. Or all well, media like, fans. Especially if everybody agrees here. with Especially if they all agree with me and he thinks that I'm wrong, like why wouldn't you want to come on here? Well, if he has a point that he thinks is very pressing and he needs to get it across, then exactly. surely having that out in front of more people is better than having it one-to-one. -one, but If right. he has references that he believes right. in, if he actually believes in what he's saying, then it shouldn't be a matter if there's 20 people on here, if there's a million people in chat. Like, it, yeah, it shouldn't he, he matter must not if you believe He must not be saying. familiar with streaming and audiences yeah. and all that. No, Maybe no. Just, no, I don't think it's that. I think it's just that, that he, he's... Confidence, exactly. Up. Confidence is probably... I mean, it's, it's, you, know, you don't need to be familiar with... 
oh no right, right, no right. no someone right. called him a coward <laughs> <laughs> that's not gonna get yeah, I, know, I, know, I don't know. like when i don't like when people do that it's like you know it makes me i don't even know the guy this is just an observation but like you don't need to be experienced with streaming to want to defend your point yeah. you believe in your point like i, I don't know if it helps people. it would be perfectly yeah. respectful i'm genuinely interested in what he has to say i think it could yeah. be a very useful conversation and i treat it much more as a you know I, a, a, an interview than a slanging match but i i get yeah. the impression from what he said that he was much keener just to shout at you in private yeah uh, I, 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 that's okay. hey, I, I was terrified i'll, of I'll do it i'll do it maybe on the maybe maybe i can tell him to come on another stream some other day <laughs> but i'll talk to him in private i'll do it yeah do we'll it see, why not we'll see what happens anyway yeah but 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 um but yeah i think the whole studio system thing is a problem that like yeah i understand why the industry people are like you guys don't know how it works you're not aware of all of the the uh the problems that we have to deal with is right but yes we we don't understand all of it but at the same time you can't just say that the entire creative writing community in hollywood is immune from criticism you cannot do yes. that that's, yeah. that's crazy you know, and there, there are lots of people who are just shit writers. It's, it's the Christopher Hitchens quote. It's, yeah. it's, you know, it said everyone has a book in them, and in most cases, that's where it should stay. And that's <laughs> correct. Um, that a lot of people get promoted for reasons having nothing to do with talent, and they have no talent, and it shows when they create stuff. Not, not anyone who's got into the room in a Hollywood production as a script writer is actually going to be a good writer. 100%. An awful lot of them are going to be terrible. In the same way that you go to an airport and like you say you want to pick up a book to read, the airport pulp novels are an entire genre. You go to an airport, you go pick up a book, and the chances of it being absolute crap or something by Stephen King, which is absolute crap, are pretty high. Mm -hmm. That's true, yeah. No, yeah. Guy, yeah, Luke oh, Cage did no, jump the shark, by the way, halfway through season one. Yeah, that was like, so bothered. Point. I never bothered with any of that. I was just overwhelmed, man. I was just like... Mm. I've always been hyper picky with my superhero content because my I want it to be basically. Can you make a story good enough for someone who doesn't give a fuck about superheroes so I can right, watch yeah, it? Yeah, with yeah. a friend or my mom or nothing. You know, yeah. like because I think that's when it passed the test. And um, absolutely agree. With yeah, that. It, it's it's so much more satisfying when someone else who doesn't care about this but still can take it seriously as a story. Um, yeah, I'm not a fan of like you have to be a massive fan of the comics to even appreciate mm. this and take it seriously. Like, nah. Yeah, that's a. That's a B.A. Turner argument. Well, in the comics. Yeah, oh, in you. the comics, though, in the, in the book, <laughs> in, the, in the lore, in page 62. It's like, we're talking about the fucking movie, dude. Like, just, you got people, the adaptation thing could be a podcast on its own. Like, it's it's so interesting, people's defense of that. Mm. Yeah. Um, uh, so where were we in the movie? I, I, yeah. I have no idea. Platoon, get us back in there. I, got it. Um, I, I paused it. It was right after the train, or no, right after the... Oh, after at the, the diner, at the ball. diner... The dancing Diner. on the table, and so she has this vision of them all getting killed by by evil spider demon guy, which, um, and uses which the stolen the most, taxi. The most, I, I almost got sick. What did anybody else almost get sick because the camera was upside down every other shot during that premonition? Yeah, scene? it was going nuts. Terrible, throughout. terrible yeah. camera work. I, I, I don't think we we mentioned it throughout this whole thing. The directing of this is ass. Sorry to interrupt. It's, with it's so bad. <laughs> It's yeah. just, yeah, we, we mentioned it briefly, but there, there's so many things in this that are so bad that it's almost we forgot to mention it because it's a given. But the yeah. directing, the acting, like it's all atrocious. Yeah, every, every yeah. aspect. There actually is a final destination scene as well when she's driving the taxi toward the diner and she's following a truck that's carrying a load of logs. And I'm pretty sure that is a death in Final Destination is someone is driving behind a log truck yeah. too. Is it part? Yeah, and gets killed. Sadly, that doesn't happen. But what does happen is that she has this flash forward premonition, sees him coming, then in reality, in real time, uh, he arrives, he enters the diner, and she drives through the diner in a taxi and twats him with a car, which is the first of two <laughs> times that he gets hit with a moving vehicle at high speed and survives. And yes! uh, all the people that were yes! sitting on that side of the diner too, because we do see them, they just happen to be gone when that happens. Thank which goodness. Is, uh, yeah. Great yeah, they're, they're, as they're... well, yeah. Yeah, because no violence, I guess. No violence is allowed in Sony movies. We saw that with Carnage. <laughs> we saw a woman get shot in the opening, so I don't, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know about that. I know, that. but like, I, like uh, getting hit I mean, by a car might be considered 
too violent. If, I don't, if I don't you know. notice, he walks in. He comes in all casually like this to like you know see the girls instead of just going and grabbing them. Like hurry up. That's the reason he got hit. Like they even the setup for the car crash here is stupid. You know, like just. I think we're, we're all forgetting this is the United States. So why? And if he has the money, why isn't he just hiring a sniper to go and you know? I said that. I said that earlier. Why not a hitman? Like all the options. Yeah. yeah. How could you show us he has all these resources and then show proceed to show us all the stupidest options? Yeah. To take in. like why would you but that's the, thing, the, the diner scene was technically broken way back in the train station scene earlier because she steals a taxi what what the taxis tend to have like all motor vehicles number plates what does he have nsa super secret surveillance worldwide programs that can track things like number plates that he shouldn't have even needed to try and trace them down in this way yeah. he should have been able to head them off ages ago because he spotted them because he traced the taxi that's not hard to do oh my God. and and also the the, the another thing is so weird to me he has this spider suit that I'm I'm assuming he's never used before because they never established that he's like a wanted villain in this like the universe like he's not like I, they never said anything maybe he is but they never said that he was so he has this suit did he make the suit just to go after them like yeah he like, just had it on standby yeah which is weird <laughs> well he saw them in the vision they had suits on maybe he thought oh I gotta make a suit I don't know guys this movie is so unbelievably it's confusing so stupid, yeah. Um, there's no explanation for any of this stuff. Like, it would be cool if he was this like villain. Like, they had some like on the TV, uh, black, uh, Venom suit Spider-Man seen once again. You know, disturbing the peace or whatever. Like, something, but, yeah, some type uh, of history as to what he's been doing all this time. Right. Like, you could fill in his whole story in like just, one really well crafted scene. But like, I, think, oh, hold like on. But I don't know. We forget to mention. Remember the 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 spider people in the opening. They all had yeah. twig and berry spider suits. Yeah, twig and, and for some reason, he takes that inspiration as twig. a means for his own spider suit, <laughs> but in latex. I... Right. Uh, well, because he can't take inspiration from Spider Man, who I, d- doesn't, uh, he doesn't exist, exist yet, but, though, right? But, so... but if he did exist, he would have taken inspiration from Peter Parker. I, I don't fucking know. It doesn't make I, sense. Maybe he took inspiration um, from the suits of the girls who killed him in his dreams who were also dressed as spiders. But that's, yeah, that's just headcanon like, shit because the film doesn't do anything to set no, that up. It doesn't tell you anything. That's so true. Movie. Like that's the only possible interpretation you can have. Like how else like, Spider-Man doesn't exist so the only thing he come yeah. come up with would be from his dreams, right? And again, even if that's true, why the fuck would you design your suit based off the girls that you're having a vision of killing you? It's just, yep. <laughs> even with Ed Cannon, it doesn't work. It's just so stupid. There's nothing to save it. <laughs> yeah, and then it, it breaks immediately afterwards. So they, they drive off in the taxi, and he's absolutely fine having just been hit at high speed by a taxi. And then he gets on a call with his little villain henchman person. <laughs> Um, and she finds the data on Madam Webb, including her name. So he now knows her name, and of course he makes the link between her name and uh, Mother Webb from the, the prologue scene. Which information, from what I recall, does absolutely nothing because he's now going to be out of it until mm-hmm. pretty much the end of the film, right? Or like toward the end of the film. So she takes them all off to some Travelodge premiere in type motel and then leaves them there again. <laughs> she knows they're being chased by a spider demon, but yet again, she fucks off in the middle of the <laughs> night. Um, having had that, that one conversation when they all reveal that their parents are absent for reasons like being deported by ice because we are well rounded, fleshed out characters. She fucks off. I'm trying to remember what she fucks off to go and research. Um, when she goes to Peru? No, because she she ditches them with Uncle Ben before oh, she goes yeah, to Peru. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Which, oh, again, so- is like, talk about an absolute bitch of a character. You're being chased by a spider demon with, like, high-tech stuff who wants to kill everyone, and you leave him with like, your best friend and his pregnant sister? Yeah, sister. And he has uh, nothing to say about it. He's just like, well, I he hope you okay. He just goes with it, yeah. He, he is a uh, complete wimp. Like, it's she- it's a shame. So she fucks off to Peru because after reading the journal, she's like, oh, maybe these spider people that my mom mentioned in her journal, who up until this point I thought was a mad woman, maybe they'll have answers. And that's the explanation. And she says explicitly to you that I need to go to Peru for a week. So she's gone for a week. But it doesn't pan out that way in the film. In the film, it's like two hours. Yeah. Doesn't yeah. she come back the day after? It's, it's supposed to be a week, but it feels like she just goes like for the afternoon and she's back. It's and that guy's been waiting thirty years for her by that tree. Like it's right, just, and then the whole scene on is top stupid. on top of that, the super secret tech that bad guy has doesn't pick up that this woman now entered an international airport 
and went on an international flight. <laughs> and right. the cab that she drove through the diner in a separate state, she's still driving. This still hasn't been reported. And she manages to then park that at the parking lot. And this is post 9-11, remember? <laughs> so <laughs> that, that, that fucked up cab was just sitting in this airport until she came back and nobody batted an eye at it. <laughs> that's, I didn't, that's, that's so fucked up, man. They just skip over these things so, so quickly. It's just, but then she drives the cab back as well to when she, so she goes to what Peru spider person is still waiting. Cause remember he, he made a promise to be there when he needed her, when she needed her. And he like sucker punches her soul into the pool that her mother died in. <laughs> Pretty <And> much. <laughs> this is supposed to be uh, how she learns that all the people that have encountered these magical spiders, they're all connected like past, present and future. And she finally understands that this is why her mother went to Peru to save her and all this stuff. And then it's no longer fuck you for dying in childbirth, mom. But, oh, you were trying to save me. So I have no right to be a suicidal bitch anymore. Kind of yeah. deal. It's um, so. And lame. she makes up with her mom in this flashback, too. So apparently she can, like, connect with spirits as well. With I don't power. know what the fuck's going on. I don't think I don't think they know. Yeah. Nobody knows. Yeah, they, yeah. When she gets her soul sucker punch, it's basically yeah. like Doctor Strange. Remember when they that happens in the Doctor Strange trailer? Yeah. It's oh, just like yeah. that. Yeah. They stole it straight out of Doctor Strange for sure. And I yeah. that that's exactly what it reminded me of. But well, the, like, it's the dialogue, the dynamic, the like what are the rules here? What the fuck is going on? And just like <sighs> What's she's even better is that so she's on like a ledge looking over that pool when he punches her soul. And then when she wakes up, now her fingers are in the water and she's down by the pool. So her body was just kind of moving without a soul while she was having this entire exposition, uh, like expedition, which was kind mm -hmm. of weird on top yeah. of that. And then we have like the best line of the movie come oh, out wow. of spider Jesus after that, which wow. is like, if, if you accept the responsibility, the power will come, which, yeah, you know what? It's, yeah. it's, hold on. It's surprisingly based because it's telling a woman to like take accountability for her actions and take responsibility. Sure. It's, but it just know. sounds like something Yoda would say. When you take on responsibility, great power will come. It's, like not it's, even that, it's not telling women to take responsibility. It's trying to bribe women into taking responsibility by promising them superpowers exactly. as a result. Well, that's You're, not the whole point of Spider Man is that like he didn't ask for these powers. He was seeking him out. But what do right. you do when great power comes to you? With great power comes great responsibility. It's a very, very, very simple premise and a very powerful point that affected yeah, millions. The fact that they did this, it's yeah. like means that they don't even understand the line. They don't even understand right. the purpose of it of of, of heroism. It's mm -hmm. it's it's insane. Nobody, anyone who seeks out power is is genuinely not, someone who's not suited for it. It's a very simple concept, and they just don't even understand it. This is this is a colossal fuck up for anyone who cares about the superheroes. Oh, movie. you know what? I just realized and we also line, did we skip over the the flashback scene she has where she meets bad guy in the diner. Oh yeah. Oh, I forgot Cause, about that. Because remember, she takes the girls to a motel after the diner scene, right before Uncle Ben comes to pick them up. And they're all sleeping and like she I guess this is where like another bit of her, her powers are just kind of uh, revealed randomly but she can now like connect with the bad guy like telepathically I guess and in this like telepathic vision the bad guy just reveals everything to her which was like and that's the reason there we go that she goes to Peru in the next scene I just, I just, I don't know. It, the exposition, I, everything that comes out of it. I don't. Yeah, it's insane. It's, like, it's just like speechless. Like, like yeah, you have no character. word for it. It's that Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like it's some, some random shit as well. So like, before we get to any, any of the, the Peru stuff, like she, she goes back to the diner and she has this telepathic communion with evil in the, the wreckage of the diner uh, about gen like generic stuff. It's the first time I think he deploys the line about her mother. Like she tries to beat him with her mind, which is just what your mother would do. And it's like none of that's in the film. Wherever the fuck is this yeah. come? When when did her mother try and beat you with her mind? Like, no. Anyway, th then also from this scene, she takes away that you can beat the super evil spider venom by performing CPR, which makes I don't even know because like why would you? Surely making the blood pump round faster is actually going to make the venom worse but no but you know that's only been done because they'll set up this stupid yep. fucking family resolution thing later when the yep. cpr is incredibly important 
Um, <laughs> so she goes to effectively abandon the girls, goes to the diner, learns that CPR is super effective against spider venom, goes back, teaches them about CPR being really important. They have a hug. Then she ditches them with Uncle Ben, fucks off to Peru, and has yeah, mind <laughs> melds with her dead mother or something. Uncle Ben's just like, okay, I want to ask questions. <laughs> right. Like, why were these girls? Why are you running away from something? Like, isn't that just something you would try to ask questions about? When someone you... says, here, take these three teenage girls, I'll be back. Peace. You'd usually that are all over have the news, questions. by the way. Yeah. All by the way, they're news. wanted. <laughs> for me. It's just every piece of it just screams Ugh. what the fuck is going on and, and then you say anything and he didn't even he's he was he didn't seem worried about her go it's like if my friend was going to peru to, to do something that i it sounds shady i would be like no you're not going to peru i'll go with you like i you know what I, mean? I, I wouldn't even go with them but, but like i would never let them just go to peru <laughs> like what is going on he just you know like what is what did she say yeah. exactly she said i'm going to peru to finish what I started or like some generic line, but like it just um it doesn't make any sense why he would just not say anything. I don't know. He doesn't try to be a friend, but to be fair, I understand because when he's just like, I think I met the woman of my life um in the opening, she's also just like, Oh well, I hate babies though. So <laughs> yeah. like understandably, he's just gonna let her disappear in a foreign country, uh in the yeah. jungle no less. Mm. I get Speaking it, of, I get um, it. of hating babies, I think we're now pretty much at that scene. So to set up the big final encounter, um, uh, name redacted baby's mother, uh, her waters break. Or they, I think her line is something like, either I just peed or my waters broke, which is yeah. okay, fine. I, I've never been pregnant, but I don't think those are the same thing. But, you know, it's <laughs> funny, so we'll, 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 we'll do that. Um, and then, so that means that Uncle Ben has to take her to hospital because he calls an ambulance, which doesn't show up. Good job he's not like, you know, a fully trained paramedic and capable of delivering babies at home. Fuck that. No. Calls an ambulance and doesn't up. So he has to drive her to hospital. He takes the three random girls with him because if he didn't do that, they would be safe and then <laughs> the film wouldn't work. So he takes them. Then they get picked up on face scanners because one of them just gormlessly stares out of the window, which of course triggers the NSA program. Then uh, evil sidekick henchman woman, she triggers all the lights to go green so the car gets stuck. Madam Webb steals the ambulance that I think was meant to go and pick up baby whose before, name cannot be spoken. Before you get there, though, so because when Mary's water breaks, right? So as I, again, there's a whole like bit in the car where you know stem checkmark woman is just like, oh, her, I've calculated her contractions to be this far apart, and even <laughs> though she's going into labor, he shoves her in the back of the car where you have to pull out the seats and everything instead of, you know, putting her in the front seat. So when they get to the hospital, she can easily, cause there's something coming out of her vagina, you know, <laughs> they still take yeah. the <laughs> like, something, they, they something, who knows what it is. To, um, the shit on Ben <laughs> because he's like, Hey, put your seatbelts on. They're like, what seatbelts? Really? Like, yeah. What the fuck? Like what? There's no reason not to, you know, it's such a strange scene to add I'm, that in. Uh, guys, I might have to bounce. I got that guy's number. <laughs> Bring him on, Just, man. Tell yeah, him yeah on, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't, no, think don't bounce him into like, anything. Go and give well, him a no. call. And if he's if he's not drunk and insane, then you can invite right. him on. Right. And I can do it in a way that's like easy and not like through text and whatever like threatening text that he's interpreting yeah. or incorrectly. <laughs> yeah. But um, but yeah, if he I mean, maybe I'll hop back on if he wants to. But uh, uh yeah, yeah. Uh, but I have a DM stream at us. nine that I've committed to, so I gotta go early now and then maybe i'll chat with him before that other stream but oh, i'll try okay. to get him to come i'll try him to get get him to talk to fans because i feel like that more industry people talking to fans is better so yeah we'll that's see. true yeah. yeah if they're reasonable yeah, yeah. yeah. i'll see you at <laughs> nine o'clock lofty if we don't see you again right. yeah he's on mmm tonight so that's true yeah. might be a little late it depends i, I will uh, I'll, I'll you're good you're good dude. Don't, worry, don't worry about it it's, it's all good Anyway, bye chat. <laughs> See you, Nick. <laughs> Nicky, Nicky. Nicky. See everybody. Bye, Lafi. So yeah, I guess picking up from roughly where we were, um, we've got this this two pronged chase, I suppose you'd call it. So the, the traffic lights all get turned green, which means that Uncle Ben drives into a dead end. And again, this I don't understand why this is the thing that he thought was a good plan. So Spider Demon guy decides to dress up as, as gay spider demon and just go and try and kill them in broad daylight again 
But just before he gets there, he jumps down and then Madame Webb ramps an ambulance and takes him out with an ambulance in midair. So that's <laughs> oh, the, the second he, time he gets hit by a just car. Fuck before he gets hit by the ambulance too, he act like legitimately pulls a grenade out of his ass. And he has <laughs> like he has no belt, he has no bag, no pocket. He pulls a grenade out of his ass and is just holding it. And he's turned into a suicidal maniac, or not suicidal, but like a, a deranged maniac now. Because instead of just focusing on killing the three girls, he's just ready to throw a grenade into a live traffic jam where, where that would kill like a dozen people. So now he really is just evil for the sake of being evil. Yeah. And then, um, I, yeah, um, our main cast sort of escape because of the, the ambulance taking him out. And they go to, shocking absolutely nobody at all, the abandoned fireworks factory from earlier, which oh. is where we're going to have our big dramatic set piece. And what do you do if you want to go into a fireworks factory and emerge not dead? Um, do you, A, not even bother going into the fireworks factory? Because what the fuck is this plan? Do you, B, just try and sneak your way through it and lose him? Or do you, C, set light to all of the fireworks mm -hmm. and just rely on Madam Webb having foresight so she can predict where all the fireworks will go? Uh, Which is a skill that she still, she still hasn't even mastered her premonitions at this point, too. Nothing. She's done no work to do that. And the fireplace, too, is still structurally unsound, as we were told earlier when they, when they responded to the fire there. So <laughs> Yeah. And it's, it's, it's just <laughs> one of those it's one of those frustrating like scenes and i just want to mention right before before we move past it he didn't not only not only did he pull a grenade out of his ass he jumped up to get hit in the face by the ambulance had he just stood still he would have been fine yeah he makes no fucking <laughs> sense about at all. That. Yeah. it's so fucking so silly <laughs> I don't, yeah if you look at the scene he literally the ambulance is like this and he leaps up to get hit in the face by it. he literally would be fine awesome. if he just stood there it's so crazy, but it's yeah. for me one of the best things about whether it's fantasy, sci fi, anything, superheroes, just the rules, establish the rules. It was always fun in Spider Man when he would run out of the web slingers and we'd have to see him figure out a way. And, and like mm -hmm. he didn't just summon wings and just fly his way out because they couldn't, th the writers couldn't think of something. Establish the rules and like stick to them, and it's so much more satisfying. And this movie, they could have done something with her premonition power, showing her trying to test it and like actually practice with it. They couldn't be bothered. Like, it's just, it's so lazy, man. And it gets even lazier in the final scene of the film, too, because, you know, again, Spider-Jesus told her that she had all these powers that she could harness, right? And that's also, by the way, that um, that entire, like, ambulance driving scene, um, it, it made no sense to me how she was on a road, then on another road, and then somehow she's driving through a billboard attached to a building. Wait a minute. Uh, into this open square. I was really confused by that. And I watched it over and I was still confused. I, I forgot something too with this. Um, didn't she show up in a taxi? Why didn't she just get back in the taxi and drive off? Why do they have to steal the ambulance? Like she's that's, a paramedic. Like she should know how much she's fucking them over by doing that. Like they can't that's save anything. I'm no, it's just, wondering too. It's yeah. all like this. Every that's piece what she's it. used to driving, dude. What do you <laughs> just, mean? just uh, how many vehicles has she stolen? <laughs> it's crazy. Oh. Uh, I'm just actually watching the fireworks, yes. scene, which, is just, <laughs> oh, yeah. which is just so bad. Like at one point, wait, you wait. can tell which bits are CGI and which bits are really terrible wire work. But there's one point when the CGI version, because like everything's exploding, everything's going to shit. They're all running away, and he's jumping up after them. Um, and there's at one point he he sort of start he jumps up at them and then like he's in a almost like a freeze frame because they haven't really animated him, um, and then something nothing hits him but then apparently some invisible thing does because he just goes flying off sideways for no apparent reason and that allows him to escape. Their plan is because Madame Web can see all of the future and this is her big hero moment like she picks up a fucking shield and starts batting fireworks away. Their yeah. plan is to go all the way to the top where she predicts that a helicopter will be waiting to rescue them, which, of course, it will, because she predicted it, but which shouldn't be, because he has control of the fucking NSA. So he can just... Like, why Why do you not just redirect that anyway? Yeah. They get up to the roof, um, which is technically the big final encounter, isn't it? And the only thing that goes slightly wrong, because she's managed to predict down to the individual paths of individual fireworks until this point, she's predicted everything perfectly. 
But a firework flies at him and he punches the firework into the helicopter, which <laughs> takes it out. And then things go badly wrong and people almost fall to their deaths. But it's fine because then he gets killed by Pepsi and we win. Oh, my God. Yeah, the way he was standing there too, like the debris was falling, but the way that the movie was uh, shot, like it doesn't seem like that's going to be a concern for whatever's about to happen. Like that does not seem like that's going to be his demise because it just seems kind of absentmindedly falling. And then, boom, he's just kind of cleaned out by it. It's so even crazier than that because none of the debris is hitting her. It's just strategically landing on him. Right, it lands he's right on just him. just avoiding her. It's so so stupid. And I'm, I was thinking about Edge of Tomorrow. Have you guys seen that movie? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. in that movie, like, if anyone hasn't seen it, he's repeating the same day over and over and over and over again. So after a while, we get the sense, just like a game, he's mastered it. He knows all the steps. He knows where to block, where to dodge. And that makes sense because we've seen him go through it. We didn't see that with her. Like, to to, to get to the, her to the point where you can't show me her being completely brain dead on the train, not even figuring out, taking out or figuring out how this power works, and then skip to her being a master where she could predict fireworks and explosions. They just, they don't even care. It's crazy. Yeah. I, I think also we missed, possibly missed anyway, the the other important thing that she took away from her trip to Peru, which is that now she's mastered her powers. It's not just that she can predict the future perfectly. It's that she can split herself into three versions of herself at the same time. <laughs> oh, right. And this is, yeah. this is how she saves the girls from falling <laughs> while also beating uh, evil. Because like she goes around, I don't even know how this works. Like, how the fuck does foresight confer the ability to duplicate yourself? It's so multiple versions of her go around. The payoff for this, and I use the word payoff advisedly, is that she gets to confront him, and he says, "Oh, you're trying to beat me with your mind, just like your mother." Like, f fucking no, but okay. Um, and then she says, "No, you were wrong because all those visions you were having, it wasn't them; it was me. Like three versions of me killed you. It wasn't the girls, even though he clearly saw it was the girls." Um, and as a result of that, she's like she can beat him because she can split herself into multiple people. So I, I'm <laughs> sitting there thinking, like, hang on a minute, like, you can predict the future and you know you can change the future. And that's sort of the point of, of your power lesson and your moral lesson is that you have immense amounts of ability to change bad things and stop them from happening. You further know that this guy is operating under a delusion and his entire life has been corrupted by this weird vision that turns out not to be true. You know all of this and you have the power to stop it. So really, shouldn't you at least try to convince him not to be a dick before you just go and let him get killed by product placement? Isn't that like a hero thing to do is to try and convince the villain they're wrong? That's what a character would do. That's what someone yeah, who would point. actually explain like um even just Cassie like Lang before. did that. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, she was, <laughs> don't be it a was dick. terrible. Don't be a dick. It she was doesn't even say You're that. so right. You're so right. It, Cassie's seen an Ant Man is an abomination, but at least she fucking tried. They put they did something <laughs> <laughs> with this. They didn't give a fuck, and it's just it's crazy. Someone it, had we actually got the character who tested other powers, and we got to see like her really practicing and trying to understand the rules. She, that person would have the, the the you know this that would be a thought process for her. Like, how can I actually talk this guy down with the information I have? But she's not a character. This is this is this movie is <laughs> fucking incredible. <laughs> oh, have we have we done the whole film? Did and, I miss and, the whole wrap up? And I and I, I just, no, the, okay. the um the payoff for Hungry Girl being the skateboarder was her taking a little piece of metal and like grinding across the floor. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's, like, it's so <laughs> stupid. It's so stupid. It looks so slow. It looks so ridiculous. So and then she gets yoinked across, and instead of dying, she just spider girls on, and like it's it's all so stupid. I, I it's like oh, a lofty's dream. back. Fever dream tier. Hey, that was quick. Come on, you guys want him to come on? Yeah. Oh yeah. Sure. I guess we're gonna be here now. But if he wants to talk uh, before he comes on, should we like have an idea of what the hell? Who is he again? You're so out of breath, Luke, dude. He created Luke Cage. Yeah, I was just outside. He created uh. Luke Cage. <laughs> it's cold, man. He he created Luke Cage and um and there's other stuff you can look up at IMDb. But I'll I'll share that. Twitter. Is he defending Madam Webb or was he involved? No, with like the the topic was uh the the argument was that hollywood writers madam web writers this this one guy matt who matt, i can't remember his last name but he wrote all those bad movies that it's somehow i can send you the tweet it's a, here i still have it uh actually that, just that pull that thread up maybe i don't know but gotcha. like it's it's just I'm trying to wrap, wrap my head around this um he wants to talk about uh, 
uh, uh, defend, he's just defending like the, the creative people and like sort of presenting the argument that the studios can fuck with your stuff. I don't even know. Who knows what he'll say? That's something we all already know. So I hope he has arguments as to like specifically how. Well, yeah, because, because he was like arguing with everybody about like, I don't understand it. Well, I'll send him the link. You want me to send him the link? I can't send him the link. Oh, I can send you the link to send to him. Sure. Uh, Hang on. Deem it to you. Um, yeah, I, just, I just think it's important to establish, to clarify to him that we know that premise exists, but you're going to have to give us references and prove how you know it applies to this movie. Yeah. Just, just yeah, I mean, no one, no one, please copy paste the link that you can clearly see on the screen at the moment and jump in. Oh yeah, what are you doing? Oh god, <laughs> your DMs. Uh, what are you doing, Val? Don't copy that and come in here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me copy this link address and let me set it set it to the guy uh, what should I tell him while I do this uh, I told him he can go on his phone uh, so yeah it, uh, I don't care do I? Uh, let's, let I'm just know we're a very diverse uh, panel there you go and then, I, and then I told him that like you know this is like a nerd culture community He's kind of giving the vibes Okay, yeah, just talking about movies. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. While well, we wait to see if he wants to come on, I mean, we're we're basically wrapping the film up at this point. So, like, should yeah, we just I, carry on uh, until he may or may not show up? The um, vision at the end. <laughs> um, wait, no. First off, how the fuck did she get crippled? <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Did, did we miss the entire like uh, the? The setup and payoff of how they uh, all came together to make sure she lived, because she had trained them on how to do CPR. The CPR. And that's how they were set yeah, so S- Sydney oh Sweeney jumps into the. So yeah, when guy gets crushed by Pepsi sign, even though he has super strength, so he can't lift it or anything, uh, can't Indeed. move out of the way. So Cassie falls into the water. She takes a nut shot to one eye. Uh, but somehow that damages both of her eyes. Right? <laughs> and then when she, <laughs> when she falls into the water, um, there's no debris that hits her body or anything. Um, but somehow she comes out of the water both crippled and her eyes are all like they're completely whited out now from the nut shot. Um, so then this is where the CPR training comes in that she gave the mm-hmm. girls um, in the motel room for the venue. Which venom. was a really cringy scene, by the way. Yep. It well, was it just didn't... like how do you know that that's how you treat this specific venom there are many types of venom that that's also act- not even how you give fucking cpr yeah, that too everything right it. it's just um, that's why i was also wondering if part of this was filmed like during uh the virus uh in new york because maybe there were like restrictions oh. on what they could do on set so like doing the mouth that apply to any other scene think about that is there that might yeah. be true i can't think of another scene is there a kiss is there a no, nothing, mm, nothing, maybe. no mouth to mouth whatsoever. So I was wondering mm. if maybe that was a reason to explain that away because chicks looking like they're kissing would have been a selling point, right? Um, <laughs> but they give her CPR and then she wakes up and yeah, she's all like blind. And then it cuts to her in the hospital and she's got like the the bandages on her eye and she's in a bed and all the girls are there and a nurse comes in, is like immediate family only and they're and she's like they're family. And now this this whole weird, awkward, like cunty demeanor that she had the entire film is gone, and it's she's gone. just she's just chill now. Like she she's loving Madam Web now. Like this is not yeah. a character. This is they think this is a meaningful arc. Like you just skip to this. Like she it's fell in the water. Complete it's one eighty. Complete one eighty. It's stupid. And um, I I, I want to throw in just really really quick with the villain. Yeah, yeah. It just gets me to mention it. He got t- hit by a taxi. He got hit in the face with an ambulance, but then he dies to like a Pepsi, like sign. Pepsi it's sign, just, it's yeah. so yeah. stupid, man. I just need to make sure that's pointed out. Yeah. But, yeah. And then yeah. Uh, it cuts to them back at her apartment, which uh, somebody, I don't know if you guys saw it, but someone on Twitter actually did a scene comparison because there's a moment where the camera like zooms up the front of the apartment building before focusing on the window, right? That shot is actually taken from the first Spider-Man film that shot up the building. I t- yeah, I did see that. Really? It's one for one the yeah. same shot, uh, which I thought was pretty funny. And then she's sitting there in a uh, Professor X chair with Cyclops glasses on. And again, she's all chill. And I guess she's she started like a, a sex trafficking ring or something because these girls all live with her, right? They're bringing her Chinese food Probably. and whatnot. 
And she's like, I have everything I need here. And then this is where the scenes of them in the outfits come back into play because she has a, it's like she has a monologue going on in the background, how she's ready for the future. They're all in their suits and she's got. Oh, that's so bad. And essentially, I guess what it's meant to allude to is that the girls don't get powers. She just starts using them as flesh puppets to fight evil at some (laughs) point in the future. How? Well, I don't. What? They're going to be the, the, the family resolution point, like, which I think it's been not particularly competently, but at least trying to aim for, is that they, they are all broken strays and they've come together and they, they have united behind this. The thing that made me slightly laugh about that final scene, I think is one of her final lines, is whatever the future holds. And I'm thinking, well, the whole point of the previous almost two hours is that you can see what the future yeah. holds and that you shouldn't really be... um lying, I know. This shouldn't be speculating on that she yeah. know what it holds i was laughing because she looks like bret hart like look at those stupid like glasses like why would she those big ass- turn into bran stark and it's it's never particularly good look when people sort of lose all personality and start speaking mystically but um yeah. I, I think I mean, that basically does wrap up the film but we are joined now um i think uh i shall add you to the stage now sir oh no someone will uh, <laughs> i'll do hey, it sorry hey, about that uh, how Hello. you guys doing you know Hi. very it's, well thank you it's kind of funny because someone said oh you're a cow get on the stream i'm like come on <laughs> like, I, I'm, I come from hip-hop you know what i'm saying it's like you call me a boomer whatever i come from the 90s where yes if you, you google me in wu-tang i mean yeah it was a different era you know what i'm saying there is a there is a so, so <laughs> someone coming at you on twitter as opposed to actually being in your face yeah, like I'm not afraid to be on, but well, yeah. I mean, if so, I mean, and, and, and again, you know, Lofty and I talked, and you know, we kind of we bro hugged and, and, and made up. I mean, it wasn't yeah. like I was angry anyway, so I apologize for any kind of snarkiness because hey, I apologize for the people that were uh, you know calling you a coward under my under my tweets. It's like I don't. It just <laughs> makes me look bad. It doesn't. It doesn't add anything to the conversation. Well, you know, it's, it's just funny, it's man. Just, because you know what happens is that like, and this was my beef in, in the first place is because. Before, way before I was, you know, lucky enough to write movies and get something made, I used to be a journalist. So I used to write for Vibe, Source, Double XL, and then I was actually on staff of Los Angeles Times. And this is back in the day, like when you wrote about a record, you know, like your byline appears. This is this is even to a certain extent at the beginning of the internet. But you would run into people. Like I, I would write a, a review and then run into somebody two weeks later. You know, so. It's it's different. I'm used to okay. You say something about me, I say something about you, and then we know each other. As opposed to you know now, because of the way that the net works, is that everybody is hiding behind some kind of avatar or something else. So this is not my first rodeo when it comes to that, because you know I'm the guy that gets shit for killing Cottonmouth like at least <laughs> two, three, four times a week, and without them understanding the business, without them understanding that. You know, when we were making the show, people were like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, you kill Mahershala Ali. Like, that was a dumb decision. What people don't understand is that Mahershala wasn't Mahershala in the same way at the time. And it wasn't a question of killing his character off because right before we before I even cast him, Cottonmouth, and I'm spoiling the show for anyone who hasn't seen it, but Cottonmouth's character was always going to die. And the reason yeah. for that was for me, I put myself in you know, this is me geeking out. I remember how I felt when I read issue 12 of of Alpha Flight when Guardian died. And I was just like, what the fuck? And so my thing was like, okay, what's kind of equivalent where I could do that kind of rug pull? What's my equivalent in a show where I can basically make you fall in love with somebody who you think is going to be there for the long haul? And then, you know, they go. And that was the whole reason that when that, because Mahershala's part was the last part that we cast, you know, one of his appeals for wanting to go on the show was the fact that it was only going to be for six episodes and that I promised man to man not to hold him to the show no matter what, because he knew that after having been on um, House of Cards, where his character was used and then not used, he didn't want to be tied to a television contract. And his whole thing was that he really wanted to make the break into feature films, which he was doing because he basically was, the reason he has the same haircut on Luke Cage, um, Hidden Figures and Moonlight is because he was making all three simultaneously. And so that was the whole thing was that he would, it was, this is a whole nother story, but like he was doing this little independent movie that he basically every Friday he would take time off to fly to Florida to do, and that was Moonlight. 
So when we got to the point right before, because, you know, he was just killing it on the show. We got to the point right before and everybody's like, are you sure you want to do this? And I was like, I made him a promise. I promised him I'm not going to hold him to the show, you know? And so here's the thing. If you even look at the show, it's like, yeah. you know, you don't really care about Cottonmouth until you understand his full backstory in episode seven, the same issue. I mean, same episode in which we kill him. And mm -hmm. really our, our other influence on that, of course, was what happened in Daredevil. Because when you got a little more insight into Fisk as a little boy, it made you feel differently about his character. And that was one that was always one of the things that Jeff Loeb always talked about in terms of, you know, when you're building the character is that you don't want your villains. The villain should be the hero of his own story. If you told your story from the villain's perspective, that's really kind of the key to making compelling villains is that from their perspective, yeah. they're in the right. And so that was the thing was that once you got to know a little more about the character, even though people give me shit about it, like I, I kind of see it as a triumph that people care that much. Uh, you know, right. and then people saw the whole show dropped off and this and that. I mean, you know, it was hard because we didn't when you do a show on Netflix and you're shooting all episodes and it isn't like you get the kind of feedback that you would get with a network show. Um, and I feel I feel bad for Eric Ray Harvey, because as Jeff Loeb said, Herschel couldn't follow Herschel. And in the way that people fell so much in love with that character that by the way we introduced Diamondback, we, we didn't really figure out the tone of Diamondback for at least two, two more episodes. And then by the time we did, it was already kind of late because people kind of made their opinion of him based on, you know, episode nine. No, sorry, sorry, episode eight and, and episode nine, you know. So it's always hard to adjust. I guess what I'm saying is my biggest point is that in television, I always take the blame for Luke Cage because I was in control of it. In feature films, you have no control as a writer unless you're directing. Even then, you know, there are all types of things that happen. I mean, and and that's why, you know, people that are probably I haven't seen Madam Web yet, but, you know, so I don't want to speak well, you to you like, like too specifically about it. Um, but, but here's the thing about it. OK, what I can tell you without having seen it, because I, I thought the trailers, you know, I can say the trailers look whack. I mean, fuck it. But, yeah, but, but but here's the thing, like S.J. Clarkson is a really good director. I mean, for people that love Jessica Jones and have seen other things that she's done, they know that. But what happens if, if you knew just the level of decisions that get made and all the different things that can go wrong and you not knowing where your tone is, and all the all the different things that, that someone that doesn't have anything to do with, even on a directing level. Well, it's, she, it's hard to make a bad movie. You have you have 50 people working hard to make a piece of shit. And so that's the and that's the craziest thing about it is you don't know whether you have something that works or a piece of shit until it comes out. And when it tanks, all the blame goes on two people as opposed to it being spread out or I, somebody or somebody's insecurity that I, led to one thing that led to the yeah. bad, bad decisions. Well, in, in the Can case of Madam Web. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Platoon. That's all I'm saying. You know, it's like I had one view. Well, let let me just say. I have another view now being inside the process, I guess, is the biggest that, thing I'm saying. That makes sense. And also, as you're right. I mean, I don't know if you're right. I don't know if she's a good director, but she did make an excellent episode of Succession, which is a fantastic TV show. So it's like, yeah, I'm not going to say that. I, I understand what you're saying. That it's, it's like it's not that this person made a bad movie, therefore she's a terrible or here's a terrible director. Like I, I, I think I think we're I think we get I think we understand that. P Platoon, did you have something to add to that? Well, I was going to say so. Going back to yeah. I, I guess the first point and the first principle, and you're talking about decisions that you're making for characters that you've created, mm -hmm. yeah. and you're you're absolutely right that it's sometimes very hard to know how something will be received when you're putting it just on paper. And a huge process then follows in turning that into the finished product that people get to see. And it's always going to be slightly risky when you put it out in front of people because they might absolutely hate the decision that you've made. Well, it's a, but, great, it's a perfect example, okay? All right, the infamous dab on Luke Cage season two, right? That was not in my script. I was on set while they were filming episode two, the, um, the, um, the Bright Lights Big City um performance um that um i can't i don't know why i see i guess i'm i am boom we're having a senior moment <laughs> but, but um you know that um that when that song was being performed um i was there for that performance because you know what you do sometimes 
is you have two units shooting um, back to back. And mm -hmm. so directors will switch. And so I basically said, OK, we already done the explosion. We already have the stunt. So I'm actually going to go to our set, our Harlem's Paradise set to, you know, to be more involved with the music element of, of, of you know, of, of the Gary Clark Jr. performance than um, right now because it's already scripted it's already laid out and so as a result i wasn't there and mike ad-libbed the dab and when he ad-libbed it he did it in such a way that it was hard to cut away from so months later we're in post and i'm like uh, you know do i keep this in do i keep this out you know like i was just a decision just okay i, I like this medium shot so i'm not going to cut it i could cut away from it now you know having more experience in post there are different ways i could have cut around it but I just decided at the moment I didn't think it was that big a deal. That's fine. But then, then that's so that's probably quite a useful example, though I think for the difference that it holds. So, like we've been obviously going for a good couple of hours, and we've had a huge amount of fun at the expense of the people who wrote this production. And what we're talking about when we're talking you know, about writing in a film like Madden Web, but it doesn't just have to be Madden Web. Any recent Marvel film will pretty much qualify. Uh, Rebel, what we're Moon, about Rebel, isn't, Moon. Well, Rebel Moon is another really good example of that. <laughs> what we're talking about yeah. isn't, say, like the example that you give yeah. of an actor ad libs something or, or like performs a, a particular motion which isn't in your script, which you can't really cut away from. That's a misstep, I suppose, which is understandable. If you, you don't want to sacrifice the entirety of a good scene just to get rid of something that in, in hindsight you might not like too much. What we're talking about, though, isn't really like little missteps like that. What we're talking about is the absolute foundational fundamentals of writing anything, whether it's a script for a film or a script for a book, uh, a screenplay or a novel. It's We're talking about absolute nonsensical characters who do things which make absolutely no sense and individual lines of dialogue or preference for exposition styles, right. which simply are not art at all. Madame Webb has a really good example, lots of very good examples of the villain simply saying things which are comical because of how badly written the line is. Yeah. And I'd say that that's probably different to the, the example that you give. Um, what, so our, our perspective from criticizing wait, wait, writers is wait, that... Wait, wait, to, to that point, right? It's yeah. like, you don't necessarily... Five different things could have happened. There could have been... It, and I, I would really have to see the movie in order to really sure, have yeah. but then how do you pinpoint that those things were studio interference that's the point that he's making now like because you, nothing comes out with the studio signing off on it period so well, but that's not interference so, that's so, just so, so, what I'm saying, so, so what i'm saying is that you know for a script to even get to the point where it's greenlit where the studio decides we're going to put 150 million dollars in, into making this thing you know not just the production but also marketing and everything else Mm -hmm. That goes from top to bottom through about five to ten different people. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, you have, you know, who knows who was bought on in terms of different writers doing different things. You don't know how many different writers were actually on, you know, unless you see the actual WGA arbitration um, on the credits. You don't know how many different writers were, were part of it. You don't know if, if somebody, you know, got paid a weekly to kind of come in and do some things because there was a studio executive who's already supervising five or six different movies and said, I don't understand this. I need to under I need a line of dialogue for somebody to point out A, B, C, D, E, whether it's right or wrong. And then that gets written. And then the director's like, fuck it. I got to I got to shoot this thing five different ways or I'm trying in my cut to make sure that this doesn't make it in. But then said executive still keeps saying we need this moment. And then you put the moment in there. And so, like, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, success has um, many fathers or, you know, but failure is an orphan. Like to this day, as many writers on Armageddon, you still can't find me the writer that will claim credit for the animal cracker scene. You, 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 know, you know what I'm saying? It's like you just well, what you're saying, what you're saying is there's many factors at play and we shouldn't. I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you're not saying all the time, but, but generally speaking, we shouldn't be blaming uh, writers for bad writing sometimes. Or well, are you can saying, we, though? That's what because sometimes well, well, when can we hold writers some, accountable? Some, right. That's, 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 yeah. Some some yeah. movies are just poorly written. Right. Like, correct. Any that's, but that's what we're talking about, though. We're just trying yeah. to separate those things. Like, yeah. I feel like if you're going to bring up studio interference. I, we need specific examples rather than just saying because of all the yeah. variables, we can never hold the writing. Accountable. To give an example, I know, I know I don't want to use Madden Webber's specific examples because obviously you haven't seen the film, but there's a couple of very, I think, useful and understandable examples. The, the close of the film, the villain is killed by a giant Pepsi sign, right? Which is product placement. 
I can absolutely believe that that is studio interference in the film yeah. because Sony wants a Pepsi advert in the film. That seems fairly yes. safe to put down to the studio. And it's a crap scene. And I'm not necessarily going to blame the writer for having product placement in the scene. I might blame them for choosing to have product placement kill the character. Well, okay, not the other we, thing. We, but the other thing, but well, just to finish that though, point, well, it's not though. that that I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is not, say, Sony saying put product placement in your scene. What I'm talking about is having a villain say a line like, um, I hope the spiders were worth it, Mum, because yeah. someone down the line decided that a, a character's motive is that she's bitter that her mother went to the jungle to find spiders to cure a disease that she didn't have, which then was stolen by a man who's basically Satan, who only wants it because his family was starved to death, but we never hear about that. Like, this, <laughs> yeah. is, this is a huge collection of things, which I think you have to blame on the writers. Because even okay. accepting the, the premise that you're you're putting forward, and I do, that there are many factors involved in the failure of a project, if you have multiple writers on a team and they don't even read each other's scripts, or they don't actually make characters speak in line with established character from earlier versions of the scripts, that's the writer's fault, not the studio's. The studio no, hired them, but they I still mean, have a job but, to but, do. But here's the thing. You think that it's like television where everyone's in the same room making the same decision. They're sitting there, you know, you don't know what writer was on set and which decision was made when. And also, you don't know when something was filmed. With these kinds of movies, it's not like an, like an independent movie. We're not talking like Coen Brothers. You know, like we're talking about something different. We're talking about a whole different beast. And well, as a result, I mean, we can only go based on the script. To right? be fair, we don't know if, any of if, those things. If you're talking about rewrites or and, and re, you know credit credits confusing confusing credits or whatever, maybe the studio hired someone to rewrite the script or half of it. We're talking about that. Well, then in that case, the continuity problems that that we were platoon was just describing and like some of the some of the fine-tuning problems would be a writer's problem it would be yeah. it would be the person who rewrote the script like my, no, it's not let me explain one question one question one question, one question. I, I, one okay question. and i'll definitely answer your question jedi but give me one question. go ahead yeah. what okay mm. it's okay I, what, what's, what's well, a good analogy okay like well if you want well, to, on, on one hand okay say okay. say say the movie's a restaurant right on one hand Something I can tell you from cooking, right, is that yep. you, you can make choice taste like prime when you're making a steak, but Chuck is mm -hmm. Chuck. You know what I'm saying? There, there's, there, there's no amount of seasoning. There's no amount of different ways that you can that you can that you can cook it to make it taste like a restaurant quality steak. So yep. what happens a lot of times is that you don't know is first off, it's like what actually is the content of that's actually the quality of the content that's actually being shot. Who's being bought in to make these changes? And then forget all that. When it actually gets shot, so many decisions are made on a day by who knows. I mean, and I mean, and that and that's the thing that that happens is that like the only reason that writers are fighting over credits for bad movies is because of the way that it works in terms of residuals, in terms of your health care. It's better to have your name on a bad movie and actually still get residuals and still be able to take care of your family on it than it is to, to, to not get credit and be paid on, on, a, on a weekly basis. Unfortunately, the way the system is built, it's built so that people cannibalize and cut each other off or, or hired at whim, you know, to uh, for, for these changes is, to be made. The biggest point that I'm making is that it isn't like a writer says, okay, I'm fighting for this line, I'm fighting for this moment, because there are so many different ways for this kind of movie. I'm talking about special effect laden studio movies like this, without knowing the exact process of what bad decisions were made when it's yeah. it's kind of hard to 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 I say i, would I, agree I feel with like that. I another think way of saying that there's a lot of variables but that's part of the reason i wanted to ask the question of when do you hold the writers accountable at what point yeah, do you hold them it's responsible? interesting because and, based and, on and, what and, you're and, saying writers can never be blamed and, well, and, I mean, and on top, I, I on top of that, no, that's, 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 that's why I'm trying to, that's 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 to simplify yeah. it as a question in terms of when do yeah. you hold them accountable? The responsibility, especially when you're when writers are asking the general public to support them in a strike or something that like, OK, mm -hmm. we have agency, we're, we're, we're valuable to the industry. Why then are, you, are are we not supposed to hold them responsible for apparently anything at all yeah, when it comes to what fans? No, no, that's not what you're saying. Yeah, I don't think it's important to you. I'm just saying we're not attacking you or anything. Uh, what, what I'm describing is a general vibe that that uh, that fans and of of movies and and people that talk about these things a lot are getting sort of pushback from a lot of different people. People like Joe Russo, for example, who not the not the Marvel one, but the other one, 
calling people trolls for criticizing the writing of quality of a movie. And like, he's doing this openly on Twitter and it's like, you know, th this happens all the time. And it's like, well, are we not allowed to hold people responsible at all for their, for their. Yeah. That's what I was asking. Well, uh, yeah. Well, no well, one well, like well, reaches out line. and says like, why are you guys yeah. praising this person? You don't know their actual contributions to this. Exactly. Film. Unless they, the only unless they make something negative. good. And then it, unless they make something good and then it's none like, of those oh, variables matter when people are praising. And the studio had nothing to do with it yeah no, none of the variables that you mentioned matter when people are praising a thing they'll have no issue with it but as soon as we have criticism then suddenly there's all these variables yeah. that we can't even consider so that's why i was asking just to simplify uh, okay, this so, whole thing so, just, just right. one thing kind of finish just uh just to simplify this whole thing is a simple question directly to you when do you hold writers accountable specifically because if, mm -hmm. if we yeah. can understand your perspective it might make it easier yeah all right so so I, i'll i'll answer that question two different ways uh, with the same meaning. Meaning number one, going back to the original tweet that I responded to when I said legend. Basically, what I was doing was, you know, because somebody, you know, when you talk about the criticism against writers, someone basically put up this guy's name and then put up his posters. And because they didn't like the movies that were lined up, they said, you know, I, I, can't, I can't remember the exact kind of, of the tweet, so please don't hold me to it. But they they were basically implying that, you know, how do you live with yourself having these this line of bad movies to your name to which my response was from a from a writing perspective this is somebody that got their name or got credit on six different movies which mm -hmm. is so incredibly hard to do good bad better or worse that what my point was was that this is a person who is in the system that is trying their best to do what they can and unless you actually read the scripts you don't really know how good or bad some of these things are just because of all the horror stories that people like myself and Zach Sense and, and, and a bunch of other people that are that are kind of active on Twitter about this kind of stuff are talking about. In terms of my criteria of when something's badly written, it really depends. Because, for example, if something is done by not, a writer, not, not, not when something's bad, badly by written, a writer director, I mean, I'm trying to answer your question. You no, but you, that's not the, I'm trying to answer your question. I know, but you're, that's a different question. I didn't say when is something badly written. I asked but, when do you hold the account, the writers accountable? I'm trying to answer writing. your question. But those are two hold, different questions, though. No, I'm, that's right. We can, we can cover both. Accountable okay. when yeah, 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 it's yeah. a writer director. And only because they have a little more agency over what's being communicated when and how. And what about, honestly, but, but honestly, I, I'm, I'm still trying to answer this question. No, go ahead. But yeah. Like what happens is that you don't necessarily, when a movie is good, you don't necessarily know it. When a movie is bad, you don't necessarily know it. And I know it's, I know it's hard to understand this from, from the outside perspective. But what I'm saying is that like, there are movies that are like, you know, for example, like you'll hear all this strife and all these bad rumors and all these things about how no one got along and it was this terrible shoot. And then you see the movie and the movie turns out great. And then you get into another movie where everybody had a great time on set and then the movie's garbage. Like, it, right. I, there's so many different things that go right and go wrong. Um, so just to and, clarify. And, and, so, and, and so to clarify, like, it depends on how, on, on how I hold a, a writer responsible. For one, if the if the writer also directed it, then I think it's in some cases it's easier to point the blame. Um, in some cases, if I'm actually able to get a copy of the script, you know, and right. then what I read compared to what was shot. I mean, I guess what I'm saying, I'm not saying writers are above reproach. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that a lot of bad decisions go into something that you guys hate. And so to put it all on the writer without knowing where well, in the process that writer was, that's the unfair part. It's not the criticism. That, that's I mean, how do you fair. account for all that's the mean, variables you mentioned then? Well, like, this is why I'm trying to get a specific in terms every of- Every movie is variables. Thing. Of course, we know that. There's going to be variables. There's going to be like, you know, studio uh, um, mandates and interference. But how do we sp specifically know which movies were damaged and which which ones weren't? Because you, the point that we mentioned earlier is in terms of when people have criticism for a good movie, nobody has any issue with that. But like all these variables when it get brought up when it's a bad movie, why is that? Like when can we hold the writers accountable and when can we not? Like it's all right, so, so I think it just comes down to the script. We we don't have access to the information for all the er variables well, and the issues they went through. All we have is the script. And when we can break down you know fundamental issues with the script, then why can't we blame the writers for that? Okay, so here's the thing. All right, so for Madam Webb, so how many credited writers are there? Is is it SJ Clark? Five. I think it's five. I've heard seven. Five. I think it's five. Yeah. yeah. All right. So you're going to pick one person 
to yeah. funnel all the criticism on. Because oh, no, 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 no. I think all five, all five all, of them deserve all, that. Yes. All five. Yeah, and, 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 and the, the studio. studio. One person got pinged <laughs> in terms of what I responded to. Oh, 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 listen, listen. This is what I was responded to when we had a thing on Twitter. I understand what you're saying. <clears throat> However, number one, that person was being singled out because it's funny that his career is sort of sad. That's just, oh. it might be rude. It might be, it might be mean spirited, but it's sort of funny to some can I, can I try and make that less mean spirited? That, um, I, I, I will also say, but this is the thing. His career <laughs> might be many things, but sad is yes. not because there are, there are uh, plenty of people right now. I'm, I, I, I'm in Seattle across from a coffee shop, right? There are plenty of people right now that are in coffee shops all over LA and all over the world, either trying to write screenplays, writing screenplays, write screenplay after another that never gets picked, that never gets sold, that never gets made. It is really hard. I don't right, care what trending. level you're at that's to get an in made. And in so if, if if you if you are a part of six different movies and you've got some credit for it, from our perspective, from a writing perspective, knowing just how hard it is to get one movie made, let a, let alone a bunch, you know, I understand. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just just very quickly. I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna change. I'm gonna claim channel channel owners' privilege, and I'm gonna interject yeah, on this yeah. one. Um, so that that's an interesting point, and I think you you're almost certainly right. When it's an industry that is so hard to get into, and reputations are made by getting into the industry, I can absolutely understand why people envy those who have six writing credits, and I can also understand why somebody would keep going back to a studio which it sounds like you're saying is, is perhaps intervened to ruin all six of the projects that they've they've had. I don't think that that exonerates the guy from blame, though, because oh. he's he, you're right, it's very successful to get six writing credits in, in a Hollywood movie, but if all six of those credits are absolute crap and you yeah. keep going back, you as the writer are making a conscious decision to say, I know the studio system sucks and I know they're going to butcher everything I make, but it's right. more important to me to have my name in the credits than it is to and turn out money. a good script. And money. Yeah, they're they're pride in their own work. And, and, unless you read that script, you don't know whether or not that person is turned Right. But, the, but he goes, I, I can understand that this is a Lenin thing. Once is an accident, twice might be a coincidence, and three times is something more than carelessness. Once I can understand, twice, fair enough. Three, four, five, and six, and they all come out, and they're bad in pretty much the same ways, even if that is all attributable to studio interference, which I don't think it is. But assuming that it is, you are still making a decision as a writer to say, you know what, my name in the credits matters more than the thing that I'm writing. Yeah, it's a choice. But as, but, it, but as a writer, you don't necessarily determine if your name is in the credits. Not to so mention it, the fact that we're talking uh, yeah. about this specific example, right? The, the specific example yeah. of the guy who's got six films, Morbius, Madame Web, all the rest of those. So this is one very specific uh, words, specifically example of a guy who has been in the industry long enough to have six credits, which, as you say, is a difficult thing to do. All of those films are pretty naff, and the writing in all of them, down to individual lines of dialogue, yes. is all pretty naff. And he goes back for the fifth and the sixth film and probably go back for the seventh one. So yeah, if choice. as a writer, he had respect for his own work, would he not maybe start looking either for other studios or to have a bit more creative control or to do something rather than simply say, I'll turn in my script and you do whatever the fuck you want with it. That's not how it works. I, I, I wish it was that simple. I, see, what, what you're describing is, a, is the life of a magazine writer <laughs> as opposed to the, right, the, the life of a screenwriter. Because in magazines... Yeah. And newspapers, I mean, okay, boomer as it is, in those days, yeah, you had a lot more say or agency in what was being printed, what was being said, your byline, all that stuff. In the current studio system of making films as a screenwriter, which is different than a television writer, mm -hmm. you get hired for a draft, you go through all, how many different set outlines that, to, it really kind of depends on so many different things that most writers don't have any kind of, um, you know, control over unless they're also producers, unless they're actually working with directors or bought in by the director to work on certain things. I, I mean, yeah. there's so many different factors. It's different than, say, for example, the relationship that Chris McQuarrie has with um, Tom Cruise, where mm -hmm. what you love all about those movies and what you dislike about those movies can only be pointed at two people. Two only two people are truly or, in control or, of or, that or, entire or Steven Spielberg and Tony Kushner, right? It's it's like a it's yeah. a duo. Um, exactly. I, I mean that, that that's different than right. than it is with these kinds of movies where, like you said, there's five different writers, there's five different points of view, there's all these different things. I mean, not to mention the fact that there are certain things like so, for example, like you'll write into a movie that 
you'll never get credit for, even though you wrote on the movie. For example, like so, like for me, I I was one of the writers on Straight Outta Compton. Like, um, you know, like did I? I was bought in for like a couple of for like a day and a half to to basically polish some certain dialogue. I wrote a couple yeah. of scenes that made the movie. Do I get credit on that movie? No. Am I still proud of my contributions to that movie? Absolutely. But, but that you know, sort of goes to the heart of it, though, doesn't it? Because you're you're proud of your contributions to the movie, even though you didn't get credited. And I'm assuming you're you're proud of your contributions to that movie because you can look at the scenes you were involved in and you can say those those are good scenes. The dialogue is great. The stakes are present. It accords with everything that comes before and after right. it. Like you, you have actually done an objectively good work of art, and that's something to be proud of, which it is. Um, but I guess what I'm asking is why we can't be as granular when it comes to criticizing individual, say, an individual line of dialogue in a film like Madame Web or Ant-Man 3, which fails right. for exactly the same reasons that you're proud of what you did. It's a oh, bad oh, line of dialogue. Oh, oh, right, so, 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 for Ant-Man 3, okay, perfect example, okay? Like, without even having access to that script, Marvel is famous, you know, and because it's Marvel... Um, Stu, you know, studios as opposed to television. I, I'm not breaking any violation by you know, of, and, uh, and, or, or, or whatever. What I'm saying is that, like, you don't know how many different reshoots that thing went through, and then you don't know who wrote who wrote the reshoots. And so, well, somebody even, did, and and that person was didn't do a very good job. Okay, but did. but whoever's going to get blamed <clears throat> might not be the people that you're blaming that actually get the that actually get the final That's, credits on. I, okay, I think I see. So th there's probably maybe a slight difference in, in what we're talking about here because. I will generally avoid criticizing people by name yes. when yes. criticizing a film, which I think is badly written. I will criticize the writers, yes. and I will criticize the writing in the film. I, I would agree with you. If it comes to picking out an individual name from a, a credits roll and saying that person is responsible for the complete shit show that was Ant-Man 3, that would be cruel, because loads of people were involved in how yeah. shit that film turned out to be. But I think it's... I mean, I don't know if you would agree. Is it still fair, though, to blame the writers collectively or writing in general if the writing in the finished product, no matter how many of them were involved, is subpar? Well, I mean, here's the thing. It's like, okay, a film was written three times. A film is written when it's actually written, like the actual screenplay. Then there's actually what gets filmed. And then the final process is post. And so mm -hmm. post is not only in terms of picking which performance and which lines make it and all right. that kind of stuff. Also, you know, now what happens so many of the times because there's so much money involved, people will go back and reshoot entire scenes and they might not be following every little bit of granular bit of, of continuity the same way that we as geeks are, are just plugged into every aspect of a movie. And that's part of the problem, you know, is w with why certain things are broken because it has been so, so, success so successful for, for people to fly in do things and make it right and then leave that everybody makes it that process as opposed to being very specific to it, like a specific set of problems. Sometimes it, it works well. Like, so, per, you know, perfect example, it's like um, the, the process that happened um, with the Brad Pitt zombie movie um, that like they were having all these issues. They shut it down for a while. They rewrote certain things, went back and filmed it. That worked. I mean, probably the most famous example of something like that happening was, um, was the, um, Rogue One. You know, um, with um, what happened with um, Gareth the, Edwards, wasn't it? And um, yeah, because Gareth Edwards by... is, is is the credited director, but at the yeah. same time, everybody knows that Tony Gilroy, yes, um, did a lot of work on that because Tony himself, you know, I don't know if it was breaking protocol, but he he was proud of what he did, so he made it clear on, on the press run that he yeah. did, that he reworked a lot of things. It's the only reason we're talking about it. It's not credit. And he came back for Andor as well. And Andor is, is an incredibly well-written show. But I, I, I think going back to the point of the conversation, which is, you know, I would have no trouble saying that, you know, Andor is a well-written show and the writers generally did a really good job. And you can tell that Tony Gilroy's influence is there because it's there's a commonality between what he writes for Andor and what he writes for everything he does. You can see the influence of the creator there. So yeah. he gets the praise because it's it's very, very good. I guess what we're arguing, boiled down to its essentials, is that we can make the same judgment the other way. If, if you take a director or a writer who's involved in so many bad products and you see the similarities in all those bad products, J.J. Um, Abrams is a good example of a director in that mold. There, there will be good examples of writers as well. Is, is it equivalently fair just to say, you know what, he's been involved in so many bad things and, and they're bad in the same ways, so I'm going to say that he's a bit shit. Is that fair? Or what about a case like Ryan, where we know that he had full control? Like he had, that was TLJ was his movie. They let him do like it, just like you said, all those variables like, weren't there for that specific movie. So can we hold Ryan Johnson accountable for the movie we made when we know that it was all his? 
Well, see, here's the thing, and this is the this is the biggest problem as a Star Wars geek that I have with those movies. Um, and I'll be very, not careful because I mean, at some point, if I run into Ryan, like I'll, I'll, what I say, I would say to him directly. The issue that I have with those movies is that it didn't seem from movie one to movie to movie three that everybody, even though this is one train going in one direction, that everybody yeah. got together and said, this is what everything we're doing. There is no and unified vision. Like this so is yeah. there's one movie and then and then Ryan says, I'm not doing that, I'm doing this. And the third movie is like palpitating. Yeah, but we know specifically that Ryan had full control. Can we blame yeah. Ryan? Right. But see, but this was the case with that where he's subverting certain things. I mean, and Mark Hamill talks about this. He's doing his job as an actor, but he's doing very unluke things. And I yeah. think honestly, the only thing that would have made us, I, you know, fuck it, the us boomers, like, because I'm I'm a kid that saw Star Wars in theaters in '77. You know, had 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 a Kenner Death Star in the whole nine. What we wanted, we basically wanted the Irishman with you know with, with Harrison Ford and um, Mark Hamill. <laughs> like we we wanted to have our our long extended moments with. Luke and Leia right. and Han before they go off. We, we didn't want mm -hmm. to have each one of them die in, in, in successive movies. You, you yeah. know, you know what I'm yep. saying? So it's like, it's already kind of hard to kind of come into that because the studio from their perspective is thinking these, these actors are in their late sixties, early seventies. We need to ingest new blood into these movies because, you know, we waited 30 years between sequels to do this. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're thinking of it from an age perspective as opposed to thinking of it from a fan perspective because there are people my age that have been waiting for episodes, you know, um, seven, eight, and nine for our whole lives, <laughs> it seems like, you know. So, like, that's the thing, that's the disconnect because they, they figure, well, you know, if you're grown, why would you care about this shit? And actually we do because there's only really two, two cinematic, you know, um, families that people care about in, in that way, the Corleone's, and the Skywalkers. Yeah. So, but so, um, how can so they run a media company so, and not so, understand so, people care about that? So can we blame Ryan or not? Like this. Yeah, to, 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 to be fair, you're talking. But, but here's the thing. Okay, well, can you blame Ryan for those decisions? Yeah. Yes. But here's the thing. Ryan, as director, as writer, stands by those choices. Mm. And there are some very good moments in that movie. I don't yeah. care if he stands by it. I'm talking about whether or not we can hold him accountable for the yeah, another like, thing you have to keep on the in mind. One thing. An, 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 another thing you have to keep in mind is a lot. Uh, it's not. I think you said this earlier. It's like we're, we're solely attacking one person or we're solely attack. No, um, you know, fans, at least in this community and people that I've talked to, we are wholly aware of how bad the studio system is. We attack attack. We, you know, criticize Disney and Sony all, like more than anything on the planet Earth, probably. So we're aware of this. This is compartmentalized, right? Like we, we can do one multi multitask, right? We can attack the studio system, Spo Sony especially for doing so many PG-13 projects when they should probably be rated R. Like there's very safe and boring. Dakota Johnson said this. She, Like it's okay to attack the studio system and also separate the studio system from the creative people involved like Ryan Johnson or, yeah, you know, more. writer writers who have control over how characters are presented and, and yeah. change from the source material. It's like, like the a studio lot of the times writers you have to play are, yeah. with these specific toys, but you right. have the choice as to how you play with yeah. those toys and what stories you put those toys into. So the yeah. studio can absolutely be, and I, I would share your blame of the studios for their decisions that they made with the Star Wars films. But I think that's secondary to the to the real question which is that you know given that the studio said you must have x characters in this and we want new blood so you must have these new younger cast as well still the decisions were made first by jj abrams then by ryan johnson then by jj again which is the studio's fault but those decisions were made writing wise by ryan johnson and jj abrams we would be I would be at least more critical of the writing decisions than I would of the studios, if only because yeah. it's in response to the writing decisions that the studio tried to reverse ferret for the rise of Skywalker and bring JJ back because yeah. you had the force awakens, which was not particularly good. I wouldn't have said, but popular, the, the last Jedi comes out decisions are made by Ryan Johnson as the writer for that film. And they are controversial to say the least. And I would say objectively flawed decisions as well. That film was immensely divisive and a bid to try and recapture the universal adoration of the franchise fan base. They bought back the director who did the last popular one again. Yeah. And, but that's and, that's well, a response well, I mean, to Ryan Johnson's writing decisions, it isn't it? So can we bring in JJ already as a writer, as a director, he's like a force of nature, right? Mm -hmm. So he was already involved 
um, from the very beginning in terms of rebooting Star Wars. And so to say that they bought him back for the third movie and as a producer, he was always going to be involved. And it was really a question of, of his schedule and it's certain yeah, but- other things, but whether or not he was coming back, because you have to understand for each movie, each movie at that level that's being made is taking a year to a year and a half out of your life. Mm-hmm. And, and so from all these different perspectives, it's a big decision to take on a movie like that. Now, certain things. OK, so, for example, like I, as a fanboy, not as a writer, not as a producer, as a fanboy, I have problems with Palpatine being like the the ghost in the machine, so to speak, <laughs> in, in, in the third movie. It makes no fucking sense from a fan perspective. Um, yeah. But, you know who knows all the different decisions that they were trying to make in doing that. Now, mind you, it's like, if I run into JJ Abrams, if you know, um, I haven't seen him personally since, since working on um, almost human back in the day, you know, the one time he came to the writer's room, which was great, but like, I don't have any problem. Like saying, if I, if I'm, if I'm with him, like, yo, like what was behind that? And, just that- and, and, and we, and we talk about it and it's cool. I'm not going to get on, you know, on Twitter and, and, and say that, that the movie was mid and then he's shit. Because it's like, why would I do that? Yeah, but just to add to Platoon's point. Why why would I come at him like that? Because the whole thing about it is like, you know, am I going to go at Chris Terrio? Chris Chris Terrio's got an Oscar. So like, you know, are are you saying that the writer of Argo? (laughs) I mean, Bohemian Rhapsody. Bohemian Rhapsody. Henry Kissinger has a Nobel Peace Prize. It doesn't mean he did much. Yeah, Bohemian Rhapsody has an editing Oscar. In the world. We're talking geek shit. I'm not, I'm not going to step in anything else. No, no, but I just, just the the accolade does not necessarily entail quality is is the point I'm trying to make there. The the, the fact that the guy has lots of film credits to his name or he's won awards or something like that does not necessarily mean that he's particularly good. You get a number of, you know, people who are flash in the pans. They do one. The Wachowskis, for example, did one very, very good thing with the matrix and everything after that's been pretty naff i would say um yeah. you know it, it's being good once does not mean that you get a free ride forever surely yeah no but at the same time i if you knew how hard it was to get to the level of being able to do some of these things i think from that perspective just to say that someone's like shit because you don't like the rest of their movies i don't think that's really fair I mean, you know, because as fans, we do that all the time. As fans, like, like, like you know, it constantly in the NBA, someone will say, oh, well, this person sucks. They're a bench warmer. And when they got in, they only scored three points. And then you see that same player at the YMCA, and they're cooking everybody for 40 or 50 points. Even well, yeah, but the that's NBA. the YMCA, though, man. Like, we are comparing these writers to other Hollywood you're comparing, writers. We're not comparing You're, you're comparing writing a movie. This is this is well, YMCA shit. We're because, comparing them to but, other movies. I mean, because, no. I mean me other if, Hollywood if, if you understood how hard it is to even get a movie made. You can't keep mentioning that yeah. the difficulty we do understand that yes like, we gotta let we, that go we do and platoon's point it, 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 was about it, it, how the writing just different. a second if i can finish my point it wasn't just the producing issues in tlg in the disney uh, star wars trilogy it was the fact that they had to make these su- uh, studio decisions because of the quality of ryan's writing he derailed the entire trilogy that's why they brought jj back this whole thing has been documented you have to actually reference the things that we're, we're talking about because platoon's point was about the writing was the whole reason they had to make the studio decisions. And you okay. didn't address that. All right, so I'll address it. I, I'm addressing it in five different ways, but that's fine. No, one, just one. One clear way. Just one clear <laughs> way for us. That's all we need. You keep asking the same question No, I'm asking ways, one and question, and you're giving me five very terrible answers. I, I would just like to get no, some uh, let's, be, let's be nice. Let's be polite. Um, no, no it's, it's, not, it's not impolite because you're not a Jedi. What is your name? Oh my God! <laughs> who, who are you coming at? <laughs> okay, because, it's a because very simple it, question because, I ask you. If you feel strongly enough about this point, you should be able to answer it with with confidence, rather than making fun of my name. Go I ahead. am not making fun of your name. What yeah. I'm saying is that whether I'm right or wrong, I'm Che Odari Coker. Are you going to attack me personally or not personally? Either way, what I'm saying is that when you're coming at me, and I, I'm saying this as an ex journalist, I'm saying this to somebody else. You still haven't answered question. If, 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 if I'm answering your question. And you don't like the way that I'm answering your question to keep accusing me of dodging your question doesn't make any damn sense because I've answered it four different ways. No, I, was because- asking you to, I was asking you to answer Platoon's question. This is how I know like you're tilted here. It wasn't my question. You ignored a very good point that he made, and then you moved on to something that you had already mentioned. Well, to be fair, it's it's I it, to be fair. So uh, wait, so, so, so ganging up on tell? somebody. So, I'm so, not ganging up. I'm yeah. asking a very no, 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 very I, simple I'm question. Just saying, so to what be is fair, your question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he, what was he, your response? To point I mean, I mean, the the lightsaber's in your hand. What's your question? I'll repeat it again since you talked over me. Um, Please do. Basically, what was your response to Platoon's question? Because it was a really good point. So what's the point? What's the question? He made it. I'll make it again for you since you ignored it. Well, no, um, but because you know, it was basically the producer issues in TLJ and the Disney Star Wars trilogy was because of the writing. 
it wasn't just that the studio choices they made was because of the poor writing. That's a significant factor in the in the things. It that wasn't happened. poor writing. It was decisions that were made that didn't work. So perfect mm -hmm. example is, 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 is or, and this is answering your question directly, because what I'm saying is that that movie got greenlit. Enough people read that script and, and thought at the time, this is the this is the way that we're going with this because they empowered their director to make decisions that even I as a fan didn't necessarily like. But here's the thing about it is that just because we didn't like those decisions, does that mean it's a poor screenplay? Yes, you read the yes. Can, I, yes. Can, I, can, I, can I just say, just because a bunch of corporate executives greenlight a script doesn't mean that, that said script is good, is was a good to go ahead to be greenlit. Would you agree with that? Like a, well, a script can I mean, be terrible. But again, okay. Yeah. Like each, the script, each the script example can be bad. The studio yeah. is different, okay? Because when you're talking about corporate execs, when it comes to the Star Wars trilogy, yeah. it's Kathleen Kennedy, it's J.J. Abrams, it's Ryan mm -hmm. Johnson. It's right. a very small committee of people, okay? And so what they thought they were going for was different to than how people regarded it. I mean, I, to be I, fair, I, 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 I think that I didn't agree with a lot of decisions in that movie. Mm -hmm. But am I going to say that Ryan Johnson is a bad writer or a bad director? No, I'm not. Well, can I get specific just just on on that point because th this might be helpful because I, I think you you said before that you know some of the people, particularly in studios and executive positions, are not quite so clued in on things like you know canon and continuity as fans are, which I, I think you said, and I think I, I would agree with that, and that's it's a fair point to make. Um, that. I would say makes the position of the writer much more important because the writer's job, certainly in the case of The Last Jedi, if Ryan Johnson is principally responsible for the script that comes out, his job is to do what the studio executives are incapable of doing, which is paying attention to things like canon, continuity, character decisions, mechanics, and things like that, the things that make Star Wars films work fundamentally. When Ryan Johnson does, to take just one very specific example, there's the hyperspace ramming sequence in The Last Jedi, when Holdo turns the ship around, engages lightspeed, and flies straight into the giant enemy ship. Right. That's a decision that Ryan Johnson made, right? The studios, I wouldn't have thought, would have sat there thinking, you know what we really need is specifically this purple-haired woman to fly her ship into another ship. I don't think the studio is going to pay much attention to that. Ryan Johnson made that decision. As a response to which, in the next film, you have to have this in ridiculous line spoken by an extra you can't do that again because it was a one in a million decision. Well, that's that line is made necessary because Ryan Johnson chose to do something that effectively broke the mechanics that make all Star Wars space battles work. As soon as you do it once, the question becomes, well, why didn't you just hyperspace into the Death Star in Return of the Jedi? And why can't you hyperspace into any big enemy in any future film? And the only way around that, which I would say makes this bad writing, is to have a character just dismiss it as, oh, it's impossible to do it again. And that's itself bad writing. But that bad writing, I would have thought, stems from Ryan Johnson's bad decision as a writer to have that happen in his film to begin with. So is it fair to criticize, even on, on a granular case-by-case -case basis, can we criticize Ryan Johnson alone for making that decision in The Last Jedi as an example of bad writing? Well, of course you can criticize him because he, as the writer-director, made decisions that the third movie is trying to talk about in response to the audience now having a voice and, and on a granular level saying the, what they like and what they don't like. So perfect example, okay, as this is showing my age, I remember when Return of the Jedi, which previously was, was Revenge of the Jedi, when, it, when that movie came mm -hmm. out, like I remember just like as long as it took for Han to, 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 to get off of um, Jabba's wall and all the different and the silly little laughing rat and all that other shit, like as a fan, like it may, it was, I could call that poor writing because I'd much rather get to Luke getting back to Dagobah and trying to find out is Vader really his father? You know what I'm right. saying? Well, you so, call but, poor but, but, poor but, but the thing is, is back then we didn't have a voice as fans. We basically accepted the movies the way they were. And then we put, and, but then as we began to have voice because of technology changing, and being able to hone in on things, then we got very specific. And so, for example, I'm one of the people that like came really hard at um, the original trilogy when they re-released them in, in VHS, and you yeah. know, and famously, of course, you know, Greedo shooting first, and and all the different yeah. like them changing the music and all all different types of things that George Lucas 
could you know have the right to do because it's it's his sandbox. Yeah, he, but, I mean, he has but, the right to to make bad decisions, and he he made three or if not four entire films of bad decisions in the prequels and mm-hmm. bits of Return of the Jedi. But I mean, are, are you saying that you know before say that the internet comes around and fans have message boards and forums and social media? I mean, would yeah, you not have been sat around? Because I know I was before I was bothering with the internet and YouTube yeah. and things. You know, I'd be sitting around with my friends watching old movies, new movies, whatever it happens to be, not with an audience, but just sitting around in a room with my friends saying, that's pretty shit, actually, yeah. or counterproductive, like, that's very good. But you're still making writing judgments and decisions irrespective of the audience have, aren't you? Yeah, critical yes, thing can happen. Way, I mean, yeah. I mean the, the thing is, to answer your initial question, you think that I'm coming from the perspective that writers can do no wrong. I'm not saying that. Mm-hmm. What I'm saying, to be very specific to Jedi's question, is that writers not above reproach, but when you attack individual writers for decisions that they may not be a part of, mm-hmm. that's what I have issue with. Because so we, depending we doing on the that. movie and depending on the studio, you don't know which writer did what. Now, well, all, all of Twitter. A specific all, example of where I knew uh, we we had the evidence well, heard that we know he was pretty much in charge of the entire thing. That's why I made a specific right. example. I didn't just to be fair, but to be fair, all of Twitter and a lot of people are doing that with Matt Sazama. The guy, you know, the Morbius, Madam Web, uh, Gods of Egypt guy. I, is that what you're talking about? I believe. Well, I, I, like specifically I mean, I, I, referencing one person. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, I, th- I think in that respect, I'm, I'm just going back to what I responded to that led to you retweeting me and then me yeah, getting yeah, on. Yeah, that's here. what I'm saying. And, yeah, you know, it's yeah. like, but here's the thing: like, I think what happens from a writing perspective is that a lot of writers, a lot of people that are involved in writing movies that are going to get criticized and pulled apart, shows that get criticized, pulled apart, they take all this shit personally. You know what I'm saying? As opposed to, you know, well, Jedi and I, I being like, like, like spirited, but at the same time, it's I mean, fun. Because I find shit like this to be fun. I, I like, mean, yeah. I, I, I like this kind of engagement, but I a agree. lot of writers don't. And what happens oh. is that people take this shit real personal. They work really fucking hard on, on these bad decisions, you know? And so what yeah. happens is that like, you don't know what's going on. And so my whole reason for defending that, mo- you know, that guy was because somebody in the darkness coming out and just saying, hey, how do you feel about yourself having done all these movies that, you know, I think are shit. And my thing is like, from yeah, his to- perspective, you know, he's doing I- just fine because he made six movies. But if and he takes it very to- personally, then, but but I think we, we may be covering all ground, but if... And I completely agree. Everyone who's a writer who's invested in anything they write takes things personally when it's criticized. And, you know, it can be a really unpleasant experience. Yeah, it sucks. But don't you still have, point, like, yeah. you still have the choice, don't you, to go back to the people who, let's say, they butchered all of his six scripts. The studio did that. And he goes back and, and does the other one. So he's still making a decision to go back yeah. knowing that this has happened the last five or six times and that it probably will therefore happen and- the seventh, eighth, and ninth time. I mean, is it fair, maybe not to criticize him for every individual thing that's wrong with the film, because that would be hyperbolic, but is it fair to criticize him for, you know, going back to the same people who've just ruined yeah. his last several what, works of art? I, I, it, 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 would, it would be like, like asking, okay, I, have you ever noticed how in a boxing match, in most boxing matches, um, at the end of, no matter how much shit they talked about each other during weigh-in and everything else, at the end of the fight, win or lose, like... And this happened all the time in Mike Tyson fights. Like they would almost be like buddy buddy right after the fight because I know once, once somebody got in the ring and once you once you go through what you've gone through in this weird way, it it bonds everybody from that experience. And so when you ask somebody why they go back, it's because they're still living their dream. They got to write something, and mm-hmm. even though it got butchered and it's a semblance of it got made, they're making a living at writing as opposed to doing something else. That's so, fair. I mean, a, I mean, a, if, if, if some, I mean, right now, like, I mean, like, would you ask um, someone playing for the Carolina Panthers, which are like probably the worst team in football right now? Like, OK, why, why, why do you want to come back and train and run around and, and get in shape and, and just to lose? I mean, like, to it, take it, game? It, because the analogy you love playing the sports, football, you know sports, what I'm saying? And, and writers, regardless of how they treat it, they love writing. So yeah, I know, yeah. I know, I'm, I'm with that, but like using that that same analogy, let's say you know I, I'm not familiar with what Americans analogy. what what Americans call sport is is alien to me in in this country. But um, <laughs> but um, like so yeah. taking the example of the bad football player that like, he loves what he's doing, and and yeah, I, I sub- completely support him in doing what he loves to do. But the fans are sitting there having paid good money to sit in the stands watching him lose every game because he's actually a pretty crap player. And- and is, can those be, two things exist at the same time? Like he's absolutely at liberty to do what he loves doing, and that's the reason he does it. 
but he's objectively just not very good at it, and we can criticize that. I mean, is that fair? That's 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 well, how well, athleticism I, works. I, Athle- I, I, athletics I, 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 is a bad take. comparison. Yeah. Athletics is a bad comparison because you were making the argument that his. You said this in your tweet that who knows if those films reflect his scripts at all. You're not making the argument that he's doing his best and his best work is being displayed on the field. You're making the argument that he's doing his best and nobody knows what his best even is. It's a it's you can't compare these two things. You're saying he should be proud of his work and that's why he's doing it. If I was him, I'm sorry, I would be talking about how my career is being destroyed by 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 these whatever executives that you want to talk about that are ruining his career. I would be very unhappy about it. I wouldn't be, I don't understand this, this like, Oh, I'm just going to keep doing bad. I'm going to keep making bad movies, even though I know that my work is going to be subverted and destroyed over and over and over and over again. That is not how sports works. That is not the best athletes rise to the top in every sport. (laughs) Because if you, if you made hundreds of thousands, in some cases, millions of dollars at writing and the things that, that that you're working at in this way, and we don't even know if they were maligned because I haven't read the scripts, but yeah. if they were and that was the case, the money and having a living and having a family or doing whatever it is could be a factor. If it isn't, then, you know, that's why most people become directors so that they can actually protect their vision. So it really, it, wow. it honestly depends on each individual writer in that process. And just because you regard that whole person's career as for lack of a better phrase shit from their perspective you know every time their name is on a poster is a highlight of a career and they're hoping that maybe the next one they get the opportunity to sure. really do, do what it is they do i mean perfect example i mean everyone used to come at, at craig mason all the time for for being a terrible feature writer and then they shut the fuck up after Chernobyl and, and and after The Last of Us. So, you know, I mean, how many, you know, how many different players switch a team and then all of a sudden you get to, you know, you see a different side of that player because the offense or the defense is allowing them to perform in ways they didn't perform. Yeah, but opponents do that all the time. A and lot so- of players and athletes get judged based on their last fight, based on their last game. Like, why yeah, can't yeah. we apply this the same thing to this where we he has a movie? I'm sure he can make great things in the future. But just because he may make great things in the future doesn't mean we can't criticize the fundamental issues in this movie now. No one is saying that you can't criticize us. That's not what I'm saying. That's certainly not what I said in that tweet. What I said was that, well, it, th- this person, whoever it's, yeah, well, I have to actually go back and read, read the original. It's hard to interpret because you said that you, um, uh, you mean I, the, the question was imagine being this guy that's the viral tweet imagine yeah. being this guy yeah and it shows his entire career and everybody sort of agrees they're all bad you said you mean six movies with his name on the poster um, yeah. i can actually bring it up actually yeah honest. i'm looking at right now you mean six okay i'll say my voice you mean six movies with his name on the Here poster it is. share my Legend. tweet or yeah. share my Legend. Screen. you don't understand the battles man and oh, just how hard it is to get one movie made who knows if these films reflect his scripts at all like all right, I can look at my posters, right? Oh, this is it, yeah. Right here. So, Lowriders. My script, I thought, was ultimately better than what got made, but I'm still proud to be a part of that movie. Luke mm-hmm. Cage, love it or hate it, you know, that's me. Yeah, but, 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 but you're also I mean, making you, the... Cl- you know you're making this with Ray, Ray Donovan, it's like certain things, you know, like Creed, like all of them. I'm proud to be associated with all these projects. If, with the things that I understand happened and, and, and the things that didn't happen. So that's from the, from the perspective I'm talking about. I'm sure from his perspective, you know, if you knew, and I know that you guys have no criteria to understand, like from, from, from right. his perspective, right. or, and that's what I was responding to, how hard it is to get to that level where things are being made, even though there are things that, you know, the only time I ever had full control over anything was Luke Cage. And so, like, it's easy for me to live and die with those decisions as opposed to some of the yeah. movies. But I'm still proud of what I was able to contribute to the things that you end up. And that's, inter- that's great. But I mean, I think that that's a slightly separate point. So, like, my background, like, I write for video games at the moment. And I'm incredibly proud. I didn't ever expect to get the job. It's a brilliant. I, I love it. You know, I'm so happy to be able to do it. And I like to think that what will come out of this, you know, in terms of all the scripts for all the characters will be really, really good. It won't matter whether or not they're good as to whether I was proud to have been asked to be involved in the project. I'll always be proud to have been involved in the project. 
But if the script is crap and if, if the thing comes out and if it's criticized for reasons which I cannot refute because the writing just doesn't hold up, then for all I'm proud to be involved in the project, it's still worthy of criticism because the writing wasn't very good. So uh, to the same uh, start, well, to the same point you were making, being proud of your involvement in a project, as, as you rightly are, and as I'm sure this guy is as well, and as I certainly am, doesn't change the point about the applicability of criticism, yeah, which is what we're criticism. really talking about. See, see, but, but, but this, okay, but, but to, to, to speak very specifically about this tweet, imagine being this guy. That person's perspective, that's not even criticism. That's not saying, okay, these movies are shit. That means saying, imagine being this guy that your name is associated with these well, things by implication that are terrible. As opposed hey, to, I, and, and that's I'm, why you hear so many writers hey, that, have, that, that have been through this process defending him, because and, hey, and not defending the movies, is because we've all had moments, you know, on shows I, or in movies that, like, people... I mean, if you were... And, 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 and that's why I defended this guy. I, I didn't think it was going to be all this, but, like, but... But no, it's okay. The thing. I mean, that, that that's why that's my response. I'm not saying that I, that every screenwriter is above reproach because we aren't. You know, like, but what it's I am saying is, 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 is that so many different things happen um, for the reasons and for things that you hate in a movie that this person who's a who is a, who it's attributed to might not be a part of all, of of all those processes. Right, mm -hmm. right. So imagine, so imagine being what you just described, which is somebody who's entire career is being manipulated and like they have no control over their own persona and their own how people feel about their own movies that would suck <laughs> i mean if you know if anything this person should be livid at, at that like his i mean i'm not saying he made bad decisions maybe he did but at what point is this guy going to come out and talk about how Hollywood kind of fucked him over? <laughs> I mean, like, well, this is something that... Now, if that's true, Hollywood otherwise... Now, I'm Hollywood just saying, I'm giving him, him the benefit of the doubt. When you, when, you giving, have six, when you have six movies, Hollywood did not fuck yeah. you over, okay? That, well, that, that, that's, what I mean, saying. that's what we're saying. That's what we're saying. I, 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 know, I know what you're saying. I'm, yeah. I'm just trying to offer you a different perspective. Like, right. Hollywood... When you have your name on six different movies, Hollywood didn't... No matter of the quality, like, just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any oh, movie, oh, movie okay, it's, it's, it's like... Um, so he might be okay with the criticism. Uh, I mean, it's it's if it's anything. like okay, it, it's it's like it's like the movie Fever Pitch, okay, which was based, of course, the Nick Hornsby's book was way different than the movie they got made. But there's but there is one famous scene from that movie where you know Jimmy Fallon's character is living and dying by everything the Red Sox do, and then ultimately after one loss, he goes out to a restaurant and sees the you know people on the team in the restaurant. And they're just going on with their lives, and he's yeah. realizing that wait a minute, like shit, like. Everything I'm living and dying for is different from the perspective of people that are actually in these games. You, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Well, and 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 what's happening right now is that whoever wrote this is trying to treat this guy like 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 he's Bill Buckner. You know what I'm saying? Like 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 you know he made this awful this awful mistake, and then his life is gonna his whole career is gonna be defined by it. What I'm saying is that you know the fact that he's made six different movies that's probably not his perspective. And I think what, what you guys are coming at me for is like legend. Okay, why did I say legend? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that, 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 that's what yeah, I wanted that, to get that, at. That's, yeah. that's hyperbole on my part. Okay. 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 As you as you guys have witnessed in real time, I'm I'm kind of sarcastic. Like you know, <laughs> it, it's, it's it's he's it, making his money. He's making his money. I get it. I get it. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? So like, so I guess what I was saying in the context of saying that was yeah, from it just, his perspective, shit. I got six movies. Fucking. I mean, it just looks. It looks. I'm not saying. I understand what you're saying. I, I get it. It makes you know. But it just looks strange because you're calling somebody a legend who a doesn't apparently doesn't care about source material, doesn't care about just from the from our perspective, doesn't care about good writing, doesn't care about their own careers, yeah, quality like, of their career. Now, you're calling that person a legend, and meanwhile, a bunch of probably very good writers are being overlooked. This guy keeps getting hired for some reason. I don't know if it's nepotism. I don't know if this guy knows people. I don't know if it's just hey, this person made a superhero movie. Let's hire him again. Hollywood makes terrible decisions all the time. The point is, this person's not actually a legend. It's just objectively, uh, it's it's incorrect like to call him that. It's actually kind of unfortunate that like some people believe this. But like, I know, I know you said you don't. You're sort of being hyperbolic, but like, this is not a legendary career in, in any sense of the word. When it people is, call Spielberg a legend, sad. they can reference things like the different types of movies, the different genres he's made of great quality. I know. How you're can you call this about, man a legend? It's just totally but you were talking. You know? Now you were talking about how difficult it is to make a movie in the Hollywood system, and then maybe that's what you were also referring to, which is he's a legend because he made 
he made it. He made that's you said that right? Is that I'm I'm not putting oh, words oh. in your mouth. No, no. I mean, okay. Here's the thing. Okay? Yeah. Like yeah. Like my reaction because I'll put you you know yeah. into yeah. the mind state that I was in when I read this. Okay. Yeah. I I saw this. Hey, imagine being this guy. Like okay, like I'm gonna get one over on this guy because this movie's in my opinion, not my opinion, but me personally, I'm putting my, myself. You know, this is the voice of of Ray Ray, Ray Fireball too, sure, sure, sure. so so to speak. Ray Ray Fireball too is is saying like, imagine being this guy, and and is trying to like add him by actually putting his his face on top of these movies that, from a fan perspective, don't work. And they yeah. said, imagine being this guy, like like okay, like this guy should like basically put a paper bag over his head, like 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 he's like a New Orleans Saints or Cleveland Browns fan of old. Right, right. And right. and and I and my thing was like, are you kidding me? If you have your name on six different movies, every movie gets you another crack at bat. Every movie credit that you have, right? You know, for better or for worse. For worse, that, sometimes, yeah. But what it means from a hiring perspective is that if you are assigned a movie and they give you money for a movie, that you are going to not only turn in a script yeah. on time, but you're also going to basically do what you're asked to do. And it, it right. really depends on, on, on whether or not some writers actually have, you know, any semblance of power over what happens from that perspective. But here's the thing, not having seen those scripts, but knowing, you know, the 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 studio process with with certain things well, if you don't have you know certain producers that are going to you know protect the writing or 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 make the right decisions as to who else to bring in or the entire process that's different so perfect example is that you know this the the spider-man movies that were under Kevin Feige and Amy Pascal are of a different caliber and quality than these mm -hmm. movies. And so that's not just on the writer. That's no. on a lot of different people. And that's on, <laughs> on, on, on so many different things that like, that's what I'm saying, just to put it all on the writer, I think in some ways is unfair. Now me using legend, that's me being hyperbolic because I've, I've yeah, never yeah, yeah. met Matt. But what right. I can say is that I got a, being in this profession, I can, I have to give props or respect to somebody that survived this process mm. six times. I think that's that's a good and, and fair point, and you're right that we we shouldn't absolutely we absolutely shouldn't direct all of our vitriol to one towards one specific right. person without right. knowing whether or not the person's responsible for things we're criticizing. But it, it throws up another question, which I'd really like to get your your sort of take on, which is you know, you've, you've described the way that the system works and, and the things that people have to do to get ahead in the system and to stay in the system, um, and. Nevertheless, you know, it produces these very variable results, as you just mentioned. You know, the first two Spider-Man films are excellent, and since then, it's been pretty variable to crap, to be fair. So, the, if we're looking at what has to change about the studio system itself to ensure that either writers get their scripts through unmolested, or better writers are hired, or whatever it is, yes. to get a better quality of film overall, what needs to change from the studio's perspective? Like, how can we actually improve the quality of films we're getting overall? Not be, well, first off, not be afraid to make mistakes. Part of what it is, is understanding where the criticism is coming from, not being so afraid to be criticized. Mm -hmm. You know Thanks. what I'm saying? Like, 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 like having the courage to, you know, to come into a room like this and get beat up. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, uh, like, I think more studio executives should do this and, and, yes. really, and really understand <laughs> where fans are coming from and why, because very few of them, you know, and the exceptions, of course, are, of course, James Gunn and, and Jeff Loeb and people and other people that actually, you know, understand, even though I'm not saying that, that people are above reproach. You know, it's like when you're a part of when you understand the fan community because you are a fan, when you've had the experience of understanding the power and magic of these characters and of these movies and 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 what goes into it and the feeling that it has over you, it's, it's different than people that are kind of coming into this as a genre. And they don't understand how we live and die by casting and by certain things or understanding what people are really going to get offended by, you know? Um, and so it's just like, I mean, like, or, you know, if you make a decision and somebody doesn't like it, not like beating yourself up and saying, oh, my God, like, oh, that means this movie doesn't work at all. So we should not do any more movies. That's not the case. It's just right. like, like figure out what the problem is and then fix it. As well, that, 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 that's what James Gray, James Gray directed at Astra Lost City of Z. He said this openly and a lot of people were praising him for it. He said, 
Hollywood needs to take more risks and stop worrying about Wall Street. Stop worrying about uh, this movie Agreed. didn't make money. Therefore, we will not make more movies like this. And right. it's like it's this very like statistical analysis kind of cringe behavior that's coming from like these people who should know better. Um, and it's like, yeah, Hollywood should be willing to take more risks, even if they lose money. Like the Northman is a great example of this. I feel like mm -hmm. it's like that movie lost money, but like it, it's probably going to go down as like a cult classic. It, it already sort of is, you know, Robert Eggers entire career is like this, but mm -hmm. like, you know, Hollywood needs to stop doing the, doing playing, playing the money game and trying to, uh, trying to like play the box office and being safe. But well, well I mean, yeah. but, but every decision. So for mm -hmm. example, like, if if we were to have this conversation with executives, executives would be like, from their perspective, oh man, you you do not know how many different ways right, I well, can meet up to, to you know to even write to sign my name on the budget to get this made. And so from that perspective, they're criticizing things because they don't really have any understanding of the market. Well, they don't really have any, any understanding of the things, but they're thinking, okay, well, if I add this to this and this to this, then then it's gonna work, right? And then when it doesn't work, right, like you know, their first reaction is to, you know. But they make um, cut all ties as opposed to really understanding right what's wrong. They and, might and, they might have they might have these like uh worked out in their head, but it doesn't map onto reality because just clearly, like for example, Guillermo del Toro has a had a job of the hut movie that he wanted to do, mm -hmm. and and he couldn't he has 30 scripts. He talked about this, he has 30 scripts that never got produced. He that guy hasn't made a bad movie in his entire career. The Hollywood is not trusting. They, they, they might be like, they, you know, you just said they might be in this call with us or whatever. They might have reasons, whatever their reasons are clearly are horrible. Like they're producing so many bad movies that I have to come out and defend Hollywood. I don't know, man. I, 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 well, well, I watch well, a lot I mean, of movies. I mean, Hollywood is like, but, but to your point, and, and, and uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm agreeing with what you guys are saying. Like yeah. this happened in the seventies and the late sixties, early seventies when like movies, like, like when Coppola was involved with Finney's Rainbow. Um, and some movies yep. that were just not good. And then, and, and then somebody was like, wait a minute, like, yeah. okay, like what, there was this little movie made called Easy Riders that just yeah. felt different than anything that was out of that system. And then you had people like, you know, for better, for worse, like the Robert Evans and Peter Bartz of the world that said, okay, let's bring some of that guerrilla spirit to the movies at Paramount right. and, and, and really go after writer filmmakers that are really going to, you know, take some risks. And right. so we had it, it, so it in, the it, in the nineties with it, David Fincher, Tarantino, Guy Ritchie. We had it. The nineties was another kind of revival. Yeah. Uh, and, and so exactly I mean, what you're this, about. Is, this is yeah. happening again. This is going to, I mean, I know, hope so. Like, <laughs> but even when it comes to like perfect example, okay. Like Westerns, for example, like they were a staple of studios mm. for years. And then all of a sudden they got bad. And then people started doing different things with them and then revived yeah. it. You know what I'm saying? And so the same things that happen with superhero movies. You know, well, it's it, like, I, you know, it's it's just that it's going to, but it's going to take really stripping things down to what makes them work. I mean, the, the, the same thing's really happening also in, in terms of the Star Wars things. Well, you know, if, if, yeah. you know if like you if, if the movies took as many risks as Tony Gilroy did with, with Andor, you know, the movies hopefully um, would I hope be better. So. You know what I'm saying? It's it's like what do people really want? I mean, they they want they want lightsabers. They want the force. They, you know, like yeah, th things veer when you know, like you have these decisions about like using the hyperspace to, to to go through a ship, or 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 Leia, who's never really had any demonstrable force powers, like you know, frozen. Well, she turns into like, Mary Poppins and flies. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. like yeah, like I mean, rest in peace, Carrie Fisher. But like yes. you know, but like. But that that's the thing. It's like it's that kind of stuff that takes fans out of it. I mean, I mean, hell, I mean, yeah. I mean, the, the Phantom Menace, like, why would you cut away from the best lightsaber fight of all time to, to watch <laughs> a kid like, you know, fly a spaceship on a remote control? Yeah. Sense. There's a great um, little clip actually from behind the scenes from that film when they do the first screening, George Lucas is there and, and all the people who are involved and they watch it for the first time. And George Lucas just says, yeah, I think I might have gone a little bit far in a few places. And everyone else just sort of I mean, yeah, but, nods. But even from, from, <laughs> but even from, from no, to your point, from, 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 from his perspective, he's thinking of it in, as being somebody in his 50s or 60s when he makes that movie. Like, oh, if I don't have little kids in these moments, they're not going to see themselves in this movie without realizing yeah. that 
the little kids are more identifying with you know Luke Skywalker with with, with you and McGregor than they are with with yeah, yeah, yeah. Boy. Yeah. you know it's it, it, like constantly like I mean I because I think what happens is people get disconnected from the experience I had as a kid watching um Harrison Ford um in like not only as, as, as Han Solo but also my favorite character of his Indiana Jones like mm -hmm. Raiders of the Lost Ark I mean the first 10 movie first 10 minutes of that movie are perfection like. Yeah. You know, it's like I think what happens now is that executives and movie makers are too much into we have to make a character likable. We have to do this. We have to do that. As opposed to just let the character breathe. As opposed to. Yeah. You know, but these are the things. Tech these box are the, characters instead of actually actually having characters. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you know, it's, it's like, web. you know, Tarantino <laughs> yeah. is, able to do, is able to do that because, you know, he, he's. He's the only screenwriter in town where the entire town shuts down anytime. I mean, yeah, but see, yeah, he's, he's talented, though. He's talented. So when people call him, that's what the point I was making earlier. When people call him a legend, we can reference why specific things that he does in his movie. And that's the only the distinction I think Pixels are trying to make in terms of like, yeah, like just because he has six, I understand it's something to be proud of in terms of the opportunities, but can we account for the quality in any way? Because let's take his six versus six from Spielberg or six from Tarantino. There's a reason for Kurosawa. Good. It's just yeah, I, I mean, uh, but like, but when you're mentioning art, you're mentioning auteurs. You're mentioning people that have. Well, we get Tony know, Kushner. I mean, Tony yeah, but a like writer. we're he's right, and we're also comparing these like writers and everything again, like to other professionals. Like I know that that guy's a probably he's probably a better writer than any Tom, Dick, or Harry that's just patrolling like fucking any comment section on Facebook probably. or Instagram or YouTube or something. Yes, I, when I'm saying he saying. sucks, yeah, he sucks compares or like when I say that project in particular yeah. sucks, it's compared to other Hollywood projects. Like I'm I'm comparing him to other it's, professionals. I'm not comparing actually, him. Yes, to a Cynic, it, it, mm -hmm. it's a standard. It's a standard that fans of these, we're talking about pop culture right now. Mm -hmm. It's a standard that fans have of a low, a low bar that you can't dip below. We we have standards. Like fans want we're not saying we want like cookie cutter, do exactly what we want. Like, we're not saying feed us like exactly what we want. Like, make some take some risks, but like we have standards for characters that that and source material. And like that's why Denis Villeneuve is so successful with Dune. It's like this guy is trying his best to stick to the close to the books. He's also innovating. He's doing what Kubrick did, but like he's respecting the book. He's respecting the fans as best he possibly can with his own creative vision. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 to be fair, I mean the best. If you know James Gray, this interview I'm talking about with James Gray is fantastic. He talks about how Ant Man, Indiana Jones Five, all these movies. Like you know, I could list a million of them. They have no quotable lines. There's no, there's no like in engagement with the fans. If you think about like what movies stand the test of time in in nerd culture, it's Fight Club, it's Schindler's List, it's The Godfather. These are not pop culture movies. These are sort of risky, interesting movies that, and like subversive movies, like Seven and and mm -hmm. Tarantino. And it's like it doesn't have to be like this. Okay, but uh, on, 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 all, on all those movies yeah. that you mentioned, how many writers yeah. are on those movies? Usually, in most cases, well, the writer, I'm not, yeah, the writer, the right, that's not and, really and, and, Andrew Kevin Walker wrote two of the movies that, that, that you just talked about in terms of oh, seven okay. and, and, and Fight Club, right? Yeah, you, you know, what yeah. I'm saying what like one one writer protected by one director, as, as, yeah. as, as opposed to constantly being writer. written for different things because because said actor or said studio executive says that okay, you know, Tyler Durden needs to be, needs to be more likable. Or well, these different things need to change. So is and that so, something that might potentially be a problem going forward? Because I, mean, I, I would completely agree. It's much easier to get a consistent artistic vision if you've got one writer under yeah, one director, yeah, and they will both have, have each other's back. The, the trend at the moment, from what I've seen at least, seems to be ever growing writers' yeah. rooms. Like yes. we, we seem to have TV-sized writers' rooms for every individual movie product. And That's the recent the strikes have, strike have further in, embedded yeah. that we've got more writers that have as a minimum contractual requirement more writers have to be on on set so yes. or, or at least involved do you see that getting any better then given that the size of the writing teams is actually increasing over time or would well, you rather see these things contract well it's 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 different things i mean you know the writer strike was largely about um i mean a lot of issues in terms of residuals in terms of mm -hmm. you know the way that the system will just constantly replace people or or or, or erode different rights um I can't relitigate the strike. The strike hurt all no. of us, but at the same time, what we were striking for, I think, was important. But but beyond any of that, I, I think the thing is, is writers' rooms 
applying the writer's room model to feature films is hard because writer's rooms, it, it's a different kind of thing. And it's and also in, in a writer's room in a television show, ultimately you have that kind of control. With a feature film, it's different. Like it's, it's harder to kind of apply. I mean, although I think it's better if, if you have you, writers working together and, and, you know, on the same movie and, ha and being in concert as opposed to people that aren't talking with each other, constantly replacing each other. I, I think mm. that th those are two different things, you know, like, so for example, like um, if you look at, um, you know, some of the different team, like the movies that are written by teams, like say, for example, like if you look at, at the Kirk, at the Kirk, you know, um, um, the uh like Damon Lindelof, um right. Orky, um, I'm sorry if I'm butchering their last names. Um Kurtz or Vin uh, Vince Gilligan, Vince Gilligan, maybe. You know what I'm saying? Like a, yeah. a lot of them, like so for example, on, on the on those first Star Star Trek movies, and you know, when JJ kind of took over Mission Impossible, you know, he was bringing on writers that were used to collaborating with, with each other from right. television. And so they had a different chemistry in terms of how they collaborate. I mean, really, you know, if you even look at, at the Bond movies, I mean, like Purvis and Wade do the stories on every single Bond movie. And then ultimately one other writer like a John Logan or someone else comes in. But there's a certain cohesion because the Broccoli's have so much control. And then they bring on directors that, you know, um, at least the most successfully in, in the most mod in the most recent sense in terms of, um, you know, what um, Sam Mendes was able to do with those movies. Uh, it just it's every single case is different it's not that writers are above reproach i mean because i think what it is is just, is a it's part of the process and the process itself is where is where things are breaking and you know yeah. and so it's just like i think that's a lot of what needs to get fixed well it's, to be fair there's a lot of people you're to be fair to you you know especially for coming on and this has been amazing to be mm. fair there's a lot of people that don't understand how film filmmaking works and just attribute everything <laughs> <laughs> to like uh, the director or something. So you're right about that. But a lot of people need to like understand kind of some of the stuff more and like pay attention more or just stop, you know, yelling at people. But there, there is like a middle ground. So, so yeah, but I understand where you're coming from. Yeah. For sure. I guess, I mean, just obviously we've been going for a little while, so we'll probably look to wrap up shortly. I did have one more quick question if that, if that's all right. Absolutely. We we're talking about, um, you know, earlier the rise of, of the internet and the way that that's impacting fandoms and the way that fans engage with with products and with films and writers and things like that i think the other thing that's happening certainly in the last few years has been this rise of crowdfunded independent media um there's a few youtubers in our space who are crowdfunding their own productions most of which they've written themselves um do you see that making a, a big splash in the future are we likely to see people who've come up through crowdfunded projects going into a studio system to revivify it or is this always going to be a relatively niche little sort of side thing well here's the thing um, and this is kind of a, a long, a lot, cause I want to take into what you're saying and just how things, how, how the atmosphere has changed in terms of filmmaking and then mm -hmm. what you're talking about in terms of like crowdfunding and small niche films, like everyone wants to attribute the death of the theatrical experience to, um, you name it. They want to blame video games. They want to blame the internet, all these different Stream, things. Like, streaming, streaming. Yeah. What, what killed? <laughs> For sure. Cinema is cheap flat screen televisions. Yeah. Because once you could basically get a 65 inch Dolby Vision television for like 500 bucks, when you get a 3D television of a certain size for so cheap at that point, and we've all been to, you know, the movies where after 30 minutes commercials and everything, all the other bullshit, like when you're at home with a screen that big for and in that economically, can actually um you know afford you're approximating the the theatrical experience like the scariest thing for me in the world as a fan was loving movies and loving martin scorsese and waiting for the irishman and then going and here in, in seattle when when you know the cinerama dome and it's a different theater now going to see that movie at the cinerama dome when it was theatrically released and then two weeks later at thanksgiving watching it at home on on, on my big screen and it was exactly the same in terms of the experience that scared shit out of me. Like, what the fuck are we going to the movies for? And that's <laughs> part of the problem is that you're fighting against that. And so, but here's the here's the advantage of that from a filmmaking standpoint is that cameras are so attainable at this point. 
editing software, sound design, um, even like, you know, and the scariest thing about, about AI mm -hmm. is the fact that, you know, with green screens and everything else, it, it within five years, it will be possible at home to basically approximate the look of a $40 million movie. And, and that's that's true. It, that's scary. It's scary. But here's the great advantage of that is that you're going to have an entirely new generation of filmmakers that are born into it that, you know, it starts off with TikTok and like, I mean, people are doing like these French new wave edits. Oh, you just, you know, yes, like, like, yes, like I've seen well, those. Well, have you ever been to film school? They, 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 they're doing all types of shit that yeah. people actually have to go study. They're, they're just doing it yeah. naturally. Didn't um, people make the same prophecy though for the death of cinema during sort of the seventies, just before the Hollywood Renaissance? And you yeah. know, you had the death of the West, in which had driven the entire industry for so many years. And televisions came out and became massively popularly available, and people were moving on to television as opposed to movies. And the studio systems themselves at the time were worrying about how you can possibly beat this this home brewed entertainment. But then you know, the nineteen eighties happened, and you got these massive, brilliant franchises. Star Wars, Indiana Jones have already come up that attract people back to the cinema. Yeah. Do, do you think there's any merit in the idea that maybe the decline of cinema is to do with the fact that most big films just aren't worth spending your money on? And if we got yeah. better films, the cinema would be better. A hundred percent. hundred percent. I could agree with that. Yeah. I, I think, I think part of what it is, is people have to um, adjust what movies are theatrical because it used to be that virtually every movie was theatrical. And now it's like things have changed to the point where streaming quality has gotten so, you know, good that it seems that certain dramas play better at home than they do on the big screen so if you're going to bring people in to you know the the cinemas that's where the you know the mission impossible movies the 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 top gun mavericks the the really big dune like these huge well, ex, well, you know do you, well to be fair what platoon was saying is is more or less kind of approaching the, the quality aspect of these big temple things. Tarantino and Villeneuve, I'm sorry, uh, Christopher Nolan and Villeneuve, for example, are doing things. Nolan even said this. He's not going to do a low budget movie ever again because he has the responsibility of having access to a massive budget. And if you watch the Oppenheimer behind the scenes, he's, he did everything in practical effects. He was, and yeah. he is a believer that he can drive people to the theater. If he can put, an impressive visual display of filmmaking, which is AI can't approach at all because right. filmmaking is a team effort and it involves a million different things, including cameras and editing software and all these things. But like that will drive people to theaters, but the, ha the movies have to be of good quality, like, like Dune, like Oppenheimer, even like Barbie, if, you, if that's your cup of tea, but like the, the quality is important. And mm -hmm. I think, I think that's what we were talking about earlier with standards. It's like, well, um, well, but, but, see, but, but, but yeah, but no, but and I'm agreeing with everything you're saying, but yeah. I think part of what it is, like when you talk about what AI yeah. does and just the speed with which it does what it does. Yes. Essentially, if you combine AI with, you know, these, even though they're, they're still primitive, the, um, you know, the Google, not Google Glass, the, the, the Apple Vision Pro, whatever oh, it is. Yeah, the Apple dystopia goggles. Yeah. So mm. what we're getting closer to in the next 30 to 50 years mm probably soon and probably 15 years is basically the Star Trek holiday. That's what AI is going to do in terms of filmmaking It's going to be, you're basically going to walk into an interactive environment where everything is, is dialogue that you're having is being responded to in real time in a, in a, in an audio visual way that that's what it's building towards. That's a, a, an entire room of screenwriters. Yeah, that's a you know, totally different conversation. Can't, that's a can't hard compete, can't compete with the speed yeah. what that would take because essentially, I mean that that's really what it's building towards is is you know like if you were going to put yourself into a Star Trek movie, you know movies yeah. have a different you know have a different meaning because when you have a holodeck and you can go have a drink and and, and do all this other shit yeah. in a holodeck, that's a different thing. So you appreciate movies themselves differently. Yes, it's like it, it, I, I mean it's, it's it's the same argument that people had, for example way back in the day when foot photography first took off they were like okay well painters like are never going to paint ever again and you know what happened is that painters were no longer constrained to have to capture reality so in terms of what rembrandt in terms of what other people did with with lighting i mean in terms of how they would paint pictures to try to be hyper 
realistic before they had photographs, it freed them to be abstract. It, it, it freed them, Picasso and other people, to, to, to do different things. And so I think with filmmaking, you know, there's always going to be filmmakers. There's always yeah. going to be people that, that, that do it a certain way. I, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, I mean, honestly, it's like, you know, um, the reason that these expensive sports cars like Ferrari and Lamborghini, okay, why are they so expensive? It's because you only have 10 people that work on every single car as opposed to it being mass produced. So it means something. So there's, yeah. art, there, there's art in it down to the stitching on the seat because the same old guys were doing that shit for 50 years. And that's what filmmaking is going to become. I think it's, it's, it's going to be very specialized. And yeah. it's always going to have meaning in this. And people in some ways might even appreciate the art more because you're right. There, there is something soulless and cold about machines that, that it's not there yet. And, and, and I think it's, it's, I, I agree. And I, there's some people in this, in this space or whatever, who, who, who you know, fans of movies in general, some people don't care about the process, the creation process. And I think a lot of people do like if you, so many people have watched the Lord of the Rings, um, the making of featurettes, People are aware, like Phil Tippett, for example, is like a legend. Like if you are a Jurassic Park fan and you're having a nerd conversation about like your favorite movies and Jurassic Park comes up, you're going to talk about the the dinosaurs, the this, the, 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 the production design. You're going to talk about what Spielberg did with and T Phil Tippett did with like CGI, like, you know, innovation. And with Peter Jackson, you're going to talk about how that movie was made and stop motion. And it's all and just this goes back to Kubrick and, you know, the movie process is very, it's very important that we remain like it, 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 this team effort, creative, brilliant, genius, like human project. And I agree, totally agree with you. I think AI is scary. And I don't like that. I don't like the fact that I think in the future that what I just talked about, like being a nerd and like understanding how movies are made, that, that conversation is gone with AI. It's just, oh, this algorithm spit out something that I like. End of conversation. Like that's really boring. I yeah. don't think that's a good future. I think that's a bad future. Yeah, no, I, and, and I'm, I'm hoping that people, yeah. like, the same reason that certain decisions get made that lead to these movies that, you know, from a fan perspective, everyone is lambasting. Yeah. Unfortunately, what's going to happen in terms of AI, in terms of these things and these algorithms, is, is, is gonna, it's going to be easier for people to make bad decisions. Yeah. Because, they're, you know, what's... The, my favorite, one of my favorite lines of dialogue of all time is something that I apply to my life and also I think should also apply to anybody that's trying to venture into making movies. You know, it's Han Solo, you know, never tell me the odds as he flies, you know, directly into the <laughs> asteroid field. It's a perspective on life. It's yes. like, it doesn't matter that someone's telling you that this movie's not gonna work because all these types of movies haven't worked. My movie is going to work. You have to have that belief no matter what the genre is, because otherwise what happens is, is you, you stop yourself from, from making movies. Like, like, so for example, it's like, imagine if not only did because of, you know, um, so many failed attempts to do the Lord of the Rings, like imagine if Peter Jackson and who had some, some box office right. failures before he even did that movie. Imagine if he says, you know what, I'm not even going to attempt it because every single, because, um, you know, legend or, 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 you know, or certain movies in the fantasy genre didn't really work at the box office. I'm, I'm not going to attempt Lord of the Rings, you know, or imagine if, if, you know, they're with, um, you know, Joel Schumacher and nipples on the bat suit. Like, like imagine if, if, you know, um, they decide not to, uh, you know, make Iron Man, you know, saying, right. okay, like, you know, we, we, we have a star who basically literally, uh, you know, got a rehab in jail. And this is talking about Robert Downey Jr. This is, I'm not dissing him because this is all documented. Yeah. He was a box office risk, you know, at the time that they made these movies, you know. But you know, John Favreau was not setting the world on fire in terms of box office. I mean, people liked his well, movies. John Travolta. John Travolta in Pulp Fiction was a box office risk. Well, exactly. So, <laughs> uh, so that, yeah, it's, it's like you just have to, you just have to have a certain level of belief, and then at the same time, you know, um, push forward. I mean, in, in Iron Man, so like perfect example, like the first Iron Man movie, which which is still one of my favorites. Um, in terms of the making of that movie, they had all types of problems with that script. I mean, Jeff Bridges talks about how they basically had no script and they were constantly on the fly, you know, making things up. But there was a certain cohesion to the storytelling 
from yeah. every aspect of uh, in front of the camera and behind that, that got them through that. Well, and that's what, great writing. That is great because Vince Gilligan sort of, you know, television, this happens. I'm assuming you would understand, like you would, maybe you can elaborate, but like television, this happens more often, which is on the, off the cuff, spontaneous writing characters like Vince Gilligan bringing back, um, uh, Jesse because fans like the character he was going to kill off Jesse and then he decided not to and th to me that's like part of I don't know just my understanding is like that's part of the the writing process like storytelling is writing and like you know uh, figuring out a way to work Jesse into the story that isn't that doesn't ruin the story because he was originally written off because it could easily have like broken the story but it but they, they, they figured out a way to do it really well that's great writing I mean I I, I think yeah, absolutely. I yeah. Mean, I mean, that, that's the thing. It's like some some of the best writing. I mean, television basically used to be the place where, you know, in the um, in the 80s and 90s, it, it was looked down upon, you know. And then um, so many writers, like, you know, when you look at what happened with HBO and stream, uh, you know, and what was cable then and then became streaming, yeah. had the opportunity to finally stretch. And then people, fans got to the point where they'd rather spend, you know, 13 hours with a kid with characters they loved than two hours with characters they only, they only kind of liked. And that changed the nature of writing and changed the nature of filmmaking. And now we're in this weird hybrid space where, because everything is going to be streaming at a, after a certain point, you know, there's less of a line between feature filmmaking and, you know, quality television. And so mm -hmm. it's like, you're seeing a lot of back and forth. And so certain things work, certain things don't work. You know, um, and so I, I, I think earlier you, you guys were talking about Rebel Moon, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's the thing. It's like the only person to blame for that one is Zack Snyder because yeah. he had all the control. <laughs> he had yeah. all the power. No, and, wait until the director's cut. What are you talking about? And we'll have to see if, <laughs> if, if, if you know, um, if the second installment, you know, pulls it a different direction. I yeah. think that's a, that's a really good example because a lot of people, like the variables you mentioned before, that could apply to a lot of other Snyder's movies. But with Rebel Moon, he's fully responsible now. So do you like that guy's back to the point from earlier? It's like you it's much more fair to put the blame on him when we have the information. I think that's kind of what you're trying to say. Yeah, well, yeah, well exactly. Because, I mean, he had full, complete control for better, for worse, you know, up and down. Like that, what, it's what, part what, of the reason. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no, but what works and what doesn't work about that movie, like you can't point to any other direction. And but I think that Zach can live with that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, because, yeah. Like you can't really yeah. point at that. Like so. That's fair. And, and or Rid different. Ridley Scott with Napoleon uh, recently, with Ridley Scott's decisions to to edit that down and like whatever. However, he he was in complete control. I mean, he there's 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 plenty of examples like this. That's, that's yeah, a he, good, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. easy to live with things if you keep getting hired. So that's um yeah. that, that's yeah. something. <laughs> Um, he made I am Indian and Prometheus, so there's always that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he well, made, I, I, he mentioned I, I, in films I, I, after Prometheus. Were we saying Platoon? Well, um, I, oh, no, sorry. Before you make your point, like, I guess my point is this, is that I'm not saying writers are above reproach or anything else like that. I guess what I'm asking for, if I can speak for writers, yeah, go ahead. is just to have an open mind and be very specific about understanding um, the yeah. perspective of what happens and how what you love and what you hate goes back to the same place. And so it's who's involved with the, with certain things. It might not be who you think it is. I mean, it's it's, yeah. and it's, it's no different than like, you know, <laughs> as, I, as a sports fan, I, I watch people like screaming about how certain um, offensive coordinator sucks or how right. certain, or, or, or right. it's the same mm -hmm. thing about how, how people will like say, oh, this this DP sucks or, you know, without really yeah. understanding that, like, you know, it was really on the gaffer. It was really on the decisions that were made. And now so many movies in color time and certain things change that you don't know what the DP actually signed off on versus what happened in post. I mean, there are all these different things that, that go into this. And so or, I think you can always tell how, how people who don't really understand exactly how many things go into the creation of anything when they say the last Super Bowl was a psyop example as though you right. can actually it's make an athlete off. deliberately make the mistakes yeah. they make over every game and then, is, and then suddenly, actually suddenly if the niners if the niners would have won then suddenly it's not a psyop or something yes, like yeah. exactly so, right. yeah. it's so stupid yeah um, but, uh, but I'm, yeah. I'm i'm really this, this was this was fun and, and i and i hope that like more people like you know do this you know what i'm saying it's like mm -hmm. 
uh, you know, you love it. We love to talk to people, creative people, any of any industry. I, I love talking to people. And I think, I think more creative people should be talking to yeah. fans. I think it's a good bridge building kind of thing. And I love the stream. That was like going to be my, my, my closing pitch, oh, in fact, because I'm going to go for a little while. And uh, funnily <laughs> enough, having talked about bad writing all the way through, I actually have to go and write some scripts. So I'm going to have to call it in. But, uh, but I did want to say, no, I did want to say massive thank you, Chief, for coming on because it's uh, honestly, it's fantastic to be able to speak like civilly and have a real conversation with people who actually know what they're talking about and know what the industry is like from the inside. Um, anytime you're free and you fancy coming back on to talk media, you're more than welcome. Um, and yeah, massive thank you again for, for joining us. Well, no, thank thank you everybody for for making. I mean, I know it, it seemed to got contentious. I mean, Jedi and I got into it, but it's, it's no. fun. You know what I'm saying? Like this We're is passionate. Passionate. I'm never, I'm never, like to me, what I love about this this is exactly what I was talking about when I talked about like the way it used to be at comic books. Yeah. Or yeah, like, yeah, or yeah. you know, when we would get together and play Dun Dungeons and Dragons, and like people arguing oh, about shit. Like, just to touch on your just to touch on your point of like, you know, a lot of people like in sports or media, they'll make a lot of criticism without looking at the whole context right now. And I feel like, I feel everyone here tries really hard not to do that and have the facts straight and like take a look yeah. at it all, uh, you know, look at it objectively before we make that. That's why we feel so strongly about it. That's also for why me, we, for me, it was just trying yeah. to bring clarity because I was having trouble understanding it, like the way you're framing it, but it wasn't a disrespect. Yeah. You, you, the second you come on to address this with like five people you don't even know, you instantly get my respect. I'm not going to yeah. like, Anyone yeah. who's willing to talk about media 100%. and is passionate about, I'm, I'm never going to diss someone for being passionate about media, even if we disagree on certain things. That's that's all it yeah. is. So. Yeah, I mean, don't take that personally. <laughs> like all, all you can do with this kind of stuff is have fun with it. You know what I'm saying? And so it's it's just like it's just you know I I guess it's no, but but thank you for your point, Jedi. Like yeah, I, yeah. the whole thing is like um, you know I think sometimes it can get so toxic, it can get to the point where people on both sides don't understand that people have feelings and that there's a real person. I mean, I'm Candyman on this shit. If you, if you say my name four times, I'm right there. Like, <laughs> okay. like, uh, like, they, like, <laughs> Ray from Disney Star Wars. There's no, everybody, nobody has any issue with Daisy Ridley, but Ray as a character is abysmal, like completely. Right. You know? Most people are willing hey, to separate that, but it, some, it's not being people thrown can. in. You know? Some people can't. I was yeah. on. I was spending half a day defending the voice actors for the latest Suicide Squad game because a lot of people were going. People that I respect were going after these. Um, you know, these voice actors because the the game is bad. They didn't do anything wrong. They just read their lines. Like the game is bad for other reasons. Clearly, yeah. so yeah. it's like some people mm -hmm. just genuinely don't understand, mm -hmm. and they're rude. And it, that's that's the internet. So like, yeah. I, I do yeah, my you best to like. That. You gotta yes, and we yeah you you have to behavior out for sure. You shouldn't fully ignore it, but it's something that it's just the reality of the internet. You learn it the yeah. first week you're on, and it's like you can't put those people in the same boat as people who work as hard as like the you know the panel here to like actually make their points. And yeah, like, I, my yeah. videos take so long because I want to make sure I have references and examples, <laughs> and like, did, is it really that stupid? Hold on, let me pull it back. That type of thing, yeah. you know, yeah. be accurate. Yeah. Well, 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 so like so. I clearly, this is the thing is like, I was going to wait for Madam Web to come out streaming, <laughs> but but now I'm actually going to go see it because it's like, honestly, I, like, dude, it, it, it's no, one of the I, funnest no. films you'll ever see. It, it's a really good, fun <laughs> film for all of the Hilarious. things it does wrong, but it's really fun. Well, it's funny because I, I, I'd i actually love to go see it and then come back and, and talk to you guys about it. Yeah, about, I about, swear to yeah. God, that would be You'd awesome. You'd love it. <laughs> that would be <laughs> that, fucking that awesome. Be yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, I followed you on Twitter, so give me a shout anytime you want to come on into a film. You're more than welcome. Oh, definitely, I definitely will. But also, like you know, the movie that I did see this weekend that I loved was One Love, the the, the Bob Marley movie. Oh, you know, the, the thing that was interesting for me, like I wrote um, a version of that movie twenty years ago for Warner Brothers, that is one of my probably best script I've ever written. And you know, but I'm glad that that movie didn't get made because who they would have the decisions that they would have made casting wise back then if that movie gotten made 20 years ago right. it would have been madam webb with bob oh, no. you know what i'm saying so like that's what i'm talking about when you see the kinds of decisions that get made as opposed to being able to for the most part maintain the integrity of um a person a character a story not i'm not saying the movie's perfect and you know as somebody that studied you know that had so much experience. I mean, yeah, because of, because working on the movie, I got the chance to actually go to 56 Hope Road. I got the chance to go to Bull Bay and some of the, the actual locations 
and to also be around the Marleys doing that. Um, and this is an earlier iteration of the movie. They, they made a completely different project, you know, of course, with Paramount and the movie that got made. Um, but what I'm saying is that, like, it's it can go so wrong, so many different right. ways. Just greenlighting a, green a project too early with a bad actor, with a bad lead, is enough to tank a movie. I mean... Yeah, and, 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 and so what happens is that, like, you know, um, so many different things that you don't necessarily from the from the creative perspective, from the creative business perspective, that don't seem like bad ideas in reality are terrible ideas. And they just don't yeah. really know it yet because they're thinking about box office. They don't they don't really no one still to this day really understands what a star is or why. Yeah. It's 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 alchemy. You know, like like you you, you know, like there's certain ways people get cast or like, you know, it's like I mean, perfect example, if, if you look at, at the career of someone like Colin Farrell, Colin Farrell yeah. had a leading man's face, but he never liked being a leading man. Like, and, and so they would do all these, all these huge vehicles for Colin Farrell. And he talks about like how it probably drove him to non-sobriety. But then right. finally, when he was able to kind of be like a character actor, all of a sudden, he takes off and and the like and you see just how incredible an actor he is. Yeah, I mean, true detective, Banshees of Inisherin. He's a, he's amazing. He's you know incredible. what I'm saying? Like shit. Yeah, he should have gotten nominated for 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 um for what he did um in 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 the Batman as Penguin. Oh yeah, he's fantastic. Well, he's yeah. doing it again. He's doing it again. It's coming out as a show, a TV show. But, just wrapped filming. Yep, the other day. It, it just wrapped yeah. filming. And, and and someone else that that I, that I love as an actor is is someone like um you know Paul Dano. Like, Dana's great because Paul Dano was like he's over the top in one way in terms of his character in the Batman, but then look at what he did in the Spielberg movie in the Fable. Yeah, movie. he's so good. He's so he's understated. So, he's so different in that movie and in Prisoners. <laughs> yeah, uh, Dano, yeah. Actor, very yeah. underrated actor. Like, yeah. like you know, like one of my favorite examples of this. Okay, was like um, I remember my reaction back in the day to. Um, Jackie Brown, which actually I'm in the minority. I think Jackie Brown is a better film than Pulp Fiction. But when I, because when I saw Pulp Fiction, that was one thing. Jackie Brown was so different. I didn't really like that. It took me years to fully appreciate that movie and to appreciate the performance. So, for example, I thought that Robert De Niro, when I first saw Jackie Brown, was underwhelming. I see that movie now and I'm like, oh my God, he's acting right. his ass off. Because what is he really being? He's being like this kind of slug you know gone to seed that does that's kind of disconnected and and i'm i'm angry at this character like why does rob De Niro? what the fuck and then you see the movie now you're like whoa that he's actually being what he's supposed what he was written as you know so yeah. like it's interesting how you, you you revisit certain things certain performances and you have a, a different perspective on on what it is and what they are you know yeah that's true absolutely absolutely on that note then um i think I think we will call it a wrap. So, yeah, I want to reiterate doubly, especially thanks to Chia for coming on with us. The rest of you on the panel, you kind of, you know, you're okay. But um, <laughs> like my, minor thanks for the rest of you. Doubly thanks to, to everyone in chat who, who stuck with us. I know we've got quite a lot of super chats we have not had time to get to. We will do a catch up stream probably midweek. Um, I've got them all saved, so we will get to them. Um, but I think that pretty much brings us to the end. So a final thank you to everybody involved and uh, enjoy the rest of your evenings, nights, Thanks, and guys. mornings. Bye, Bye. chat. Bye, chat. Bye. 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 Adios.